Chapter One of Souls for Sale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Souls for Sale by Rupert Hughes. Chapter One Los Angeles. The sneering preacher cried as Jonah might have whinnied Nineveh, and with equal scorn. The Spanish missionaries may have called it the City of Angels, but the moving pictures have changed its name to Los Diablos, for it is the central factory of Satan and his minions, the enemy of our homes, the corrupter of our young men and women, the school of crime. Unless it reforms, and soon, surely, in God's good time, the ocean will rise and swallow it. Though he was two thousand miles or more away, as far away indeed as the banks of the mississippi are from the californian shore the reverend dr steddon was so convinced by his own prophetic ire that he would hardly have been surprised to read in the monday morning's paper that a benevolent earthquake had taken his hint and shrugged the new babylon off into the pacific sea but of all follies next to indicting nations cursing cities is the vainest and los angeles lived on quite unaware that its crimes were being denounced in the far-off town of calverley the sun itself took two hours to make the trip and though it was black night outside the little church in calverley it was just sunset in los angeles there was scarlet fire along the ocean of oceans whose lazy waves stroked the coast with lake-like calm over the wide sprawled city was a smooth sky all of a banana yellow save for a stain of red grapes at the hem where the sky went down behind the sea wall of the santa monica mountains among the multitudinous gardens along the palm plumed avenues the twilight loafed the day seemed to be entangled in the jewel hung citruses the fig trees the papyrus clusters the hedges foaming with a surf of shasta daisies the spendthrift waste of year-long roses and the smother of vines rolling up white walls in contrary cascades and spilling a froth of flowers along the roofs of many-coloured tile to the north lay hollywood the particular hades of the cinemaphobes but curiously demure and innocent in the sunset from certain surfaces there and in culver city the light was flashed back with heliographic brilliance from acres on acres of the glass walls and roofs of huge factories strange workshops where the enslaved sun and the chained lightning wrote stories and photographs millions of miles of tiny pictures were taken at a rate of a thousand a minute tons of spooled romance went rolling all over the world so that the girl and boy who embraced before one camera were later observed by coolies in shantung by the bishran of egypt and the sundry peoples of Somaliland, Shilkut, Jeddah, and Alexandropol, where not? Wherever the sun travelled and the moon reigned, they could watch this reeled minstrelsy, gleaming for the delight and indignation of mankind. Even when the sun had left this capital of the new art, some of the studios would glow on with a man-made day of their own, but most of the factories were closing now since the toilers had begun betimes in the morning and were scattering homeward for rest or study or mischief los angeles the huge spinner was finishing another day of its traffic in virtue vice laughter love and its other wares even dr steddon if he could have seen the realm he objurgated would have confessed that the devil had a certain grace as a gardener and that his minions were a handsome happy throng but dr steddon had never seen los angeles and had never seen a moving picture he knew that the world was going to rack and ruin as usual and he laid the blame on the nearest novelty as usual his daughter had heard him lay the blame in previous years on other activities she wished he wouldn't but then she had not escaped blame herself and she was in a mortal dread now of a vast cloud of obloquy lowering above her and ominous with lightning as yet the congregation had found no grave fault with her except a certain over fervor in the hymns her voice had a too manifest beauty an almost operatic zeal as it floated from the loft of the volunteer choir 
some of whom would never have been drafted if they had not volunteered sundry longer-faced members of the congregation felt that it was not quite respectable for a girl particularly a clergyman's daughter to put so much rapture into a church tune but youth exultant in a very ferocity for life harried the old hymn like an eaglet struggling upward with a tortoise the words were all about a joy divine but the elders kept a measure in arrears hanging back with a funeral trudge to save the day from the young rebel that one voice shining above the others had especially tormented tonight the old parson across whose silvered head it went floating from the choir loft just abaft the pulpit for dr steddon could not understand the seraphic innocence of his daughter's voice hearing was not believing he had known the singer too long and too well to be quite sure of the purity of her piety he loved her but with a troubled love he felt the vague disapproval of the congregation and agreed that there was a little immodesty in the poignancy of her ardor dr steddon he had the d d from a seminary that was more liberal with its degrees than with its dogmas had been impatient for the choir and the congregation to have done with their hymn and let him preach he was almost a shudder with a rapture of his own the rapture of denunciation of hatred for the ways of the world particularly the newest way of the world the most recent pleasure of the town his daughter glancing across the choir rail past the book she shared with elwood farnaby the second tenor looked down into her father's sparse gray pole which was turned into a cow by the central bald spot she looked almost into his mind and knew his impatience and she loved him with a troubled love her father and mother had named her remember after one of the mayflower girls nearly three hundred years after her father often wished that she had been liker to those puritan maidens but that was because he did not know how like she was to them how much they too had terrified their parents with their love of finery and romantic experiment for it is only the styles and not the souls that change there had been loves as dire then as now and sermons as fierce and as futile as the one that dr steddon was so zealous to repeat with only the terms and not the spirit altered and many an ancient exquisite anguish that had fretted the young she pilgrims of sixteen twenty one renewed itself in the mellow heart of this pilgrim of nineteen twenty one the fuel was fresh but the fire was from everlasting to everlasting fathers despaired of girls then as the fathers of now of the girls of now and as the fathers of two thousand two hundred twenty one will despair of the girls of two thousand two hundred twenty one the young and the old men of then and of now and of heretofore being but rearrangements of primeval manhood waging in the eternal pattern the love wars which know no truce there are chronicles enough to prove that the same quota of the remembers and the praise gods of plymouth and the other colonies suffered the same bitter beatitudes and frantic bewilderments as remember steddon and elwood farnaby endured when their elbows touched in the choir loft of this midwestern village miss steddon felt a sudden tremor in farnaby's elbow then it was gone from hers she saw his thumbnail whiten as it gripped the hymn book hard something in the words he chanted seemed to stab him with a sense of guilt he felt it a terrible thing for her to stand before that congregation and cry aloud words of ecstasy over her redemption from sin their secret unknown and unconfessed was concealed by the very clamor of its publication and it troubled farnaby mightily to be gaining all the advantage of a lie by singing the truth then the hymn was over and everybody began to sit down solemnly the whole congregation closing up like a jackknife of many blades before the choir had emptied its lungs of the last long amen and sunk out of sight behind the curtained railing the old parson was clutching the edges of his pulpit as he announced his text this was but a motto on the banner of a saint george charging upon the dragon that despoiled his flock tonight he charged the newest dragon a vast shapeless monster the twentieth century's peculiar monster the moving picture this was the latest child of science 
that odious science that is always terrifying faith with its inventions its playing cards its printing presses novels higher criticisms evolutions anesthetics and archaeologies musical instruments of new and seductive blare roller skates bicycles automobiles hair ribbons hats corsets incomplete costumes and all the other tricks for destroying souls the worst of all because the latest of all was the moving picture though dr steddon had never seen a moving picture he had read what other preachers had said about them and every day or two he had to pass the advertisement stuck up along the billboards or in front of a gaudy theater that had previously been an almost preferable saloon he had gazed aghast at the appalling posters with their revolting blazon of the new word sex their insolent questions about your wife your husband their frenzied scenes of embraces wrestling matches conventionalized rape defiances innumerable revolvers daggers train wrecks automobile accidents slaughters plunging horses bacchic revels bathing suits gambling and drinking and smoking scenes everything and everybody desperately wicked or desperately good he forgot that anybody in town had ever gone wrong before the normal supply of delinquencies appeared to have sprung up suddenly as a result of these posters so tonight he launched upon a savarolan denunciation the stenographer who had tried to capture Savonarola's eloquence, had to give up and write. Here I could not go on for tears. There was no stenographer to record Dr. Steddon's thunderbolts. If there had been, it might have been startling to see how many of the same bolts he had hurled at other detestable activities that interested the townspeople and therefore alarmed their shepherds. As each new fashion or public toy had come into vogue, he had gone at it hammer and tongs, he had never succeeded in doing more than scare off a few people who were scared to death anyway. He had seen the crazes steal in like a tide rolling over him in his protests, then ebb away after he had ceased to fight. Yet still he fought, and always would do as he always had done. With equal stubbornness youth went about its ancient business and pastime. Girls snickered in church and exchanged sly eyeliads with ogling boys women wore the latest fashion the town afforded couples scouted and flirted during the very prayers and practiced romance industriously on the way home and tonight the chief result of dr steddon's onslaught was the thought in the heart of his daughter and various others i should like to see los angeles when the choir was not singing openly and above board it was usually busily whispering even Elwood Farnaby had to lean over tonight and whisper important news to remember. He was not permitted to call at her house or to bow her home after the service. Singing beside her in the house of God, that was different. He told her now what he had just learned, that the factory where he was employed would close down the following week. Elwood had worked his way up until he had been made a foreman a few months before. He was to have been promoted to superintendent soon. His firm made the adding machine cleverly trademarked as the Calverly Calculator, or KKK. But people had suddenly ceased to buy adding machines. The world's chief business was subtraction and cancellation. The last of the uncancelled orders for the KKK would be finished in a few days. Mr. Sipe, the bank president, would not advance the money for further production. Even the contribution baskets that were passed up the aisles during the services felt the omen. Those who had flung in folded bills laid silver down quietly. Those who had tossed in silver dropped copper with stealth. Dr. Steddon could see the leanness of the baskets from his pulpit, and it meant further privation for him. To his daughter, the news that Elwood would have no job in a week, and would know no place to look for one, had more than a commercial interest it was the alarm of fate she had loved elwood since they were children had loved him all the more for his rags and the squalor of his home he was the son of the town's most eminent drunkard 
old fall-down farnaby a man whose office had been any saloon he could stand up in then prohibition arrived and he had lacked headquarters but not potations an ingenuity and an assiduity that would have made him a great explorer or a great inventor kept him supplied at a time when there was no legal liquor at all and when what illegal liquor there was to be had was so expensive that even cheap moonshine whiskey cost more than dated champagne had cost before among the slipshod children of his doomed family elwood had somehow managed to acquire ambition he had struggled up through a youth of woe to a manhood of shackled promise he had latterly supported his mother and a pack of brothers and sisters he had even been able to afford to go to the war had seen france and won the guerdon of a wound or two that made him glorious and remember steddon's eyes and a little more lovable than ever not because he won praise for a hero's little while but because his wounds added to the burdens that she longed to divide with him her father however had been unable to tolerate the thought of his daughter marrying the son of the town sought dr steddon felt that he was proving his love his loving wisdom toward his daughter by forbidding her even to meet young farnaby outside the choir loft he was sure that her love would wear out he did not know his daughter whoever did the great danger about the whole business of saving other people's souls seemed to be that life keeps mocking the noblest efforts with failure as it mocks the most high-minded playwrights it is baffling to find that nothing is more effective in destroying certain souls than the attempt to save them such souls must be like caged birds that go mad with fear when the kindliest hand is thrust into the cage they dash themselves against the bars and if they escape from the tenderest palm they flash away to the wild woods dr steddon was never more devoted than when he warned his girl to avoid young farnaby when she refused his advice he forbade her to see the boy she felt that she obeyed a higher duty when she secretly disobeyed her father she met the young man secretly whenever she could steal away her mother had neither the courage to oppose this stealthy romance nor the courage to inform her husband of it the two lovers made an unwilling accomplice of her and she was assured that they would marry the moment elwood could afford to add her pretty lips to the mouths he was already feeding the factory had promoted him twice in its heyday of high prices and the time had seemed near when they could afford to announce their approaching marriage and now the chance was gone and this meant to the girl far more than a mere deferment of bliss she had been trained indeed to regard bliss as by no means a right of hers she had rather got the idea that bliss was pretty sure to be indecent sin marriage had been preached to her as a lofty duty a kind of higher ordeal her father would have abhorred the thought that even its rights gave any franchise to raptures unrestrained wedlock to him was a responsibility not a release from pruderies a solemnity not a carnival and now she was to be denied even that somber laborious suburb of paradise end of chapter one recording by deanna beauvais chapter two of souls for sale this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Souls for Sale by Rupert Hughes Chapter 2 Elwood had expected that the bad news would shock her, but he could not understand the look of ghastly terror she gave him. He forgot it in his own bitter brooding and did not observe the deathly white that blanched her pallor. Yet he had noted that she was paler of late and had added that worry to his back-breaking load of worries the sunset crimson was gone from her cheeks and her cheeks were thinner than he had ever seen them before she coughed incessantly too and kept putting her hand to her chest as if it hurt her there her cough annoyed her father as he preached and made him forget some of his best points but his sermon annoyed her too he was putting himself on record with fatal hatred of sin and she wished he wouldn't a smile twitched her lips and dwelt there at the mockery life was heaping upon his oratory he was denouncing moving pictures as the source of all evil yet his daughter had never seen one yet again 
that had not saved her from a white hot wave drove the wan calm from her cheek and a scarlet war ensued in her veins she was the daughter of eve and of adam and of all the eves and adams since sin began but to hear her father talk it might have been a moving picture machine instead of the serpent that tempted eve to knowledge and started the eternal parade of wickedness to hear her father talk this little town of calverly had been a pre-satanic eden before the los angelesian movies crawled in yet even this young woman could remember that he had preached almost this same sermon against a long series of other amusements he had never found the town anything but a morass of wickedness she felt a mad impulse to rise and cry down at him across the brass rail papa don't for heaven's sake stop for the sheer sake of true truth she was tempted to protest against the folly of such a crusade it was bad enough in a newspaper it seemed peculiarly heinous that such bad logic and such reckless falsehood should be shouted from a pulpit but of course she made no sound except to cough the climax of her father's appeal was a jeremiad against the desecration of the sabbath the town's two little picture houses had proved so much more popular than anything ever known before that they had ventured to slip in performances on sunday nights without interference from the indolent police the theatre managers had claimed that according to their creed the true sabbath did not fall on sunday night but on saturday of course they did not close on saturday night either but then they said they could find nothing in moses against movies this plea was resented as a heathenish impertinence by the orthodox dr steddon called upon his congregation to make a stand against the continental sabbath and to save the american home from the danger of the new invasion to dr steddon the american home was a glaring failure except when he used it as a contrast with foreign homes his daughter was so distraught by the sarcasm of reality that she felt it a sacred duty to rise and proclaim her secret to every gaping listener there but of course she denied herself the relief of expression when her father completed his discourse with his tremendous thunder against los angeles he sank into his tall chair the choir rose for the final hymn after that came the majestic benediction on the way home under the wasted magic of the rising moon remember did not walk as usual between her father and mother with a hand on the arm of each tonight she kept at her mother's left elbow and clung so tight to the fat warm arm that her mother whispered what's the matter honey nothing mamma she faltered i'm just a little tired i guess her father felt a bit lonely insulated from his child by his wife and he had the orator's afterthirst for a draught of praise he mumbled how was the sermon mem they called her mem for short you haven't told me how you liked the sermon oh it was fine she said perfectly fine it ought to do a lot of good too she added to herself but it won't then she felt a coughing so hard that her father and mother had to stop by a tree and wait for her to be able to go on the big old maple sheltered them like a vast umbrella a moment then their eyes were blinded by a great fierce light an automobile came straight toward them and ran up over the curbstone before it was brought to a stop by a driver who gasped oh dear what's the matter with this darn thing it was molly sipe daughter of the bank president learning to run her father's car since he had to discharge the chauffeur she had chosen sunday night for practice in order to escape what little traffic troubled calverly streets seeing that the steddon family had taken refuge behind the bowl of the tree she hailed them with her usual impudence of self-raillery don't be afraid i'm trying to learn to back this fool car it's almost as big a fool as i am then she set the clutch in reverse and stepped on the accelerator with such vigor that the car shot backward like a premature rocket and nearly destroyed the twin baby carriage in which young mrs clint sparrow had taken her dual blessing to visit their grandmother but mem was coughing too violently to be thrilled by the unusual drama and her father was too deeply concerned in her distress to protest even against molly sipe's profanation of the holy evening besides she went to the episcopalian church and was doomed anyway 
Dr. Steddon and his wife stared toward each other earnestly through the gloom, and their hearts exchanged counsels without words or looks. The rest of the way home, Dr. Steddon was not a preacher anxious about his daughter's soul, but a father afraid for her life. Her health of body was outside the parish of a doctor of divinity. That was the business of a doctor of reality. "'Tomorrow, ma'am,' he said, "'I want you to go see Dr. Bretherick, the very first thing.' Mem shook her head and looked frightened. She was afraid of doctors just now. Their information was a cult. But her father insisted. If you don't promise, I'll go fetch him over myself tonight. This seemed to alarm Mem, and she gasped. I promise, I promise, I don't want you to go out again. Good night, Mama. Good night, Papa. That was a fine sermon tonight. She did not linger for her usual tryst with Elwood, but hurried to her room, pausing on the stairs for a long bout with her cough. Her parents waited in an anguish of anxiety for her to finish it. Then they put out the lights and went up to bed. Throughout the night they heard her coughing, a pitiful little noise, like the barking of a sick coyote. They were on a rack of fear, but their fear was not hers. The cough to them was an ominous problem. To her, it might promise a solution. End of chapter 2 Recording by Deanna Beauvais Chapter 3 of Souls for Sale This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Souls for Sale by Rupert Hughes Chapter 3 Next morning, Mem went about her household chores and said nothing of her promise. When she was reminded of it, she put off going until her mother threatened to go with her. Then she made haste to set out alone. She walked around Dr. Bretherick's block two or three times until she saw that no one was waiting. She caught the doctor, indeed, just hurrying out to his buggy. She asked him to turn back and talk to her, and she made sure the door to his consulting room was closed. She told him that her parents were afraid her cold was more than a cold, and she coughed for him and endured his investigations and auscultations and the odd babyishness with which he laid his head on her breast and on her shoulder blades. He asked her many questions, and she grew so confused and apt in blushes that he asked her more. Suddenly he flung her a startled look, gasped, and stared into her eyes as if he would ransack her mind. In the mere shifting of his eyelid muscles, she could read amazement, incredulity, conviction, anger, and finally pity. All he said was, My child. There could be no solemner conference than theirs. Dr. Bretherick had attended Mem's mother when the girl was born. He thought of her still as a child, and now she dazed him and frightened him by her mystic knowledges and her fierce demands that he should help her out of her plight or help her out of the world. He refused to do either, and demanded that she meet her fate with heroism. Somehow he woke a new courage in the panic of her soul, but she was convinced that her future must be one of degradation in obscurity. She quoted him the old saw, It doesn't matter what a man does, but once a woman slips she is lost forever. Nonsense, he cried, and added, damned and damnable nonsense. It isn't true and never was. The only ones who get lost are the ones who lose themselves. Don't run, ma'am. Whatever you do, don't run. Be sorry and sin no more. But don't run. The public is like a cat. It has the pounce instinct. It can only jump on the mouse that runs. Cats don't mean to be cruel to mice. They just can't help springing when the mouse tries to get away. By and by they smell blood, and then it's all over. Hold your head up and carry your cross, and let him that is without sin cast the first stone. You've heard your father say that often enough. My father, she moaned. Don't speak of my poor father. What will he say? What will the people think of him? He'd never dare face the congregation. I must run away and hide. I just must. Or kill myself. I've got no right to destroy my father. And my mother. She's had so much sorrow. And she's trusted me. 
and he's been so good and he tried to take such care of me care who can take care of anybody else the doctor groaned with a crooked smile there's just one person who can take care of you now the man who this woke a pride of another sort in her heart she was of a type increasing swiftly in the world one of the few things called modern that are really modern the woman who asks no man to take upon himself the whole burden of her food her clothes her thought her destiny or even her misdeeds she lived in a generation where the girl plans to earn her living as the boy had always planned she had come subtly to believe that a wife should no more be supported by her husband than a husband by his wife her father loathed and dreaded what has always been called the modern woman he denounced her in the pulpit and at home for a time he had explained the wickedness of these modern days by the disgraceful discontent of certain women comparing them with the simple sweet home-loving women of old-fashioned days and carefully omitting reference to the cruel lawless extravagant home-destroying women who were just as old-fashioned and just as numerous in the days when he was young as he had known when he was young but forgot as he got old but after the women of his congregation had all become voters in spite of themselves and he could see no change in their appearance or their activities he dropped that denunciation and took up the moving picture as the new toy of his anxiety mem herself had felt no stirrings toward scholastic pursuits or toward a professional career as a doctor a lawyer or even as a trained nurse she wanted to earn money only for one reason that she might ease the burden of her husband calverley had offered little encouragement however for a womanly career to take in washing sewing cook wait on the table wash dishes and make beds for other families to work in a store or one of the few factories these had made up the entire choice love married her heart to farnaby the conditions of american society rendered it impossible for them to live together openly but quite possible for them to meet and spend long secret hours together deferment made their hearts sick and tormented their senses opportunity was incessant and opportunity is close kin to importunity they had no diversions no emotional escape valves of art theatre dance fiction where vicarious romance would divert the strain on their souls their very horror of sin magnified its temptations gave it an eternal flame an archangelic importance for them it was not merely a dishonorable disgusting proof of unchecked idealism it was a defiance of god a plunge like lucifer's across the battlements of heaven into the deserved damnation of hell whence there was no return for ever perhaps the very tremendousness of the abyss carried them over the precipice when their lonely souls might have evaded a fall that looked less epic at any rate in spite of many wildly beautiful battles and many many victories over themselves and each other they lost a few battles and a few defeats were enough to annul many splendid victories and now mem was a hostage of shame without means of defence and it was her nature to blame herself for her estate and to defend her beloved enemy from any of the consequences of the war when dr bretherick suggested marriage as an easy salvation he revealed to her the peculiar heartlessness of her fate marriage meant to her that two people went to church in two carriages drove away consecrated in one and thenceforward lived in the same house that familiar exploit had been the one grand plan of elwood's soul and hers but elwood lived in the crowded shack which his father still owned for lack of anybody to buy it the house was full of children and progressively the youngest brother always slept with elwood it was hard enough for elwood to keep the roof over their heads it was not to be thought of that remember should join that wretched crowd at the minister's house there was much neatness and peace but no more room than at elwood's the progressively next to the youngest sister usually slept with mem it was unthinkable that elwood should join that crowded ark for elwood to leave his family and take a new house with mem 
would mean that he must abandon his mother and the other children to the mercy of fall-down Farnaby's brutality and indifference. That was, to a dutiful youth like Elwood, unthinkable. So many things were unthinkable with these young souls. But nature does not think. Nature wants. Nature strives to get. And getting, devours, or not getting, starves or shifts her approach. Mem might have figured out numberless ways of arranging a marriage with Elwood if she had been more intelligent or less confused, but she was not brilliant of mind, and she was subjected utterly to the coercion of discipline. She was like a flower grown in a pot on a shelf. Lacking strength to break it and go free, she would stay small and pretty and obscure. If something happened to break the pot and fling her out on the open soil, she would make a desperate effort for life and if the soil were fertile, she might grow to amazing heights and beauties. If the soil were sterile, she would simply die, but she had nothing within her to fling her off the shelf. So when Dr. Bretherick proposed marriage, he proposed something unthinkable at present, and, now that Elwood's job was gone, unthinkable as far forward as the girl's easily baffled mind could think. Dr. Bretherick, who knew so much about Calverly people, did not happen to know that Mem and Elwood had been meeting secretly, so he did not take young Farnaby into consideration. He was a little surprised when Mem refused to tell him the name of the man. He admired her wretchedly when he saw her trying to protect the fellow even from reproof. He's no more to blame than I am, and I have no right to ruin his life. When Dr. Bretherick called the man a scoundrel, she grew fierce in his defense. Dr. Bretherick wasted no time on the expression of virtuous horror. He was an almost total abstainer from the vice of blame. When he found people sick or delirious or going insane, he did not revile them for recklessness in catching cold or catching fever or taking in devils for tenants. He tried to restore them to comfort and the practice of life. Love was endemic, and good fortune was more frequent than good conduct. He felt no call to insult the victims of bad luck in love. His answer to Mem's greed for all the blame and all the punishment was a gentle reminder. It's not a question, my child, of your rights or his. It's a question of the rights of a certain future citizen. Mem wept and beat her clenched hands upon her brow and on the doctor's desk. He let her fight it out, finding no consolation fit to offer. He studied her as he studied many another wretch tossing on a bed of coals and crazed with pains of body and mind. He saw how beautiful she was, how thrilling, and how thrilled with that fire which builds homes and burns them up, kindles romance and devastation. He felt a little sympathy even for the unknown man, and imagined how helpless the wretch might have been to resist that incandescence in which Mem was as helpless as he since the flame cannot become ice by any power of its own. The doctor reached out and clenched hands with Mem in the fiercer throes of her regret, or laid a fatherly caress on her bowed head. He must have told you he loved you, he said. But he does love me, and I love him. Then why is he unwilling to marry you? He's not. There's nothing on earth he wants more than that. But he can't. He can't. Is he, is he married to someone else? Mem's lifted face was like a mask of horror, dripping with tears but aghast at such infamy. In every depth of shame there is a lower pit from which the soul recoils and finds a saving pride in its own superior height. The doctor fell back before such insulted innocence. He sought a hasty shield behind another question. Then what other obstacle can there be? This is a free country. You don't have to ask anybody's permission. Mem was so distraught that she gave the one true reason, sobbing in the gable of her arms. The calculator factory closes next week, and his position will be gone. Young Farnaby, eh? The doctor mused. Mem lifted her head again, and her hands twitched, as if to recapture the secret she had let slip. But it was too late. She had not even protected Elwood from exposure. The doctor thought busily. The word Farnaby presented the complete picture of the family whose woes and poverty he had long known. 
he felt encouraged after a first discouragement. Elwood's a nice boy, he said. He'll do what's right. I'll call him up right away. Duty is more than skin deep with him. Even as he took up the prehensile telephone, Mem snatched it from his hand. He wants to do what's right, but his first duty is to his mother. He's supporting his whole family. They'll starve without his help. And what's he going to do when the factory closes? I don't know. He can't marry me, and I won't marry him and drag him down. There's no dragging him down. You'll make a wonderful wife, and anybody ought to be proud to have you. You'll be a great help in his career. But how can we live together? she cried frantically. Don't. The main thing's the ceremony. Just you step out and get married. People will say you're a couple of young fools, but that's all they will say, and they'll enjoy a bit of romance in this dead burg. He evaded Mem's pleading hands and called the factory. Mem's embarrassment was overwhelming before the prospect of meeting in the presence of a witness, the fellow victim of the tidal wave that had engulfed them both one Sabbath evening. A fervor of religious zeal and music had exalted their emotions then, and made their hearts easy prey to the moonlight that waylaid them as she slipped out to meet him, after her father and mother had kissed her good night. A wheedling, cooing breeze had stolen through the vine-wreathed grotto of the porch, and had whispered incantations over them. Their remorse had been fearful, but its very frenzy was a kind of madness that prepared their dizzied souls for further need of it, for remorse, like other bitter drugs, establishes a habit. Mem writhed in a delirium of remorse now. Such poetry in the poem, such hideous prose in the epilogue, such honey, then such poison. She was wakened from her fierce reverie, however, by the doctor's voice. Elwood's out. He's gone to the bank for the firm. I left word for him to call me as soon as he comes in. I've been thinking up a little plan. Like many another earnest soul, Dr. Bretherick was addicted to plotty stories. When he had wrestled in vain with some wolf of disease for some agonizing patient he would forsake, the never-ending mystery serial of pain and death, and take up some volume of so-called trash. Like nearly everybody else in the country, Dr. Bretherick had tried his hand at the newest indoor sport, the writing of stories for moving pictures, a popular vice that had largely replaced the older custom of writing plays. So now he improvised for Mem's future what a moving picture man would call a continuity. This afternoon, after the factory closes, you and Elwood can meet and drive over to Mosby. I know the town clerk over there. He owes me a bill. I'll telephone him to make out the licenses and have them all ready for you when you get there. He can marry you or get a judge to or a parson. You'd prefer a preacher, I suppose. Well, I can arrange that, too. I'll vouch for you both, and he'll say the necessary words and give you a nice certificate, and then you can telephone your father from Mosby and ask for his blessing. He won't give it over the telephone, but he will the next day when you two will drive back like a couple of prodigals. Your father will see you coming from afar, and he'll run out and fall on your necks. You can ask forgiveness. And then you can explain about Elwood's job and how you'll have to live at home till he gets another. Heaven knows you earn your board and keep at home, and they'll be mighty glad to have you there. By and by, Elwood will find a new job, and you'll get rich and live happily ever after. Mem was almost smiling at the shabby heaven he threw on the screen of her imagination. It was so much better than anything she had hoped. Then her old enemy, the arch-realist, the sneering censor, poverty, slashed at the dream. I don't believe Elwood could afford the money. He'd have to pay the livery stable for the horse and buggy, and there's the license fee, and the ring, and the preacher, and the, the hotel, and I don't believe we could afford it. I'll lend you all that, the doctor insisted. I'm one of those authors that has enough confidence in his story to back it himself. You go ahead and get happiness and quit grieving, and don't you dare to change my manuscript. I'm one of those pernickety authors that believes actresses should act and let the authors off. Mem was laughing through her tears when the telephone rang. 
the doctor's welcoming hello broke through a many wrinkled smile it froze to a grimace as mem watched hearing only a rattling inarticulate noise as from a mannequin inside the telephone the doctor's pleated skin was slowly drawn into new folds until his face from being a cartoon of old hilarity became a withered mummy of dejection he kept saying yes 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 and finally that's right bring him here he set down the telephone as if it were a drained cup of hemlock it wasn't elwood mem said no yes well oh god what a bitter world this is mem caught eagerly at grief tell me what's happened what's happened to elwood he's hurt he's killed and since she had seized the knife from his reluctant hand and driven it into her heart he left it there and said yes end of chapter three recording by diana beauvais chapter four of souls for sale this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Souls for Sale by Rupert Hughes Chapter 4 The doctor had not told the exact truth. For once his lie was worse than the truth. Young Farnaby was not dead, not yet, but from what he had been told the doctor was sure that death was decreed. As his mind, so habited to fatal noose, struggled with this message, it seemed better to leave mem in her despair than to raise her to a brief suspense he would make a fight for the young man's life as always he never gave up while there was any life to fight for then if by some strange good fortune he should redeem this youth from the grave it would be a glorious privilege to restore him to his sweetheart but if he should keep her hope alive then lose the war he must kill her twice it seemed as if he had struck her dead already for her clenched hands let each other go, her arms fell outward like the wings of a shot bird, her head fell on her breast, and she was slipping to the floor when he caught her. For the mercy of this swoon, he was as nearly thankful as he could be for anything. He got her up in his arms, carried her to the door, opened it with much fumbling, and staggered up the stairs with her to the spare room calling to his wife, Get her undressed, and keep her in bed till I come back don't let her talk don't mind what she says but keep her here till i tell you then he hurried downstairs to meet the crowd running to his gate in pursuit of an automobile he recognized it as the sipe car its fenders were crumbled and stained and men got out of it removed with much trouble a long limp body and moved up the walk when a little later mem came suddenly back to the world she found mrs bretherick bending over her she felt blankets about her and a pillow under her head her shoes and stockings her hat and her dress were gone and she was in a strange room getting accustomed to wallpaper and chairs and chromos was the first business before her soul could begin to orient itself then she recalled everything and began to cry out elwood tell me about elwood hush my dear was all mrs brethrick would say she said it very gently but when mem tried to leap from the bed the old woman was very strong and held her down coercing her with iron hands and a maddening reiteration of hush don't excite yourself the doctor says you must stay here hush now my dear mem's rebellion was checked by the sound of a loud nasal voice coming up from below someone downstairs was explaining something you see it was this way doc I was standing in front of Parlin's candy store, right next the bank there, when I heard some fellers laughing. Somebody hollered, Climb a lamp post, everybody. Here comes Molly Sipe. And I seen the big Sipe car come scooting along. Molly said afterward she allowed to shift from second speed to neutral and put on the foot brake. But she got rattled by the crowd round the bank and slipped into high and stepped on the gas and the car come booming over the sidewalk and mowed right into the crowd people jumped every which way and one or two got knocked down but poor elwood here 
he was just coming out of the bank and molly was twisting the steering wheel so crazy he didn't know which side to jump and the car knocked him right through the big plate glass window you know and up against the steel bars just inside and well the bars was all bent at that poor elwood hadn't a chance molly climbed out the car and fell over on the sidewalk leaving the wheels still going round i stepped on the running board and shut off the engine then i and some other fellers back the car out and whilst the others picked up elwood and molly i seen the motor was still going good so we put elwood in the car and we brought him over to you molly's all right except for hysterics like but elwood is there any hope for him nice boy too hard work and honest as the day he had two bank books in his hand one of em the firm's the other un was his own little savings account he always managed to save something out of nothing he held on to the book jim says till he could hardly get it out of his hand and it's all cut up with glass and covered with red so you could hardly tell how much he had in the bank nice boy too he made a hard fight to live didn't holler at all just kept gritting his teeth and mumbling something you couldn't make out what he said could you jim jim's answer was not audible nor were mem's protests audible she had been bred to expect little of life to make no demands for luxury and to surrender with a cheerful thy will be done what the lord took away with perfect right since he had given it so now she made no fight no outcry she lay still her head throbbing with the words of lawrence hope in a song one of her girlfriends sang less than the dust beneath thy chariot wheel less than the rust that stains thy glorious sword less than the dust less than the dust am i it was the doctor who made the fight silently but bitterly fiercely and in vain the only noise was made by the farnaby family when they arrived in a little mob they came up the street mrs farnaby from her tub her forearms covered with dried suds her red hands snatching her apron hem to and fro she and the girls wailed aloud and in the room below mem could hear the young brothers crying but none of them wept so bitterly or so loudly as old fall down farnaby who came staggering up the steps and floundered about the room freed by drunkenness of all restraints upon his remorse and his fear and nobody had better reason to reproach his lot than the poor old prey of the thirst fiends doomed to roll up the hill of remorse in his own hell a heavy stone of repentance that always broke loose at the top and rolled down again dragging him with it mem was benumbed with her sorrow it was a proper punishment upon her she was sure and she spread her arms out as on a crucifix thinking of herself as one of the thieves justly nailed to the tree next to that tree where the innocent ones suffered dr bretherick had paused in his desperate battle to listen for sounds from the room above he had gone to the stairs to ask his wife how mem was he had been glad of the prostration of her grief but he was not deceived as to its sincerity mem was still calm when his business was done in the room below and he had turned the spoils of defeat over to his aide-de-camp the undertaker dr bretherick entered the bedroom and sent his wife about her business while he dropped his exhausted body into a chair and spurred his exhausted mind to further effort he took one of mem's cold hands in his and petted it and chafed it shaking his head in wordless sympathy at least he didn't suffer he lied her woe for lack of other expression made use of the smiling muscles as she said that's not true i heard well the doctor sighed his sufferings are over anyway he was a good boy and you're a good brave girl and now what are we going to do for you she spoke without excitement there's only one thing for me i can't live of course i was sorry i was so sick and i was afraid of my cough but now i see that god sent it to me as a blessing do you think it will carry me off soon the doctor shook his head this frightened her she gasped then it must be i must do it myself it's wicked i suppose but have you got anything that isn't too slow or disfiguring i don't mind the pain but i don't want to go to hell with an ugly face 
the doctor was so familiar with deaths that he was capable of an occasional irony that looked like flippancy to those who met them only rarely he was bitterer than mem could imagine when he sighed no that's not right it's the pretty faces that go to hell according to my understanding of it heaven is for the homely and the unattractive poor things they need some consolation don't choke for mercy's sake doctor she pleaded i couldn't live without elwood i don't dare to i've no right to he cowed her hysteria with a sharp rein you've no right to your own life now it belongs to your father and your mother and to the life that has already begun suicide would be worse than cowardice and selfishness in your case my child it would be murder he was cruelly kind to her like a driver who flogs and stabs a sinking beast of burden out of the deep mire of death and up across the steep crags to the valley beyond mem's very skin shivered and seemed to rise in welts under his goad her heart struggled back to its task fiercely as it ached it beat with a fuller throb her soul brooded somberly though well if it's my duty to live it's my duty to tell the truth i'll tell it to everybody poor elwood shan't go into his grave without people knowing how i loved him he let her frenzy of devotion carry her up and down the room until she dropped into a chair exhausted then he took up the whip again my poor little child i've got to be terrible mean to you for your own sake you can't do what you want to do you said yourself that it would kill your father if he knew it would drive him from his pulpit and your mother would be crushed too you said and as for poor elwood wouldn't it simply turn the village against his memory everybody thinks of him as a brave clean young martyr as he was but just imagine what would happen if they learned what we know no honey you've got to fight it out alone it's pitiful but you're going to be glad some day when you look back on it from happiness happiness she groaned the word was loathsome despicable the possibility of it belittled her grief the doctor withdrew it i don't mean happiness but some big high peak of goodness your life is going to be lifted up because of this if you'll only meet it as you must tell me what to do don't make me think i've got too much to think about what's dead and gone then she sobbed and sobbed till her eyes were drained again of tears the doctor was as weary as she wearier for he had her burden to carry as well as his own he sought a little respite not for relief but for clear thinking it was hard to think when a broken heart bled and leaped before his eyes what you are to do is this while i try to figure out the best plan for the future you go along on home and tell your father and mother that you were here when elwood was brought here no just go home with me and i'll tell them i'll tell them the shock has prostrated you and that you mustn't be spoken to about it you must be kept quiet and when you cry you mustn't be questioned just let alone can't mamma hold me in her arms the girl whimpered yes and you can tell her the whole story if you want to no no i can't i won't but i must have her arms around me i must have arms around me to hold my heart together End of chapter 4 Recording by Deanna Beauvais Chapter 5 of Souls for Sale This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Souls for Sale by Rupert Hughes Chapter 5 the doctor helped the little widowed mourner into his old buggy and she kept her face uplifted clear of tears through the streets and along the walk at home she broke only when she heard the doctor's voice telling what the father and mother who received them on the porch of their little house had already heard from a passing gossip they stared amazed when mem darted up the stairs without speaking and they heard her crying in her room the doctor checked their pursuit and gave them his orders as if they were unruly children when he had gone the mother stole up to mem's bedside and gathered her baby to her breast it would have been almost sweet to weep there if only the truth could have been voiced 
by and by the old clergyman crept up the stairs and into the room and gave his clumsy sympathy but when he spoke of god's will and of the all-wise all-loving providence mem had to bite her tongue to keep it from blasphemy from the savage delight of confounding the preacher with truths he could never have suspected he even went so far as to plead that he had done wisely in keeping mem from seeing elwood oftener otherwise she might have wanted to marry him this threw the girl into hysterics she laughed so fiendishly that her mother drove her father from the room and finally slipped away herself knowing that solitude is the best medicine for that brief madness alone with her soul mem grew afraid of herself she knew that she could not keep the truth choked back in her rebellious heart forever all night long she coughed and wept and fearing that the household kept anxious vigil felt one more remorse added to her pack next morning her father and her mother besought the doctor to come to see her but he answered send her to me when they told her she realized that he was afraid to talk to her in her own home and she found strength enough to rise from her bed and go to him when mem paused in his door until an onset of crying had passed he almost smiled she looked at him like a doomed animal and murmured as she dropped into a chair don't you suppose this cough will solve my problem and put an end to me before before he shook his head as he closed the door and went to his desk chair your cough will take a long time to cure or kill but it may come in very handy i've got it all thought out you can't stay in this town now i suppose most of the animals crawl away and hide at such a time so suppose you just vanish let your cough carry you off to say arizona or california she was startled at this undreamed of escape he went on i'll tell the necessary lies that's a large part of my practice and practice makes perfect you will go to some strange town and pose as a widow you will marry an imaginary man out there and let him die quietly then if you ever want to come home here you can come back as mrs somebody or other this reminded her again that she had others to think of besides herself her dazed soul still trying to creep round the deep well of death busies itself with the fantastic make-believe of the doctor but she protested how could i go any place and pretend to be a widow when papa and mamma would send all their letters to me as miss steddon the doctor was ready for her he would order mem to be sent to the far west immediately and to live meagerly in the desert somewhere because her father was poor being a parson and had loved her too unwisely well to teach her a trade once she was safely started mem was to write home that she had met on the train some old flame of earlier years and here his hostile audience interrupted him life was slow in calverly and mem could hardly imagine such a swift succession of events as dr bretherick was so glibly planning for her at any other time to hear of going to california or anywhere would have been an epical adventure but paradise was no longer within her rights she had earned sheol or some dire penance so well that it was ridiculous to propose romance and romance in the eden of palm trees and orange flowers she revolted too from the pretense of having had another lover before elwood but i never had any flames the author was impatient at finding pegasus held down to this tame hitching post of a life he said you've been away somewhere haven't you not much nor far she sighed i was in carthage once at aunt mabel's well you must have left a lot of broken hearts there she sighed again as she shook her head she was sadly glad to confess that no broken hearts had marked her path aunt mabel was sick and i had to nurse her that's how i got to go the only man i met brought in the groceries and the mail but you've got to have another sweetheart honey your folks don't know that you never met anybody in carthage so we'll make one up but they'd ask aunt mabel and she say there was no such man there then we'll make him a traveling man that you met you went to church didn't you oh yes well then one day he occupied the pew with you and sang out of your book and walked home with you and 
er um you had forgotten all about him until he recalled himself to you on the train and he was so respectful that you couldn't snub him and by a strange coincidence he was getting off at wherever you were going to get off at mem was at her apple blossom time she was frosted a little with grief but still white and fragrant frail and lovable difficult to leave upon the bough he saw the tremor on her lips the little zephyrs of hopeless amorous yearning that lifted her bosom the soft lithe fingers that intertwined with one another for lack of stronger hands to clasp he said you've got to forget yourself and your sorrow and your truthfulness for the sake of your mother and father because just tell me what to do not why but what you must save me and them i want to die but it would be too easy too selfish too cowardly give me something to live for and i'll do my best only don't argue don't argue that's the way to talk he said take my prescriptions as i give them to you and we'll save everybody from destruction but if you won't let me tell you why you must ask no questions i order you to go west and to find an imaginary husband there his name shall be let me see what shall we call him wait a minute he reached back to an overcrowded revolving bookcase and took out the first volume his hands encountered it was a history of medicine and he was fond of it because it was also a history of the vanity of human science in its eternal war with death and of the bitter hostility that greeted every benefactor he rejected galen harvey jenner and came finally upon the name of dr woodville who went to the defense of jenner in the great war for vaccination and helped to make the hideous ravages of smallpox as rare now as they were common in his time Bretherick liked this name of woodville he had sent patients to tucson which he pronounced tuxen and also to yuma which had a wild and romantic sound at each of these towns he planned that mem should remain a week or two in her own name in her letters home she was to say much of this mr woodville and his devotion then as dr bretherick's excited mental spinnerets poured out the web she was to write that mr woodville was called farther west and could not bear to leave her pleaded with her so earnestly to become his wife and go with him that her heart had told her to accept him she was to describe a hasty marriage and request that her letters thereafter be addressed to her as mrs woodville after a brief honeymoon she could eliminate dr woodville in some way to be decided at leisure it would be risky he said to let mr woodville live too long mem had no experience of the dramatic limbo but she began to play the critic and point out the difficulties and the spots where the action would break down suppose i met somebody at yuma or tuxen who knew me and rode home suppose some accident kept me there what if i felt ill and couldn't get away and money if i married mr woodville my father would stop sending me any and then i'd starve to death the doctor frowned his fancy had carried him skippingly over the high spots of the landscape and now she had tripped him and cast him headlong but he would not give her up he pointed out the attractive features of his scheme the travel the new landscapes the new faces and souls the glorious adventures the possibility of meeting a real mr woodville who would replace the homemade product while he tried to sell the merchandise of his fancy mem's own imagination was riotous she was young starved for life for other horizons death and disgrace were more untimely than her heart realized in its grief the very perils of the enterprise made it a little interesting but chiefly she found it acceptable because it was odious and difficult and a sacrifice for others sakes and so at last she consented to play the part as best she could mem rose to go she was in haste to begin her career but she gasped and sank into her chair with a deathly dread her first audience must be her father and mother and she was paralyzed with stage fright sick dizzy with confusion and the abrupt collapse of memory dr bretherick put his arm about her lifted her to his breast and upheld her like a tower of strength quoting the words walt whitman used to the wounded soldier 
Lean on me. By God, I will not let you die. Mem was not stirred by the doctor's promises of happiness and life, but only by the persuasion that she would be really proving her love for her parents by deceiving them. Dr. Bretherick offered to take the brunt of her first clash with her desperate future. I'll go home with you again and fix it all up with your papa and mamma. They'll take it kind of hard, likely, losing you right away, and they'll worry over your health and your going away alone, but we've got to do the best we can for their sweet sakes. If you stayed here, you'd break your own heart and theirs and die in the bargain. My way saves your life and their pride. All they'll suffer will be losing the sight of you. But that's part of the job of being a parent. And part of the job of being a doctor is giving people a lot of pain to save them from a lot more and scaring them for their own good. So come along, honey. As they sat out upon the short ride to the clergyman's home, the doctor felt as if he were advancing to a duel with an ancient adversary. He did not believe in Dr. Steddon's creeds. They were cruel legends, in his opinion. He pictured preachers as men who slander the beauties of this world in order to glorify a false heaven of their own concoction, who would make this world a joyless, barren hell in order to save its citizens from an imaginary nightmare of ancient ignorance, who minimized the hideous cruelties of this life and salve its agonies with words. He could not understand or love the God they preached. He did not believe their God to be the true God. His heart was full of love and of aspiration and of mystic bafflements and longings, but he was utterly convinced that whatever God might be, he was not this man-made God who inspired Dr. Steddon with such hatred of his world and its ways. He advanced to the contest, therefore, with a lust of conflict. He felt himself a kind of Sir Gawain with a lady on the pillion, riding into a dark forest to conquer the giant ogre who denied her her realm. But when he reached the castle, he found it a humble cottage. The ogre was an undernourished old parson, afraid of this world and the next, but most afraid of his beloved daughter's health. And at the ogre's side on the drawbridge, the ogress was a frightened mother wringing wrinkled hands with terror. Seeing Mem returning with the doctor, they had come out on the porch in trembling anxiety. They were already so abased of hope that when the doctor told them that Mem would be all right if she could get away to California right away, they felt as if he had lifted them from the dust. He was not so much taking their ewe lamb from them as saving her to them. They were fawningly grateful to him, zealous for any sacrifice to benefit their child. The doctor despised himself for a contemptible slanderer because of the mere thoughts that had passed through his mind on his way to the duel. As for Mem, she was crucified with remorse. If her parents had only been harsh with her, or stingy with the money she would require, if they had only mentioned the difficulties, or celebrated their sacrifice as a duty, she could have found some straw to cling to as she drowned in self-contempt. But their terror and their tenderness were all for her, and her love for them gushed like hot blood until it seemed an inconceivable treachery to conceal from them the truth. It was well that Dr. Bretherick came with her and stood by to check her outcry, for her heart was fairly bursting with the centrifugal explosive power of a compressed secret. Dr. Bretherick kept her under the ward of his stern eyes until he had frightened the parents just enough and reassured them just enough to make sure that they would let Mem go and go alone. He gained a little acrid stimulant from Dr. Steddon's dread of seeing his innocent daughter leave the shelter of her home and go out into the dangerous world. The doctor knew too well from a doctor's long experience how far the beautiful ideal of the home is from the actual usual household. He knew too well that many a home keeps in more dreadful evils than it keeps out. But he could not say these things. He had a home of his own and a family of his own, and he revered the dream and the ideal. And so the continuity began to move. At first it followed the doctor's manuscript with remarkable smoothness. Then life, the ruthless Philistine manager, took a hand in it and twisted and turned it until its author would never have recognized it. 
it carried the frightened waif of village disaster to cosmic heights unimaginable to unheard of experiences wherein this familiar experience of hers served as a schooling and an inspiration her degradation became her salvation her practice of lies taught her eternal truths her father when he learned of this wished that she had died in her cradle but millions of people blessed her where she walked and smiled and by a miracle unequalled in the chronicle of any previous generation she walked and smiled and carried balm and spikenard all about the world without wings yet with unwearying feet she appeared in a hundred places at once by a diabolic telepathy in a multiplication that made of one shy frightened girl a shining multitude and at times each of her was of an elfin tininess at times of titanic size but all of her was always of more than human sympathy and spoke a language that men of every nation understood end of chapter five recording by diana beauvais chapter six of souls for sale this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org souls for sale by rupert hughes chapter six that clergyman's home was really a theater if there had been a cameraman to follow the various members about it would have been what the moving picture people call a location the reverend dr steddon abhorred theaters or moving pictures and all forms of dramatic fiction except his own sermons yet everybody in the house was playing a part with benevolent purposes of course but then benevolence is one of the motives of nearly all acting to divert some one from his own distresses by exploiting imaginary joys or sorrows vicarious atonement and all forms of vicarious activity are the actuating spirit of the vast industry of honorable artistic pretense that has flourished since the world was all the world's a stage as somebody has said and everybody is always acting if certain people charge money for acting that means no more than the fact that most preachers charge money for preaching and doctors for doctoring the acting in the steddon home was of the most amateurish quality but then the audience was as amateurish as the playing and collaborated as audiences must if plays are to prosper the girl's role was the most difficult imaginable she had to repress a hideous secret conceal a frantic remorse rein in a wild grief and conduct it as a gentle regret she hated herself and her enforced hypocrisy romance had sickened in her like a syrup that bribes the palate and fills the stomach with nausea her secret was a vomit and no easier or pleasanter to control her soul was so ill of it that her very throat retched nausea was part of her condition too and would have tormented her if she had been the formal widow of elwood instead of what brander matthews once phrased as the unwedded mother of his unborn child she had been trained from childhood to believe herself a sinner lost in adam's fall and to search her heart for things to repent she believed in an actual hell and her terrors of the infertile griddles were as vivid as those that poor little seven-year-old marjorie fleming wrote down in her babyish diary she had great native gifts of self-punishment a habit older than christianity and found in all nations did not the greeks and latins have a comedy the self-tormentor mem was worthy of its long title she was he tote moro menos nothing made her more eager to get her gone from her home town than her fear that at almost any moment she would reach the end of her histrionism fling off the mask and tell the venomous truth it was not merely a question of having to lie or to evade discovery mem had to dramatize herself to foresee situations and to force herself to be another self to mimic sincerity and simplicity she was in the trite situation familiar in the theatre and in the poems and stories about the theatre where the broken-hearted mummer must conceal from the audience a personal grief it would have been easier if mem had merely to play the clown 
for hilarity could be carried off hysterically but her role was one of half-tones grays and mild regrets many people knew that she was fond of elwood many girls and boys called to see her or dragged her to the telephone to offer consolation and satisfy curiosity to them she must express a proper sorrow as a cordial friend without letting them treat her as too deeply involved this was bitter work and she felt it a treachery to her dead lover to her mother she must play the same character her mother may have guessed that the tragedy was deeper than the revelation but the poor old soul had had so much gloom in her life that she did not demand more than she got dr steddon lived in such clouds that he had almost forgotten his refusal to let elwood call on ma'am he knew that she had been at the doctor's office when elwood was brought there and the shock of this explained what confusion he recognized in mem's manner he was acting too but his acting was the constant show of cheerfulness he went about smiling laughing talking of mem's swift recovery in the golden west he said that they would all be glad to get rid of her for a spell but his heart was a black ache of despair and fear of that death which he spoke of in the pulpit as a mere doorway to eternal bliss his smiling muscles rebelled when he was alone and he paced his study like a frightened child beating his hands together and whispering to his father to spare him this unbearable punishment a hurricane struck the little town of calverley on the day of elwood's funeral when mem expressed a wish to sing with the choir at the service over their late fellow singer both mother and father forbade her to think of it her mother cried a girl who's got to be shipped out west has got no right to go out in weather like this mem felt it a crowning betrayal of elwood to let him be carried out to a pauper's grave in such merciless rain her heart urged her to dash through the streets burst into the church and proclaim to the world how she adored the boy but she had to protect her father and mother from such selfish self-sacrifice and such ruthless atonement so she stayed at home and stared through the streaming windows she saw her poor old father set out to preach the funeral sermon he had that valor of the priests which leads them to risk death in order to defeat death to endure all hardship lest the poorest soul go out of the world without a formal conja dr steddon clutched his old overcoat about him and plunged into rain that hatched the air in long slanting lines he had not reached the gate when his umbrella went upward into a black calyx he leaned it against the fence and pushed on then his hat blew off and scurled from pool to pool he ran after it his hair a flutter his bald spot spattering back the rain miss steddon was not missed at the church for there was nobody there to miss her the whole choir saved its voice by staying away only the farnaby family went dripping up the aisle and back the hearse and two hacks moped past the window where ma'am watched on the boxes the driver sat the shabbiest men on earth at best but now peculiarly sordid as they slumped in their wet overcoats disgusted and dejected their hats blown over their faces their whips aggravating the misery but not the speed of the sodden nags that might have wished it their own funeral mem had to leave the window her impulse was to run out and follow the miserable cortege to tear wet flowers from the gardens and strew the road with them to fill the grave with them and shelter elwood from the pelting rain it was a funeral like that in which mozart's body was lost and like his widow mem had to mourn at home it was her meek fear of being dramatic and conspicuous that saved her from the temptation to publish her concern but she stumbled up to her room and let her grief have sway she smothered her sobs as best she could in the old comforter of her bed but the other children heard her and asked questions her mother kept them away from her and did not go near herself feeling that this was one of the times when sympathy gives most comfort by absence when her eyes were faint with exhaustion and could squeeze no more tears when her throat could not jerk out another sob her soul lay becalmed in utter inanition then she heard a hack drive up to the gate and heard her father's hurried rush for the porch the old man was chilled through by his graveside prayer but forgetful of himself in the exultation of his office and all a babble of pity for his client 
Mem heard her mother scolding him out of his wet clothes into dry, but he kept up his chatter. It isn't always easy to find nice things to say at funerals, but there was everything fine to be said over that poor boy, a good, hard-working lad that slaved for his mother and went to church regular, and, why, I don't suppose he ever had an evil thought. Mem sank into a chair by her window. The rain whipped the panes, and the wind rattled them in the chipped putty that held them to the casement. The last few days had kept her thoughts so busy that she had neglected her housewifery a little. She was shocked to see that a spider had spread a web from the shutter to the vine. The gale had torn the web to shreds and was threatening to rip it loose. The spider, sopping and purled with rain, was having a desperate battle to keep from being swept away. He clung and caught new holds as a sailor clutches the shrouds in a tempest. The girl felt a kinship with the poor beastie. Her soul and her body were like spider and web, and a great storm menaced them both. Her flesh seemed but a frail network that spasms of sobbing or of coughing threatened to tear to pieces. Her soul was a loathsome arachnid spinning traps for flies, and storms of remorse and grief threatened to dislodge it and send it down the wind of eternity. But still her body clung to life and her soul to her body. She began to long to be shut of the town, however, and the dull playhouse where she enacted over and over the same dull drama to the same dull audience. Her father and mother drove her almost mad by their devoted gentleness. Hitherto they had both been strict and a little tiresome with moral lessons and rebukes, making goodness a dull staple suspiciously over-advertised and creating a rebellion by discipline. But after the doctor's first visit they heaped almost intolerable coals of fire upon her head with their devoted faith in her. If they had any doubts of her future, it was only of the wicked people outside the fold who would attack and beguile their ewe lamb. They never suspected her of even the capacity for sin, though she felt that it was she who had seduced her sacred lover and not he her. At times her parents treated her with that unquestioning approval we grant only to the newly dead, and the unmerited homage was harder to endure than unearned blame, since it had a belittling influence where the other would have aroused self-esteem. She was no longer at home, at home. She had to draw on a mask the moment she came in. When she went to the doctor's office, she encountered truth and the frank facing of it. She could be herself, a normal young animal who had done a natural thing, unluckily, and had lost none of her rights to life, wealth, or the pursuit of happiness. When she stepped off the Bretherick porch, she was a very allegory of defiant youth, when she stepped on her own porch, she became immediately a Magdalen bowed with a shame she dared not even ask forgiveness for. It was particularly hard to act a part all day long, and every day, since she had never been an actress before. If her audience of two had had more familiarity with the art, she might not have succeeded in duping both so completely, but they never dreamed of the truth. Deceiving them was so easy that she despised herself. Especially she loathed herself for taking their paltry savings. They had foreseen the cruel days that lie ahead of superannuated preachers, and had somehow managed to put away a little hoard against the inevitable famine, though this meant that even their prosperity was always just this side of pauperdom. But they lavished their tiny wealth upon their scapegrace daughter, and never imagined that the real cause for her spendthrift voyage was to save herself and them from the catastrophe of a public scandal. Money is always the most emotional of human concerns, though it is the least celebrated in romance. Again and again, Mem revolted at the outrage of robbing her own parents of their one shield against old age. She went again and again to Dr. Bretherick and demanded that he release her from her promises not to tell the truth and not to kill herself, but he compelled her to his will and she was too glad for a will to replace her own panic to resist him. For a necessary stimulant, he prophesied that, somehow, in that land of gold she was seeking, she would find such wealth that she could repay her parents their loan with usury, with wealth, perhaps. Who knew? In these times, he said, it's the girls who are running away from home to find their fortunes, and lots of them are finding them. 
your dear old fool of a father is always preaching about the good old days when women were respected and respectable when parents were revered and took care of their children as my boy says where does he get that stuff he knows better why does he have to lie about it so piously why don't they use some plain horse sense some truth with a little t in the pulpit once in a while and not so much truth with a capital t in the good old days the best parents used to whip their children nearly to death the poor ones bound them out as apprentices into child slavery chained them to factories for fourteen hours a day they had no child labor laws no societies for prevention of cruelty to children no children's court no boy scouts or girl scouts and the wickedness was frightful and as for the grown-up girls most of them had no education and no chance for ambition if they went wrong they could go to a convent or slink around the back streets or go out and walk the streets at night the drunkenness and debauchery and disease were hideous even the sabbath breaking and skepticism were universal but still they call them the good old days and they dare to praise them above these glorious days when women are for the first time free and men were never free either till now for men had the responsibility of women's souls on their own and my god what a burden it was and how they boggled it this is really the year one now at last a girl like you can look life in the face and if she makes a mistake she can make her life worth while and not fall into the mewling puling parasite and disease germ of the good old-fashioned woman you ought to thank god for letting you live now and you've got to show him how much you prize the golden opportunity it's just sun up this is the dawn of the day when man and woman are equal and children have a clean sky overhead i was reading the other day a list a mile long of self-made women who had begun poor and finished rich some of them made their wealth out of candy and some of them in wall street some of them in all sorts of arts paintings novels plays music acting you might go into the movies for instance and make more money than coal old johnny it's scandalous what some of those little tykes are earning i tell you ma'am if you've got any spunk you'll make yourself a millionaires all this suffering is education all this acting you're doing may show you the way to glory go west young woman and go up in the world i've never been anywhere or seen anything i've never even seen a movie said ma'am well as the feller said who was asked if he could play the violin he didn't know he'd never tried when you get a safe distance from any danger of giving your pa apoplexy sneak into a movie and see if you see anything you can't do looks like to me you might cut quite a swath there probably you'd have to learn to ride a horse throw a lasso and dance but fallin off trains and bein spilled off cliffs in automobiles oughtn't to take much talent and it can't be very risky since i see the same young ladies runnin the same gauntlets and comin up and smilin the next picture there's a serial at the palace once a week that shows one wide-eyed lassie who is absolutely bulletproof they can't drown that girl burn her freeze her or poison her she laughs at gravity bounces off roofs and cliffs and bobs up serenely from below her throat simply can't be throttled she can take care of herself anywheres why i've seen her overpower nearly a hundred bandits so far and she looks fresher than ever if i was you i'd take a whack at it do they have movies in tuxen i think likely i hear they've got em on both poles north and south mem imbibed mysterious tonics at the doctor's office and always came away buoyed up with the feeling that her tragedy was unimportant commonplace and sure to have a happy finish but the moment she reached home she entered a domain where everything was solemn where jokes were never heard except pathetic old witticisms more important in intention than in amusement they began to irritate her to wear her raw and exacerbate her tenderest feelings she was beginning to be ruined by the very influences that should have sweetened her soul and at last one day quite unexpectedly when she was under no apparent tension at all when her father had gone to visit a sick parishioner and her mother was quietly at work upon mem's travelling clothes 
the girl reached the end of her resources. Perhaps it was a noble revolt against interminable deceit. Perhaps it was a selfish impulse to fling off a little of her back-breaking burden of silence. Perhaps it was a mad desire to make someone else a partner in her lies. Perhaps it was the unendurable hum of her mother's sewing machine. Whatever it was that moved her, she rose quietly, put down her needlework, went into Mrs. Steddon's room, closed the door, took her mother's hands from the cloth they were guiding, and said in a quiet tone, Mama, I want to tell you something. I'd rather break your heart than deceive you any longer. Why, honey, what's the matter? Why, Mem, dear, what on earth is it? Sit down and tell your mother, of course, you can't break this tough old heart of mine. What is it, baby? She whispered it so softly that her breath was hardly syllabled. Her mother caught less the words than the hiss and rustle of her awe and the wild language of her trapped eyes. Mama, I'm, I'm going to have, to have a baby. The shock was its own ether. Mrs. Steddon whispered back, cowering, You? You? My baby? You a baby? Mem nodded and nodded till her knees were on the floor and her brow in her mother's lap. Old hands came gropingly about her cheeks. She felt the drip, drip of tears falling into her hair, each tear a separate pearl from a crown of pride. Then the shivering hands at her cheeks lifted her face and she stared up, as much amazed as her mother, in whose downward stare there was no horror or reproach, only compassion and infinite fear. And her mother fumbled at the dreadful question, But who? Who? Elwood. The hands upholding her head dropped limp. The eyes above her were dry, blank, and ghastly. The mind behind them baffled beyond effort. Then they grew human again with a sudden throb of tears upon tears, and her mother groaned with double pity. Poor baby, poor ma'am, poor little thing. Grandmothers acquire a witch-like knowledge of life. They know the things that may not be published. They see the cruel wickedness of the world overwhelming their own beloved ones, and an awful wisdom is theirs. They know something of the mockery of punishment, and they are usually derided by the less experienced for their lax ideas of the miserable bungling called justice. Mem's confession was an enunciation of grandmotherhood to Mrs. Steddon. She was so stunned that she expressed no horror at the abyss of horror yawning before her feet. Two instincts prevailed while her reason was in a stupor. Love of her husband, love of her child. The decision was easy, and she made no difficulty of the gross deceits involved. Her husband must be protected in his illusions, and protected from the necessity of wreaking his high moral principles on his own child. His child must be protected from the merciless world and the immediate wrath of the village. She said little, she caressed much. She confirmed Dr. Bretherick's prescription and joined the conspiracy administering secret comfort to the girl and to the father. The nearer the day of Mem's departure, the slower dragged the hours between. But at last, she was standing on the back platform of a train bound for the vast southwest. She was throwing tear-sprent kisses to her father and mother as they blurred into the distance. They watched the train dwindling, like a telescope drawn into itself, as so many parents have watched so many trains and ships and carriages vanish into space with the beloved of their hearts and bodies. They turned back to their lives as if they had closed a door upon themselves. But Mem, as she returned to her place in the car, felt as if a portcullis had lifted. Before her was all outdoors. End of chapter 6 Recording by Deanna Beauvais Chapter 7 of Souls for Sale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Souls for Sale by Rupert Hughes. Chapter 7. The wheels ran with a rollicking lilt beneath the girl's body, 
throbbing likewise with a zest of velocity through her head an old tune ran that she had often sung with the homecoming crowds on church picnics i saw the boat go round the bend the deck was filled with traveling men good-bye my lover good-bye she was on a train going round bend after bend and the train was filled with traveling men some of them as they zigzagged along the aisles swept her face and her form with glances like swift lingering hands that hated to let her go this was a startling sensation a new kind of nakedness for her inexperienced soul the eyes of the women flung along the aisle also widened and tarried as they recognized in her a something she had not yet found out that she was very very pretty attractive compulsive she was like a magnet that had never met iron filings before had never learned the mystery and could not understand it as we think we understand what is merely familiar she was plainly dressed and had never been adorned only her neatness kept her from shabbiness but she had beauty and appeal the appeal of a ripe peach grown in somebody's orchard but thrust out over a wayside fence to tempt the passer-by some of the men who saw her did not care for peaches or had had their fill of them and regarded her with indifference but others looked hungry or at least betrayed an academic approval such of the women as had no instinct of jealousy were gladdened by her prettiness and her youth and felt that she brightened the roadside and sweetened the air others saw in her arrival a danger and suspicion narrowed their lids they consoled themselves with the thought that she was wicked and worthless an opinion which they could not know she shared with them on the train mem had planned to do a bit of thinking but after the first exultance of escape and the thrill of speed she relapsed into despondency and fear fear of everything and everybody she had still to act but she was a strolling player now with an ever-changing audience and this gave her a new kind of stage fright the only familiar companion was remorse she could not run away from that running away was a new subject for remorse she thought of herself as a convict escaped breathless from a deserved punishment to a wilderness of uncertainties as a trustee who has betrayed the confidence of a kindly warden and rewarded confidence with deceit she had expected to find on the journey leisure for contrition and the remolding of her soul but the world would not let her alone everything was new to her everything was a crowded film of novelty she knew the minimum of the outside sphere possible to a girl who had had any education at all she had never been on a sleeping car before she had read no novels except such sweetened water as the sunday school library afforded she had seen no magazines at home except the church publications and her girl friends happened to be infrequent readers of fiction calverly had no bookstore and the newsstand did little trade in the periodicals that are credited with the ruin of the young when the critics have time enough to spare from the theatre and moving picture and the dance she had never been to a theatre or a moving picture she had never danced even a square dance not so much as a dan tucker a virginia reel or a minuet in costume she had never ridden a bicycle or a horse and had never been in any automobile except some old bone shaker that drowned conversation in its own rattle she had never gambled or been profane or even slangy or disrespectful to her parents she had never seen a cocktail she had never worn a low-necked high-skirted dress she had never seen a bathing suit or had one on girls did not swim in the river at calverly in fact she had escaped all the things that moralists point to as the reasons why girls go wrong yet she had as the saying is gone wrong utterly indubitably yet no fast young man had led her astray or so much as tried to lead her astray she had never made the acquaintance of a fast young man her betrothed lover was slow and honorable and religious everything a young man ought to be but unfortunately for her one of the things a young man ought to be must be if he is a man is passionate otherwise he can never be a husband or a father and a woman cannot be a good wife and mother if she lacks those fires which burn when they escape 
and which no power has ever kept from occasional untimely escape. And so, on a Sabbath evening, the solemn young man to whom she was affianced had been somehow impelled by seeing through the window her parents kissing her good night to want to add his kiss to theirs. On the porch that frowned out the heathen moon, he had held her hand a little more straightly than was his wont. He had drawn her to him and moved toward her. There seemed to be volition in neither of them. They just floated together with a mysterious bewilderment. She had looked up in questioning surprise at the hot strength of his hand clasp. He had looked down at her in questioning surprise at the unusual beauty of her shadow-blotted face. Not seeing her at all, she was somehow more beautiful than ever, since imagination had free sweep. And who can give laws to imagination? Their lips had moved together by the same amazing attraction. The hasty brushing of her mouth with his had been like the drawing of a match along a kindling surface, and he had been impelled to return for another kiss, a longer kiss, the strangest kiss that either had ever known. And then a strange, a terrifying, irresistible mood had imbued them both. His arms were suddenly like fierce serpents about her, ruthless with constriction. Her arms were serpents suddenly. They seemed to feel a necessity for becoming one. Their hearts were turned to a sweet, shivering, poisonous jelly. Their blinded eyes were clenched to shut out the world and shut in the heaven that lifted them as on the little wings of cherubim. Mem closed her eyes in a sudden return of memory like a re-experience. She almost swooned with the terror of remembrance, and her repentance seemed to flee, contemptible and ridiculous, as her reason had fled from that first visit of romance. She was astounded at herself. She felt a hypocrite even to herself. She was not really sorry. She could never trust herself to learn. In spite of all that had proved the folly and the evil of her mistake, she wondered if it would not always recur to her as somehow a divine madness, wiser far than any earthly reason. Her brain was scorched with a furious thought whipping through it like a laughing flame. A mocking Lilith seemed to be laughing at her holier self. A new being inside her soul was rejoicing that she had given herself in all ecstasy to Elwood before he died. Even if he were damned for it, it seemed well that he should not have left this earth and this flesh without knowing its paradise. There was neither marrying nor giving in marriage where he had gone, and their reunion would have been a bodiless greeting of ghosts if this sweet world had not overwhelmed them and their worldly frames with its supreme rapture. Elwood had never known anything but poverty, hard work, poor food, none of the silk and satin, none of the revelry and the wine and the splendor of the world. He had known nothing rich but her love. He had been caught at his self-denial, putting a little of his earnings into the pitiful savings he had achieved. He had been struck as with a great shell and shattered like the splintered glass that filled his poor, crushed body. He had died fighting against any outcry of protest or of pain. He had died muttering something that nobody knew, but she felt that he was stammering her name with his all-obliterated lips. And her body was one music, her members chanted a triumphant song, because his body had known the symphonic music of her love. Then the rhapsody died away, the Lilith vanished from her mood, and the little grey Puritan named Remember came back to the profane shrine of her soul, aghast, incredulous, revolted. Romance had turned to a gargoyle of grotesque and obscene ugliness. She could not believe herself or trust her own profoundest face again. She was afraid and felt herself condemned to destruction. She was a scapegoat going out into the wilderness, but capable of sudden frenzies of pride in her burden of sin, incapable of shaking it off, afraid of being lonely without it. She returned slowly from the blind voyage of her soul into the invisible and wondered what had passed before her eyes in the long interim. She was learning to know herself, and in herself to know humanity. Her ignorance had been abysmal. To those who can believe ignorance beautiful, it had been ideal. There was peace of a sort in those sheltered canons, 
But now she was climbing the mountains, the crags. She would see strange snows, strange flowers, exquisite deserts, smothering Edens. The clanking uproar of the entrance into Kansas City filled her ears and drove away the music of the fiends. Factories, warehouses, freight trains, roundhouses, warning bells at street crossings, where watchmen stood with flags before long bars. All the usual noisy bustle of approach to a large town assailed her. The train seemed to hurry, though it went more slowly. It was the plenitude of objects of interest that gave it the illusion of speed, as it is in the passage of a life. Mem had never seen a great city, and this metropolis had a tremendous majesty in her eyes. Some of the passengers from eastern points were getting off, and she was fascinated to see how the porter whisked broom their coats and hats and palmed their tips with an almost dancing rhythm. One of the portly women passengers, whose voice had outclicked the wheels, asked the porter how long the train would stop, and when the diplomat said, Eight minutes, miss, she made a loud declaration of her intention to stretch her legs. Others made ready for a breath of air, and so did Mem, who was spying and eavesdropping on everybody, picking up what hints she could to disguise her ignorance of travel and appear as a complete railroader. The passengers choked the straight corridor along the row of compartments, and Mem took her place in the line. One of the doors opened and framed a tall and powerful young man with a peculiarly wistful face. His eyes brushed Mem, and he lifted his hat as he asked her pardon for squeezing past her. He knocked at another steel door and called through, Oh, Robina, better come out for a bit of exercise. While he waited, some of the passengers were twisting their necks to watch him and nudging and whispering to one another. When the door opened and Robina stepped out, there was such a sensation and such a boorish staring that Mem turned to look. A young woman of an almost dazzling beauty came out, smiling and bareheaded. She noted the yokelry in the corridor, and her smile died. She stepped back into her stateroom, and when she reappeared, she wore a large drooping hat and a thick black veil. I envy you the privilege of the veil, the young man said. Mem could not hear her answer, for the passengers began to move out, and she was carried forward with them to the steps and the station platform into a morass of handbags and red-capped negro porters. She escaped the tangle and found a clear space for her promenade. It gave her extraordinary exhilaration to be in a strange city. It was Cathay to her. Mem walked up and down the platform as if her feet were winged. There was a delightful frightfulness about wondering what she would do if the engine started suddenly. She would like to run and swing aboard like a professional trainman. When she saw that the engine had unlinked itself and departed into the distance beyond the cave of the station, she felt safe enough to explore all the way up to the baggage car. The baggage men and mail crew looked at her with that new way these foreigners had of looking at her, and she turned back. The other passengers trudging up and down stared at her, the men especially, all except the tall young fellow with the veiled lady. The rest were a funny lot, bareheaded or in traveling caps. She noted how they followed the tall young man and commented on his partner, but she could not catch their words. Some of the strollers bought things to eat from boys who carried baskets of oranges, chocolate, chewing gum, and cigars. Mem felt a longing to buy something for the sheer sport of buying, but she had no money for extravagances. Still, when she saw a newsman with a cargo of magazines, she could not resist the appeal. She would charge it off to education. She went so far as to buy two magazines devoted to the moving pictures. She had the curiosity of Bluebeard's final wife concerning that forbidden closet. As she was picking out the exact change from the small money in her purse, one of the magazines slipped from under her elbow and fell to the ground. She turned and stooped to recover it. Her hand touched a hand that had just anticipated hers. She looked up quickly, and her head knocked off the hat of the man who had tried to save her the trouble of picking up her magazine. Their noses were so close together that he seemed to have only one cyclopean eye. Each thinking that the other had the priority, both stood up with a nervous laugh. She saw that the gallant was the tall youth who had crushed past her in the corridor. 
His face vanished from her sight as he bent again to pick up her magazine and his hat. Then his face came up again like a sun dawning across her horizon. His eyes beat upon her like long beams. There was a kind of pathos in them, but also a great brightness, which, like the sun, he poured upon millions alike. But Mem did not know this. She felt warmed and healed, and she bloomed a trifle as a rose does when the sun gilds it. Meanwhile, with great calm, and as much of a bow as he could make without a sense of intrusion, the young man solemnly offered Mem his own hat and laid her magazine on his head. Then both of them laughed as he corrected the automatic mistake of his muscles. He blushed hotly, for he was not used to such blunders. Mem found an amazing magnetism in his smile and in his eyes. She did not know that that sad smile of his was making a millionaire of him. He was selling it by the foot, thousands of feet of it. His smile was broad enough to circumscribe the world, and his eyes had enough sorrow for all the audiences. He did not take advantage of the opportunity for further conversation, but bowed again and turned back to the waiting Robina, leaving Mem in a kind of abrupt shadow as if the sun had gone under a cloud. Robina was evidently not used to being kept waiting. She had had little practice. She resented the slight with such quick wrath that Mem could hear her protesting sarcasm, a rather disappointing rebuke. Don't hurry on my account, Tom. So his name was Tom. All that grandeur and grace, and only Tom for a title. Robina's voice was not magnetic, but then she was not selling her voice. Mem was in such a flutter that she dropped her purse, the coins popping about like cranberries. Robina saw the catastrophe, but she had seen women drop things on purpose when men were near, and she held Tom's arm so that he could neither see the disaster nor lend his aid again. As Mem knelt and plucked up a penny here, a quarter there, two young girls assailed Robina's prisoner with shameless idolatry. She paused, kneeling and listened. One of them rattled on. Oh, Mr. Holmby, we knew you the minute we laid eyes on you. You're our favorite of all the screen stars, and, oh dear, if we only had our autographed albums with us. You got no photographs with you, have you? The other girl broke in jealously. Oh, of course he hasn't. What you think he is, a freak and amuse him? But couldn't you, wouldn't you, send us one apiece? I'll give you the address if you'll lend me a pencil. Tom was indomitably polite, and besides, it was bad business to snub an admirer. He was actually about to write their addresses in his notebook when the conductor's long far call, All aboard, gave Robina an excuse to drag him away from the worshippers. One of the girls groaned. He got away, darn it. The other, in an epilepsy of agitation, wailed. Say, looky, that lady under the veil is Robina Teal. Gee, and we didn't recognize her. Thus the Greeks were also stricken with a panic of reverence when the gods came down to earth. But Mem did not know or worship these gods. She had only a vague impression of what was going on as she snatched at the last of her available coins and ran to the train. The porter had already put up his little box step. The loss of any petty sum meant a privation, but her regret was swallowed in her vivid realization of what it would have meant to be left there in that town. She was panting hard with fright when she sank into her place, and the train was emerging from the retreating walls of the city before she felt calm enough to examine her magazines. On the cover of one of them was a huge head of Robina Teal, all eyes and curls and an incredibly luscious mouth. Remember had never heard of her or seen her pictures because her films were great feature specials, too expensive for the villages. In the body of the magazine was a long article about her and another about Tom Holmby. This was not so amazing a coincidence as it seemed to Mem, for both Robina Teal and Tom Holby had press agents who would have been chagrined if any motion picture periodical had appeared without some blazon of their employers. Mem stared longest at the various pictures of Tom Holmby. She found him in all manner of costumes and athletic achievements, and she read the rhapsody on him first. 
having never seen a moving picture of anybody she had never seen his she had never seen a still picture of him either because he was not as yet important enough to be starred and only such greedy pantheists as the young girls on the platform were as yet aware of him mem was dumbfounded to realize how ignorant she was here were people so important that people stared at them and begged for their pictures while magazines published glowing tributes to them and she had never heard of them now that she saw him in print her heart fairly simmered with the thrill of her encounter with him it was as if she had knocked the hat off king david as he bent to pick up her harp for her she forgot for a long while that she was a respectable widow of a very poor sort for it came to her in an avalanche of shame that she was neither respectable nor a widow but she was a fugitive now from her past and from such thoughts and she caught up the magazines with a desperate eagerness as if they were cups of nepenthes end of chapter seven recording by diana beauvais chapter eight of souls for sale this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org souls for sale by rupert hughes chapter eight dr steddon would have sent up a new kind of prayer if he could have seen his daughter guzzling at the profane literature that had fallen into her hands the first of the magazines was devoted to articles about the famous film stars and their families philosophies and fads men and women some of whose faces had stared at her from the billboards of calverley were presented here in mufti here was a daredevil cowboy seated on the porch of a gorgeous home with a delicious baby in his arms here were beautiful leaning men smoking pipes and reading books or cuddling dogs here were women of all types many of them evidently wealthy and all of them intensely domestic it was surprising how many of the prettiest of them were dangling babies womanlike mem cooed and gurgled at the fat babies one of them sent a wonderful sweet pang through her heart for the first time she felt a welcome and a love for the mysterious visitor whose secret couriers had caused her such a frenzy of terror for the first time her soul yearned within her and her curiosity to see what her child would look like and be like overcame every other feeling she had hoped to die now she wanted to live to solve this mystery story in nine installments she felt for the first time pride in her amazing power she read every word of the first magazine including the advertisements then a white-aproned waiter marched through the car crying first call for lunch and dine and car first call for lunch dine and car the trek to the dining car was another new experience the prices were terrifying but the new dishes were educational she chose the cheapest but they were spiced with the sauce of novelty she had never eaten at sixty miles an hour it was strange to start to lift your fork and have it reach your mouth a hundred feet away you might lift your spoon from your teacup in one county and have it reach your lips in another there was much landscape between the cup and the lip the view outside her dining room at home had never changed except from winter to summer but here the world went racing past the man opposite her was unpleasantly interested in her thoughts he lacked both the beauty and the homage of mr tom holby her animation the restlessness of her eyes her cheeks swimming with color misled him into thinking she was trying to strike up a flirtation he had no appetite for a flirtation even with so pretty a thing but if she wished it it was his duty to play the game mem could not understand the samaritan gallantry of this she hated him and stared at the schooning scenery then she found that she was still staring at the man since he was reflected on the window then she stared at her food she lingered longer than was necessary in the hope that mr holby and miss teal would visit the diner but they did not appear she returned to her car and took up the second magazine this was also devoted to the screen people but it was more ambitious artistically some of the pictures were in colors or laid on tinted backgrounds 
and many of them were so audacious that Mem felt it hardly proper for her to look at them in the miscellaneous company of the sleeping car. Of course, it was her duty to throw the accursed thing away, but then she thought, with profound sorrow, she was not doing her duty much nowadays. Being an abandoned creature, anyway, she abandoned herself to this amazing repository of intimacies. Being a preacher's daughter, she also told herself that if she threw it away, it might fall into the hands of people it would do more harm to. Here were women of opulent beauty, in tremendous hats, with niagaral plumes, in skirts voluminous enough to conceal a family. There were others with almost nothing on at all. Some of these had a perfection of figure of which they submitted all the evidence. Some of them rejoiced in postures as extravagant as their costumes were parsimonious. Some of them rejoiced in postures as extravagant as their costumes were parsimonious. Some of them had clutched a few furs or silks about them just barely in time, and looked so startled and so shy that Mem wondered why they had permitted the pictures to be published at all. She had not yet learned how much a baby stare conceals. She had not learned that she herself, for all her experience, looked at the world with a baby stare. There were a few portraits of men, even more garbless, foreign dancers and Americans in barbaric decorations. There was an article about a cubist painter whose mad paintings made Mem's head ache. There was an article about a titled Englishman of fame who was going to write moving pictures. There was a bevy of contestants for a beauty prize, the winner to be given a position in a movie studio. These girls came from all over the country. They hailed from villages, small towns, and the obscure regions of big cities. They were labeled as Miss X, stenographer, Miss Z, shop girl, Miss Y, home girl, and so on. They had tricked themselves out in makeshift splendor posed themselves in mimicry of famous stars, their hair down, their eyes up, their hands and feet draped in what they thought artistic poses. Some of them were very pretty, and all of them ambitious to sway the world and garner wealth. Worried a little by the hubbub of beauty and its advertisement, Mem put the two magazines aside. They seemed to be hot with curious flames that strangely did not shrivel the paper. The people who were celebrated there by name and face and figure must, if there were any truth in her father's faith, be lost souls, damned to blister in their unshriveling skins forever. But how little they must know of their destinies, or if they knew, how little they cared, how sleek and passionate and glad they were, and how richly clothed, richly unclothed, some of them, for the least attired, had on the most jewels, Mem glanced down at her own shabby skirt and realized for the first time what a little Puritan she was, her knees so modestly drawn together, her elbows clamped in, her hands embracing each other like babes in the wood, her meek head bowed a little, her eyes generally lowered except for some brief dart upward, as if she stood a tiptoe for a moment. Suddenly she was aware of her flesh in a way almost unknown before. From her earliest infancy, the first duty imposed upon her had been modesty. She had always been pulling down her skirts and up her bodice, keeping herself inconspicuous. Even her loud laughter brought down the candle snuffer of reproof. As far back into her babyhood as she could recollect, her mother had bathed her with averted gaze and kept the towels about her. Later, when she had attained the dignity of being too big to be seen and washed by her mother, she had been instructed to keep herself concealed, even from her own eyes. She had been warned that God was everywhere. His sleepless eyes were not even turned away in a bathroom. She had asked her mother once, Why does God go round, peeking at people and doing things you tell me are not nice? Isn't God a good gentleman? Her mother had been properly shocked and answered innocence with horror, Mem had never even wondered for a moment if God had not been slightly misrepresented. It had never occurred to her that perhaps his poor, half-witted worshippers were endowing him with their own weak intellects, slandering him with their stupid reverence, and enforcing their own silly prejudices upon souls far wiser, though lacking the fearlessness of bigotry. 
as a result of her reproved curiosities mem hardly knew herself her father had never maintained the earlier christian doctrine that to bathe at all was a heathen abomination a pollution of the soul under the guise of cleansing the loathsome flesh yet bathing in the steden home had been a rite of sanitation not of luxury a godly scrubbing not a loitering in the perfumed depths of porcelain tubs god had made perfume but he wanted it left in the flowers to die and stink with them and perfume was expensive as well as wicked mem had been able to afford only the least costly of sins the sin that the poorest can pay for as she sat staring into the window the landscape leaping past the double glass with its own glimmer of lights she tried to fancy herself like one of those twisted girls who admitted the public to a bathroom acquaintance she tried to imagine herself with most of her clothes in her headdress and all her limbs exploited for the inspection of strangers and her body contorted to show how limber it was and how smoothly round her fancy could not make the distance yet she read in one of these magazines a statement that one of those peculiar women this very robina teal indeed was being paid more dollars for one week's publicity than her father was paid for four years of saving souls the press agent may have squandered a cipher or shifted the decimal point a little but mem could not know that and she was convinced that the world was all wrong somewhere plainly no wonder people said it was going to perdition she wondered what such woman could be like at heart and at home as she glanced through the pages of answers to correspondence and how countless the questioners seemed to be her eye caught this paragraph mamie l yes dearie she will send you a photograph if you will send her twenty-five cents sorry to break your heart but he is married tom holby isn't though so far as i know how much he gets is his own secret and the income tax collectors but it was stated that he lately refused an offer of a thousand a week to desert the company that made him what he am today such loyalty deserves a posy mem closed the magazine with a gasp that young man refused a thousand a week and her father had never had more than five hundred a year and her father saved souls from hell while men like holby led them there in droves and would follow in god's good time she did not feel any impulse to rush to tom holby and warn him to flee from his doom she simply hated him for selling his soul to the devil at such a price she did not even admire him for cheating the devil she just hated him and the cat-eyed robina and all this babylonian horde of scarlet women and then she heard a voice across her shoulder a voice of peculiar and unpleasant softness she had read somewhere of a velvet voice this one was of plush she felt uneasy before she turned her head and almost bumped noses with the woman who spoke at this close range her resemblance to a doll was astounding the eyes were vast and glassy the nose a pug the mouth full and thick with paint the face smeared white and red the hair kinky yellow as if it were made of hobby horses tails the voice of imitation velvet repeated what i was saying was if you finish the magazine you mind if i borrow it off you i ain't saw that number yet mem hardly knew how to answer that face and that dialect she handed the magazine up over the back of the seat with a smile of shy generosity the animated doll remained leaning across the seat she must be kneeling on the other side as she skimmed the magazine rapidly the way she ran her eyes up each page reminded mem somehow of a cat licking one of its paws as the girl skimmed picture and text she talked without looking at mem you're on the way to sanglas i suppose to where los anglos chief suburb of hollywood nearly everybody in this train is bound for sanglos just where is that my god is there anybody on earth who don't know that dump or maybe you call it los angeles no two people pronounce it alike oh i beg your pardon i didn't catch the name at first 
no i'm only going as far as tuxen tucson eh you're not on the screen i guess no no i'm not it's the life leastways it was so many amateurs being drawed into it now though it ain't what it was it's the money gets them all who should suppose us on this train i can't imagine the strange creature disappeared and came round to sit down opposite mem Would you mind if i sit with you a while you're alone ain't you or is your husband up smoking the way mine always is as i says to cyril only the other day if you'd a give as much attention to your art as to your tobacco you'd have jean d working for you i says better to smoke here than hereafter he says he's awful speedy with the subtitles that boy i don't smoke myself not that i got any prejudices against it but i think it takes away from a woman's charm don't you no offence intended maybe you smoke yourself mem wagged her head in a daze she would have been horrified to be suspected of tobacco and yet since this blatant piece of ignorant artifice had objections to it her inclination grew perverse the magazine engaged the visitor's attention a moment and mem studied her as if she were something in a zoo there was aggressive impudence in the very way she sat her chin high her nostrils aflare her head flaunted now and then to shake away her curls as a mare tosses her mane aside her shoulders thrown back her bosom uplifted her elbows agog one hand set with fingers to spread on an emphatic hip legs all over the place and the skirt so short that one knee bared by its rolled down stocking was manifest mem was almost petrified to observe that the knee cap was powdered and rouged yet she could not help noting also that it was exquisitely modeled and the calves as delicately lathed as a chippendale spindle there was refinement in all the creature's outlines yet hopeless spiritual coarseness the conflict jarred on mem who had taken as little thought of aesthetic mysteries as any pretty girl could and live as long as she had lived abruptly the perfectly modeled minx shattered mem's calm with the first curse she had ever heard a woman use well i'm damned would you see what they done to me she whirled herself round and plunged down at mem's side in a cyclone of perfumery she pointed to the open page where there was a picture that had slapped mem in the face a young man clad in a leopard's pelt and nothing else danced while he held the loft like a cane the horizontal figure of a girl similarly revealed and concealed she was flung backward broken at the waist a mass of hair flowing down from her reverted head and she was pitifully beautiful the name under the picture was viva de artois that's me viva d'artois stage name of course they used that old picture of me with my first husband the nerve of them i ought to sue him for slander he's three years old them leopard skins is all out of style they done that to me just to save making a new cut god i hope cyril don't see it he's so sensitive i'll show you one of my latest and while mem's soul was joggled as if the train had left the rails to run along the ties the girl had left her and returned carrying a sheaf of photographs which she displayed with a frankness that shattered mem's calm in some of them she was as fragile and poetical as if she had capered off the side of a greek face by durus himself in others her beauty was petulant and deprecatory shy and inexpressibly pure again she was an acrobat reckless of consequences there were pictures of her husband and herself her husband looking as much like a young greek god as possible holding her in the air as high as possible and each permitted the other to be seen in public like that mem was so shaken that she could find nothing at all to say she regained speech only when mademoiselle d'artois brought out some scenes taken on the steps of her home a charming little spanish bungalow with her husband mowing the lawn and her ancient mother smiling from the porch 
in all these pictures mademoiselle viva held a baby an adorable chubby thing that restored mem to civilization as she understood it the mother explained i had to leave him for a dash to new york i and my husband had to play a couple of dancers at the swell reception for the movies of course and they had us shoot us on fifth avenue to get local color they shot you for local color where on fifth avenue we've been shot all over the place we used to be in vaudeville but we drifted into doing spectaculars for the movies in the big productions it's the life hadn't you ever thought of taking a shy at it mem shook her head mademoiselle viva smiled come on in the water's fine with your face and figure there's nothing to it mem shuddered her figure was her own for only a little while longer the eden of the movies was not for her viva was willing to gossip as long as anyone was willing to listen she admitted this herself with the frank helplessness of a garrulous soul cyril's always saying i never stop i'm what he hears talking when he falls asleep and the first thing he hears in the morning is me talking sometimes he says are you talking again or yet but mem was an insatiable audience her information was a sahara and no amount of rain could be too much all afternoon viva chattered giving mem a liberal education in one of the countless phases of moving picture life a foreign world another planet where everything was unlike anything she had ever imagined where the very laws of social gravity were reversed she was getting an altogether twisted idea of it all her guide was as trustworthy as a peruvian indian trying to describe the heroic wonders of the lost city of machu picchu mem's knowledge of italy was gained from a banana and a fruit peddler in calverley her introduction to Molvia was like that of one who enters stambul by railroad through the backyards of constantinople what she heard gave her no curiosity to see more and an assurance that her dear old father had made a good guess at los angeles end of chapter eight recording by diana beauvais chapter nine of souls for sale this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Souls for Sale by Rupert Hughes. Chapter 9 Viva was still talking when the waiter came through again with his proclamation. First call for dinner in dining car. First call for dinner in dining car. There was a scurry among the passengers, and Mem was eager to go, but Viva could not break off the story she was telling. Suddenly she stopped, stared, seized Mem's arm, and whispered, Pipe what's coming. Mem piped, a dramatic woman of singularly noble face and figure, and somewhat grandiose carriage. Following her was an elegant gentleman of a certain exoticism, a bit peevish over the bad manners the train displayed in tossing him to and fro you know who that is viva whispered and did not stay for an answer that dame is the great miriam yore she's been the grand slam at the metropolitan opera for years and the flossy guy with her is that big english author what's his name you know he wrote oh all them books they're bound for movie land too everybody's making that way the competition is something fierce her voice died as the two drifted down the aisle pausing to talk in snatches between dashes for the next leaning post as the train swung the great miriam half across mem's seat the author was saying everybody tells me that los angeles is absolutely then they were gone reawakening in mem her desire to learn just what this fabulous city could be absolutely the return of viva's husband released her to her own thoughts for the rest of the evening viva introduced the partner of her fate and her dances and hurried away to the women's room to wash up for the eats her husband said a few amiable nothings to mem but she was afraid to look at him 
he cyril nay julius was ordinary enough in speech and appearance but mem could only see him as the panther pelted satyr who took the public absolutely into his confidence and swung his half-stripped wife aloft for all the world to see after dinner mem found her way to the observation car and sat on the platform a while watching the dark world of her past fleeing backward to the horizon and vanishing thence into the stars but her interests were no longer backward she wanted to look ahead she rose from the contemplation of night and re-entered the car noting that the writing desk was not in use she was reminded of her task she sat down and began a letter home her heart weary with the day's excursions melted again toward her mother and father she wrote them a prattle of childish enthusiasm about the journey she did not mention viva or the others she was afraid they would frighten her parents as much as they had frightened her and not so agreeably she had finished her letter and was sealing it when she suddenly remembered dr bretherick's prescription she was to take a lover on the first day the very name of the figment of bretherick's mania had been crowded out of her mind by these curious unbelievable people who actually moved and breathed after a little groping she recalled woodbury then woodhouse then woodville she took up the painful composition of a postscript with all the agony of an author trying to recall and to originate at the same time she had mentioned nobody that she had met now she must describe the important man that she would never meet he was an imaginary and therefore a quite perfect character she finally wrote oh i forgot who do you suppose i ran into on the train you'd never guess in a million years you know when i went to carthage to take care of aunt mabel well do you remember me telling you about the awfully nice man i met at church mr woodville was his name remember well would you believe it he is on this train isn't it a small world he has been most kind and polite i met him in church as you remember and somehow i feel much safer not being alone i'm sure you'll be glad he's very religious but awfully nice i mean so of course awfully nice good night again you darlings being told that they recollected mr woodville her parents obligingly remembered him mrs steddon had been warned of this fiction and collaborated in it dr steddon was one of those who believe almost anything they read especially when they hope for its truth and there was nothing he hoped for so much as that his child should meet a good man and love him and be loved by him that is the parental ideal and mem could have sent him no other message that could have so comforted him he awaited the second installment of her romance with all the impatience of a countryman watching for the stagecoach that brought along charles dickinson's serials piecemeal he knew nothing of the wiles of story-makers and did not suspect the trap his child was laying for him her name should have been sapphira end of chapter nine recording by diana beauvais chapter ten of souls for sale this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. souls for sale by rupert hughes chapter ten after she had finished her letter and sealed it mem paused wondering what to do with it she was in an agony of reluctance to send such a pack of lies to her mother and father she recalled the biblical warning against doing evil that good might come of it but she dared not face the evil that would certainly come if the truth were told as she sat irresolute beating the envelope against the tip of her fingers she saw miss miriam yore come into the observation car and pass on out to the platform she was followed by the famous unknown author they were both talking as before and the motion of the car threw them this way and that without checking their prattle mem was hungry to hear how great people talked to watch them behaving she had never seen any before she saw the porter of the observation car grinning in front of her foggily he spoke twice before she heard back what he had said want me to mail your letter lady at next stop 
She nodded and gave it to him with a warm thank you. He would have much preferred a cold quarter. Mem saw that the platform was not crowded, so she drifted out with labored casualness and sat down, pretending to study the scenery and to be quite deaf. Practice was making her a zealous actress, if not a good one. The author was just offering Miriam Yore a cigarette. Thanks, old thing. I don't dare. I smoke myself blue in the face today. I've got to fill my lungs with fresh air while the porter makes up my drawing room, or I won't sleep. As I was saying, I think you're quite wrong about the moving pictures. Of course, most of those that have been done are abominable, but that's because they were done for the wrong people, by the wrong people. Have you seen me in Hypatia? There was a picture. Poetry, passion, splendor, drama. In that scene where the Christian fanatics drove the wonderful Hypatia to the altar and stripped her naked and tore her to pieces, it was tremendous, you know, really. There was something there that only the camera could give. You didn't see me in that? She was a genuine, have you seen me? Just what the French call a mat de vue. No, I must confess, I go so seldom. In England, I saw mainly the cowboy pictures. I met some of the men of the 101 ranch when they were on the other side. Mem noted that he said ranch. It must be glorious to say it naturally. He went on. I love the cowboy things. Nursery instincts still surviving, I fancy. But the big spectacles, such as you speak of, they leave me cold. They have all the faults of grand opera and no music. I can stand the silent drama, but not the silent opera. But what right have you to criticize if you haven't seen? Oh, but my dear Miriam, if they had been worth seeing, I'd have been drawn to them. Rot, my dear, utter damned rot, and you know it. You are the type of literary buzzard who is never drawn to anything except what is dead or is done in a dead style according to dead rules. You live in a time when a new art is being created before your eyes, and instead of leaping into it, you are afraid. You hang back like a child afraid of the ocean. You put in a toe and run shrieking. You go back and a little wave rushes up to the seat of your little panties and chills you. You feel the sand giving way and scream for Nursie to come drag you out. Why don't you plunge in and learn to swim? Face the breakers. If you can't rise over them, dive under them. What are you afraid of? If the moving picture people are as stupid as you think they are, how easily they can be conquered by as great a mind as you think you are. The author squirmed. Oh, I say, my dear Miriam, aren't you laying it on a bit strong? Aren't I on the train, going out to study your ocean? I want to swim. I'm going to try, really. That's better. It's a far better thing than you've ever done, you'll see. You've written good novels, stories, plays, essays, poems, all sorts of things. But men have done those for thousands of years. When you write a movie, you do what no man ever did before this generation. And look at me. I've played plays. I've sung light operas and grand operas and danced a little, but good Lord, women have done those things for ages. In the moving picture, I'm doing something that no woman before my generation ever did. We are the pioneers, the argonauts, the discoverers. We shall be classics as sure as ever classics were. It's glorious. The author was a trifle jealous of such fine writing from a singer and an actress. He tried to put her in her place. I see what you're driving at. In fact, I've written much the same thing and said it to interviewers, who got it all wrong, of course. Interferers, I call them. But what good did it do me? I was merely accused of trying to whitewash myself for going after big money. Of course I want the big money. I insist on it, or I should if they refused it. Which they don't. Quite the contrary. But what I mean to say is, if I go in for moving pictures, I shall not try to do any of your grandiose things. They're all right in their place, but I think there's more art in the smaller forms. I want to do something smart. 
satirical the high comedy thing the pictures seem to me to need the aristocratic touch more than anything else miss your yawned beware of the aristocratic touch my dear it means boredom most of the time i know no end of aristocrats who are interesting but that's because they are soldiers or statesmen big game hunters adventurers but your deadly drawing rooms keep those off the screen or you'll bankrupt your backers the author yawned speaking of bankrupting your backers old dear i hear that you are doing your best to accomplish that i was told by a man who claimed to know that you are getting ten thousand a week is it true miriam rose and smacked his cheek lightly are you jealous yes i am rather they're only giving me twenty five thousand for my new piece they said they couldn't pay me more because you stars were such well the word they used was hogs it's a shame to pauperize me to fatten you fatten don't use the hideous word if you knew the agonies i go through to keep my flesh down all this money and all this glory and i'm hungry all the time she paused by the brass rail and gazed about the dark levels that seemed rather to revolve slowly about the train than to be left behind and she sighed strange place this little old world i was born on a prairie like this in a small town like the one we just rattled through i was a poor daughter of poor parents dad kept a drug store a chemist shop as you'd say and now well i've sung before kings and queens i've had princes make love to me more or less pitifully i've had diamonds from dukes i was engaged to a duke once you may have read or heard that idiotic story that i can't kill about the two children i had by the duke of why i never was alone with the man but anyway i've had those scandals and splendors and now i'm going back at a salary that why i could buy out most of the dukes i've met and i get it all for pretending to suffer imaginary woes in imaginary situations and you you were the son of a rusty little oxford don and you're complaining because you get only five thousand pounds for the moving picture rights of a silly fairy story you spin in a few months it's a drunken old world and we ought to be ashamed of ourselves for stealing its money but i have to give the british government fifty-three per cent of all i get he wailed the u s income tax murders me too she sighed she slipped through the door like her own latoska the author laughed a dreary good night stood a moment finishing his cigarette and studying out of the corner of his eye the mute meek auditor whom they had perhaps forgotten perhaps had been playing to all the time he wondered if mem knew who he was she had not heard his name and would not have recognized it if she had he felt like talking a lot about himself to somebody but he was englishy shy of broaching conversations he was himself a tight little isle with the gift for spreading his power around the world and making people think that his loneliness and timorousness and lack of savoir vivre were reserve the unknown and unknowing mem was afraid that he was going to speak to her but he did not dare he flicked his cigarette overboard majestically and made a good exit then he crept away to his lonely drawing-room and shuddered at the prospect of entering the new world with its new people a world of bounders as he had been told he left mem dizzy with what she had overheard the contrast between viva and miriam yore was complete the moving picture planet was plainly one of enormous size and variety but the wickedest thing about it in her eyes was the money it squandered the richest banker in calverley was a pauper compared with the woman who had just left the platform and all she did was to stand up and have her picture taken mem had never heard of hypatia and she did not believe that any such thing had happened as miriam yore described she did not know that the moving picture had been taken from a historical novel written by a clergyman neither did the clergyman probably as he had been dead for a quarter of a century before the pictures were taught to move all that mem knew of the reverend charles kingsley's works was the water babies 
and a poem from which her father was always quoting be good sweet maid and let who will be clever mem was not clever and everybody knew it yet she had not been good and only two people knew it not having been good she just had to be clever end of chapter 10 recording by diana bovet chapter 11 of souls for sale this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org souls for sale by rupert hughes chapter 11 grown suddenly afraid of the night shrouded plains and the loneliness of the deserted platform mem returned to the lights through car after car she pushed seeking her own she had not kept count of its number each car was now a narrow alley of curtains she was lost on a madly racing comet made up of bedrooms and corridors where men in their underclothes climbed ladders or sat on the edges of their beds yawning and undressing tussled heads leered at her from upper berths or from cubby holes she had to squeeze past men and women in bathrobes straggling down the halls she was frightened she had never believed such scenes possible she was panic-stricken at being unable to find her own hiding-place her porter was not to be found at last she met viva coming out of a washroom dressed as if someone had yelled fire mem felt positively fond of her a friend in need is a friend indeed viva wore a gaudy kimono and kept it close about her with modesty surprising in view of her photographs mem had not learned that artists of viva's field are no less prudish in private for being so shameless in public their safety in numbers mem greeted viva with enthusiasm oh i'm so glad to see you this must be my car then yes dearie said viva was you lost your number's number seven just this side of mine too bad you didn't take a section some big hick got on board whilst you was away and he's asleep up in your attic now this was disconcerting indeed the tenant of mem's sky parlor had left a pair of his shoes in front of her berth and his clothes were visible hanging on a coat hook there was no escape for the girl she had to clamber into her pigeonhole and make the best of it she had the curious feeling that she had crawled under a strange man's bed to spend the night though no sane burglar would ever have wasted time on a village minister's house mem had always looked under her bed for one before she kneeled down to say her prayers she hoped the man overhead would not take the same precautions and how was she to kneel down and say her prayers in that aisle in the berth she could not even kneel up this was the first night of her life that she ever omitted the genuflection she had to pray lying down and she asked the lord to forgive her this one more sin she had asked so much forgiveness of late she wanted to pray also that her letter should deceive and comfort her father but she dared not ask prosperity for a lie she dared not ask prosperity for the series of lies she was going to tell yet her thoughts and plans must be known up there yet again if they were known but it was growing complicated and she turned her thoughts to other things getting out of her clothes and into her nightgown was an experiment in contortion she was afraid to fall asleep but there was a drugging monotony in the muffled click clickety of the wheels and she soon knew peace and a much-needed oblivion all night long the train was speeding through kansas and the next morning was still in kansas getting dressed was another appalling experience for the girl and she peeked through her curtains to see what the proper costume was for the sprint to the washroom viva was not there to help her for viva slept late and her section was a curtained cabin for hours after the rest of the car was made up the scenery was flat as a pancake but there was no monotony in it for mem towns and farms and farms and towns windmills and tree clusters and barns and pigsties were all wonderland to her and dear brave people were making their homes there setting her watch back an hour just before entering the romantic state of oklahoma was in itself an exciting experience the names of the stations were literature poetry 
Archelon, Liberal, Guymon, Texhoma, Dalhart, Middlewater, Bravo, Naravisa, Tucum Carey, Los Tanos, Tularosa, Alma Gordo, Turquoise, Grogando, El Paso. She lunched in Kansas, crossed Oklahoma in two hours, entered Texas, dined in New Mexico, and breakfasted again in Texas, went right back into New Mexico, and lunched in Arizona. And what an encyclopedia of scenery she studied! The endless flats of Kansas, with its broad, lazy rivers slouching along their flat beds, the long famine of trees in bald levels, and then the sudden arrival in a morbid, fantastic realm where God had lost his temper or his patience or something, and flung everything awry, desert and vast nightmares of rock, as if the landscape had been designed by one of those mad cubists she had read about the day before. But everywhere there were evidences of human pluck, tireless ants fighting the titans for control, weak men who turn chaos to order and tame the wild regions to dominion. The scenery was such a book of adventure that Mem needed no other diversion. She was grateful for the fact that Viva had one of her sick headaches and did little talking. The heat and dust kept the great Miriam in her drawing room and Robina too. She saw Tom Holby in the dining car, but he did not speak to her, of course, because she did not speak to him. But she studied him slyly when he was not looking, and she wondered what could make him worth so much money. She had not learned that merchandise is worth just what it will bring in the market, whether the merchandise be ships or shoes or sealing wax, souls or smiles or tears. She felt for this handsome youth the contempt that women feel at times for handsome men. She felt a personal grudge against him because he lived and prospered and won multitudinous loves while her lover lay dead in oblivion. She abominated him for gaining so much wealth for doing nothing useful. She knew too little of life as yet to realize that beauty and foolish amusement are among the most useful contributions to existence and are not overpaid. There may be some doubt as to the actual benefits and the actual efficiency of most human activities and inventions, including the countless medicines, religions, political expedients, mechanisms of transportation, and other elaborate devices that create new irritations as fast as new conveniences. But beauty that warms the heart and folly that tickles it are as provedly valuable as laughing gas and other anesthetics. In fact, there is more than entomology in the kinship between aesthetics and anesthetics, and both have been denounced as hellish by the godly. Mem spent most of her day planning her second letter home and growing acquainted with that husband of hers. She used Tom Holby as a model, reluctantly, yet for lack of better material. She supposed that writing fiction must be as easy for its manufacturers as spinning webs is for spiders, but constructing character was exhausting work for her. Perhaps spiders grow weary too and suffer temperamental stringencies. She learned that the author must wrestle with the invisible as Jacob with the angel, and that the angel could dislocate a joint at a touch. Mr. Woodville eluded her maddeningly, and her sketch of him was so inconsistent that her father, when he received her second letter, found in its very befuddlement an evidence that she was losing her wits over the fellow. Dr. Stedden was pleasantly alarmed. Every man is afraid of every man who interests his daughter, yet he wants some man to capture her. The train carried Mem deeper and deeper into the soul of Mr. Woodville and in the dark hours she spent in her berth, reclining on an elbow and gazing at the incredible landscape, everything unreal grew real, and her mystic bridegroom began to take form and voice, eyes and integrity. She had great trouble with his trader profession. This is always a complication with authors. Most of them, in despair, ignore the matter entirely or give the character some craft with elastic office hours and income. The landscape was an incessant interruption. Just as she was about to settle on something, an amazing butte would slide past her window, or a captivating flat-roofed adobe hovel, infested with little human cooties of Mexican extraction, would delight her. The squalor of foreigners is always picturesque, 
And it is typical of the artistic mind to find more poetry in an alien garbage heap than in a familiar temple. The desert was beautiful to this girl because it was unusual. Its cruelty was romantic since she had not encountered its monotony. The next day, the train came to an abrupt halt. A driving bar on the engine had broken and dropped. It had torn off the ends of the ties for hundreds of yards before its drag had been noticed by the engineer and the engine stopped. If the train had not been puffing slowly up a steep grade, it would have been derailed and sent rolling like a shot snake. Some of the passengers would probably have been mangled and killed. It was a long while before the passengers found this out, and they reveled in the delight of averted disaster. Mem thought how fitting it would have been for her to have suffered a death so closely akin to Elwood's. There would have been an artistic grandeur in the pattern of their fates. And yet she could not help being glad to be alive. She had ridden a thousand miles and more, spiritually, as well as physically, away from Calverly. Nobody knew how long the train would be delayed. All were like people on a ship becalmed in mid-ocean. They could not go on until a new engine was secured. A trainman had to walk to the next block signal tower, miles ahead, and telegraph back for another locomotive. The passengers settled down to hours of deferment, cursing delay and comparing it, not with the speed of the pioneers who agonized across the wilderness, but with the velocity of yesterday's express. Viva and Mem wandered about, looking at the cactus and the sagebrush, and deliciously expecting a rattlesnake under every clump. Viva returned to the car and to sleep, but Mem strolled farther and farther away. She saw Tom Holby set out for a brisk walk. He climbed a ragged butte with astonishing agility, winning the applause of the passengers. He had the knack of acquiring applause. The other passengers dawdled about, but Mem went farther and farther. She wanted to see what was on the other side of that butte, as much as mankind has longed to see the other side of the moon. When she got round, she found that the other side was much like the other side, more desert, more buttes, utter dissimilarity, yet the complete resemblance of chaos to chaos. When she started back, the cool of the shadow made her rest a while. The heat and the hypnosis of the shimmering sand sea put her asleep in spite of herself. She woke with a start. The train was moving, a new engine dragging it and its broken engine. She ran, fell, picked herself up, limped forward. She was alone in the wilderness, and the train was already a toy, running through a gap between two lofty buttes, one a grandiose tower of Babel, the other a deformed and crooked writhe in diablerie. Both mocked the girl, unendurably, and she stood panting in a suffocation of fright, her hands plucking at each other's fingernails, which was about as profitable as anything else they could have found to do. Then, for the first time, Mem understood what the desert meant to those who had seen the last burrow drop and found the canteen full of dry air. End of chapter 11 Recording by Deanna Beauvais Chapter 12 of Souls for Sale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Souls for Sale by Rupert Hughes. Chapter 12. For a trance while, Mem made a perfect allegory of helplessness on a monument. She heard a voice laughing with a kind of querying exclamation. Hello? The word was as unimportant as could be, and it came from what she had just decreed the most useless thing on earth, a handsome, moving picture actor. His next word was no more brilliant. He touched his hat and said, Well, Mem had not yet even found that much to say, and he went on garrulously to the extent of, Here we are, eh? There was no denying this, and it was the first thing Mem's paralyzed brain could understand, so she nodded briskly. Tom Holby laughed at fate as in his pictures. He said, I've nearly died of thirst in the desert half a dozen times, and I've gone mad twice, but there was always a camera or two a few yards off, and a grub wagon just outside. 
and the heroine usually came galloping to the rescue and picked me up in time for the final clinch. I see the heroine, but the grub wagon's late. Well, what are we going to do? Well, I'm not going to act, anyway, as long as there's no camera on the job. Let's sit down and wait. For what? Oh, I guess the train will come back, or another one will come along, and we can flag it in plenty of time. Sit down, won't you? Mem was almost disappointed at having her epic turned into a commonplace. She resented the denial of a noble experience, now that his coolness reassured her. She hated him a little more than ever. He brushed off a ledge of rock with his hat in movie fashion and said, Sit down on this handsome red divan, won't you? I'm Mr. Holby, by the way. Yes, I know, she said, and feeling that she ought to announce herself, she stammered, My name is Steddon. Remember Steddon. I always will, he said. Oh, that's my first name. Remember is my first name. Oh, what a beautiful name, especially for such a, such a, hmm, yes he caught from her eyes that where she came from a compliment from a stranger was an insult do sit down he begged at least so that i can i'm all out of training and i'm dog tired she sat down and he dropped down by her there was so much room elsewhere that this struck her as rather presumptuous but she could hardly resent it since it was not her desert there was a long silence then he mused aloud remember eh great robina would have preferred that to the one she chose do you know robina i've seen her on the screen on the train oh then you haven't seen her that isn't the real robina that walks about that's just a poor plain frightened anxious little thing a cinderella who only begins to live when she puts on her glass slippers she has to be so infernally noble all day long that you can hardly blame her for resting her overworked virtues when she's off the lot. I used to be a pretty decent fellow, too, before I began to be a hero by trade. But now, gosh, how I love my faults. When there's no camera on me, I'm a mighty mean man. Really? Oh, I'm a fiend. I'm thinking of playing villains for a while so that I can be respectable at my own expense outside the factory. But I'm so mussed up between my professional emotions and my personal ones that it's hard to keep from acting on and off. Now look at this situation. If the camera gang were here, I'd know just what to do. I'd be Sir Walter Raleigh in a Stetson and Chaps. But since there's just us two here, and I have you in my power, or you have me in your power, I don't know just how to act. It depends on you. Are you a heroine or an adventuress? I don't understand you. Are you an ingenue or a vamp? I don't speak French. Then you must be an ingenue, he said. In that case, I suppose I really ought to play the villain, and— But here comes the train— doggone it just as we were working up a real little plot i hope i haven't compromised you if you're afraid i have i'll have to go back and hide till the next train comes along or you can for i imagine it's robina that reversed the engine she probably missed me and suspected that i was out here with a prettier girl than she is pardon me shall i go hide oh no no i couldn't think of it nobody knows me it can't make any difference what they say about me. Gosh, what an enviable position. Stick to your luck, Miss Steddon. May I help you down? End of chapter 12. Recording by Deanna Beauvais. Chapter 13 of Souls for Sale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Souls for Sale by Rupert Hughes. Chapter 13 That was a chapter in Mem's life. Holby had guessed right. Robina had looked for him, not found him, and had set the whole train in an uproar. She bore down on the helpless conductor, 
and while he protested against the sacrilege of stopping and reversing the limited when it was already late she pulled the rope herself she knew the signals having played in a railroad serial and she soon had the train backing at full speed she had half suspected that tom holby had a companion in the desert and when she looked out and saw him with the pretty chit whose magazine he had picked up she was tempted to give the signal to go ahead again she preferred to give poor holby her opinion of him mem crept back to her place shivering with her first experience of stardom and its conspicuousness viva made a great ado over her and had to hear all about it she sighed over the tameness of the incident as mem described it but then that was what was to be expected dearie us movie people get so much excitement on the scene that we're all wore out when anything happens with no director around to tell us what to do mem escaped and took up in haste her daily bulletin for home consumption mr woodville grew more vivid in her letter and his resemblance to tom holby was amazing she even put in a little bit of her adventure and told how mr woodville with marvelous heroism saved her from a rattlesnake that charged at her with fangs bristling and rattles in full play she confessed that she had never met such a man and that she really owed her life to him she thought that this would lead up excellently to the proposal he was to make in the next day or two she gave this letter to the porter who dropped it off at the next stop the train made up so much of its lost time that it was only two hours late when it drew into tucson mem was bewildered when she found that tom holby was getting off there too and so was rubina but they were only stretching their legs holby paused to say good-bye to mem just as she was tipping her porter a quarter for two days inattention she did not see the porter's face it was hardly as black as robina's when she was compelled to wait while tom made his adieu he left mem in a whirl but her faculties went round in the mad panic of a pinwheel when a strange sombre person spoke to her in a parsony voice miss steddon yes i am dr galbraith pastor of the first church here your father telegraphed me to meet you at the train and look after you do you know papa no but he found my name in the yearbook and i shall be only too glad to serve a brother in the lord i have found a nice boarding-house for you and my wife and i will look after you as best we can mem was struck violently with the thought but what becomes of mr woodville now she followed dr galbraith as if she were the prisoner of his untimely kindliness as indeed she was End of chapter thirteen recording by diana beauvais Chapter fourteen of Souls for Sale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Souls for Sale by Rupert Hughes. Chapter fourteen. A disastrous, perhaps a ruinous blow had been dealt the girl, and by the last hand she could have foreseen it from, and with the kindliest motive. It was all Ben Franklin's fault. The French praised him because he ripped the lightning from the sky and the scepter from the tyrant, but he placed the lightning as a scepter in the hand of everybody and made everybody the tyrant. And now no one can travel so fast that he cannot be overtaken and prevented by a telegraphic or telephonic message. The swiftest airship is a snail. Mem had flown by express for two days and two nights and left her father at home, yet here he was in the proxy of a telegram waiting for her at the station smiling benignly and throwing the complex machinery of her plan into complete disorder dr steddon had never for a moment suspected that his daughter was fleeing to the west to keep from breaking his heart the dear old soul fretted over the loneliness she must face and the dangers of inexperience she had hardly vanished in her train when he had a sudden inspiration he did not know a soul in tucson but there must be a church of his denomination there and a pastor to that church the yearbook contained a list of all the clergymen and it was easy to find the name of the incumbent of the tucson pulpit so he shot off a long telegram describing his daughter and pleading that she be met 
he chuckled over his foresight and called himself a stupid old dolt for not thinking of it before and his wife praised him and slept easier she knew mem's plan to become mrs woodville but she had not imagination enough to foresee the effect of this new embarrassment mem had anticipated almost every other surprise but this the main charm of tucson was to be her anonymity there when she heard her name called and by a clergyman of all people the gentle providence of her father landed like a bombshell tucson rocked under her feet and her plot fell to pieces in her hand she would have to be under the eye of dr galbraith who was already promising not to let her out of his pastoral care and warning her that his wife was waiting inside the station in her desperation she caught sight of tom holby who had walked briskly to the head of the train and was striding back to his car a frantic whim led mem to say very distinctly as she passed him good night mr woodville holby had already lifted his hat and made her a gift of one of his high-priced smiles before he heard what she called him he stopped short with his hat aloft as if in a still picture he could hardly believe his ears he was so used to being recognized by total strangers that it stunned him to be called out of his name by this girl with whom he had been briefly cast away in the desert but he recovered his native modesty laughed to himself this is fame and went on the reverend dr galbraith had paused for a backward glance but mem urged him along saying that's an old friend i met on the train and now she felt that she had established the existence of her mr woodville she was already unconsciously planting characters oh said dr galbraith his face looked familiar but i guess it wasn't the reason it looked familiar was that lithographs of it were pasted up all over tucson holby was to appear there in a picture if dr galbraith had been more acutely observant or had had a keener memory for faces he would have caught mem in a tangle of lies but he was thinking of other things mem hated mrs galbraith with enthusiasm until she met her and then she turned out to be not at all the preacher's wife as mem understood the species but a joyous western woman raised on a ranch and of a loud and hilarious cordiality still western hospitality is the most despotic in the world and sometimes takes the form of lassoing and hog-tying its victim mrs galbraith embraced mem and cried isn't she pretty she was distressed and ashamed because she could not take mem into her own little home which was spilling over with children mem blanched to think what would have happened to her plan if she had been incarcerated in a parson's household the boarding-house the galbraiths had selected for her was all too near them as it was they commended her to the care of the landlady and left her and the landlady drove mem almost to insult by trying to mother the poor lonely thing mem was so beset by human kindness that she was about ready to murder her next benefactor she longed for a bit of refreshing selfishness and indifference her room had been occupied by various predecessors who left various traces of themselves one left cigarette burns on the edges of all the tables in the mantel but somebody had left a few novels they were frightfully tempting there was an electric light over the head of the bed a very marvelous affair a twist of the key turned it on and one could lie and read till sleep drew near then merely reach up and switch on the blessed dark with a snap of the key after a hot bath and a vigorous scrubbing of her hair mem yielded to temptation and enjoyed all the pleasant anguish of a major sin when she lay outstretched in her nightgown with her hair spread out on her upright pillow and a romance on the desk of her knees cleopatra could hardly have felt so luxurious on a golden divan covered with silk and fanned by slaves as mem felt in that boarding-house bed cleopatra had perhaps novels enough to read since the egyptians were ardent story-tellers but she could not have tasted the sweets of stolen fruit or had her delight heightened by a struggle with an overtrained conscience the novel that held mem spellbound was thomas hardy's two on a tower that epic of two souls against a background of stars against that starless hole in the sky which astronomers believed in when hardy wrote the book 
this parson's daughter began her fictional education at the top she lost many of the signals by which discreet authors indicate to sophisticated readers that things not to be mentioned are going on but as she read and read growing wider and wider awake and panting as if her body were running as swiftly as her mind it gradually dawned on her what had happened to the heroine of the story the haughty lady who lingered too long on the lonely tower with the young astronomer for companion and only the stars for duennas at a most unrespectable distance when the astronomer sailed for australia in ignorance of the plight of the lady mem's heart jumped almost out of her mouth for she realized the similarity of her problem to that of the heroine her own lover had sailed away to a farther port than the antipodes and even more irrevocably she raced through the succeeding pages to see how the heroine would solve her doubly harrowing riddle of having yielded to a plebeian and of paying the most plebeian penalty when she found that mr hardy's heroine who had been vainly besought in love by an old bishop simply wheedled him into a renewal of his proposal and married him in haste mem gave up she could get no help from the book no bishop was courting her even if she had been willing to dupe a trusting lover she had none to dupe the next morning when mrs galbraith called to take her for a ride mem was looking more jaded than the evening before the parson's wife advised her to get out into the desert as soon as possible and told her for her encouragement how her own husband had hardly lived through the long journey west and had been laid down like a sack of bones on the sands then the desert magic had begun and now he was hale and vociferous and his doctors all dead so strange a thing is water a little too little and the body shrivels away from the soul a little too much and the body coughs the soul away but mem was not cheered with promises of life there was too much life in her and she could not manage her future she could not dream of the sacrilege of suicide but she would have been glad to be told that she would pine away swiftly and beautifully mrs galbraith chattering incessantly and as braggart as a guide drove about the city spread level in a circus ring of gray granite mountains everything far western was picturesque to the midwestern girl the sorriest and tamest mexicans were swart bandits of dark capabilities the santa rita hotel in its spanish architecture was something out of the alhambra the old mission dating back to sixteen eighty seven was an astonishment to her the oldest building at home in calverly was proud of its eighteen eighty seven the mountain devoted to the botanical laboratory was a cubist landscape a vegetable zoo she could not understand the science that was taking lessons humbly from the cactus learning how to live on next to nothing a year and teaching mankind how to turn the bleakest desert into a paradise that was just what she might do with her own life but she had no heart for it and she did not want to look like a cactus on the way back to her boarding house she noted many of tom holby's portraits on the billboards he was not the star of the picture robina teal was the star yet in one gaudy poster she cowered helpless and wide-eyed while holby was shown fighting with a human gorilla she was a dance-hall girl in the yukon it seemed kept miraculously pure like a medieval saint amid temptations and devils and holby was an argonaut who believed her innocent because he was himself innocent mem felt a longing to see this heroic picture but mrs galbraith would not leave her for a moment and the night was prayer meeting night mem attended the evening devotions there was nothing strange to her in the drowsy cozy atmosphere the sparse company singing hymns and bowing in prayer and finding a mystical comfort in the thought of sins forgiven and an eternal home beyond the grave dr and mrs galbraith took her back to her lodgings and left her they had no objection to moving pictures and attended them often but mem did not know this and she felt like a thief when her worser self compelled her better self to a dark dishonesty both selves went to the movies if the cinema store had been an opium den mem could not have sneaked more guiltily into it she was so ignorant of the conventions that when she put down her money and a ticket sprang up at her out of a slot and her change came tobogganing down a little chute she jumped 
and had to be told what to do. When she had found a seat in the dark hall, she was so illiterate in the staples of fiction that she tingled with excitement over hackneyed situations that left many a sophisticated child yawning and gave never a pause to the swaying jaws of the gum-grinding crowd. There were both novelty and conviction for her in the pseudo-Alaskan snow scenes, the blood-curdling escapes from death at the hands of desperadoes, or the fangs of wolves, the blizzards that snarled the sledge-dogs into tangles of hopeless misery and confronted the wayfarers with hideous death. Most of the audience knew the actors and actresses in the picture by reputation, had seen them in other pictures, and read more or less fabulous stories of their personal lives. The familiar situations, rehashed and warmed over, had the charm of old fairy stories, remodeled again and again by fatigued parents for insatiable youngsters. But Mem was experienced in agitation, such as she had not known since her mother told her about Little Red Riding Hood and growled like a wolf, showing long white teeth. One thing impressed Mem amazingly. She had just seen a handful of sleepy people at the once-a-week prayer meeting. Here she saw a packed house, the fifth packed house that day, and it had been so every day of the week. It was inherent in certain natures to be solemnly convinced that whatever draws crowds should be stopped. Whatever a great many people want to see or do must be put out of their reach. The principle is simple and direct. The public is a naughty child that cannot be trusted a moment. The moralist is nurse and must take away from it everything it reaches for and force it to take whatever is supposed to be good for it. Hissing and reproach are the portion of the man who resists the altruistic cruelty of zealots who would save his soul in spite of him. The zealots have always been even more cruel than the despots, for the czars have worked only for their own aggrandizement, but the zealots have the terrible fault that they labor meekly for the glory of their god. The late war of the nations was followed in America, as elsewhere, by a recrudescence of the eternal war between enforced morality and liberty. Having closed the saloons, the busy agents of vicarious virtue ran about closing movie picture houses on Sunday, clipping whole scenes out of films and subjecting them all to the whimsical approval of hired censors, assailing tobacco as a devil's weed and forbidding school teachers to smoke, even in their own homes. The cigarette, of which billions had been consumed by the triumphant soldiers, was actually banned in many states. In Kentucky, preachers and mobs of zealots demanded a law against teaching the infamous doctrine of evolution. In Illinois, a religious community forbade the teaching of the atheistic idiocy concerning the roundness of the earth and its revolutions about a distant sun. No lie was ever too ridiculous or unjust, no slander too vicious, no invasion of human rights too outrageous, for those who pretended that they were saving souls. And while the moralists were denouncing the moving pictures for their wickedness, the critics were despising them for their triteness. But Mem was neither moralist nor artist. She was a young woman watching an epic unfolded. She was seeing Tom Holby risk life and limb in the defense of beauty. She was seeing chivalry defying the cruel North and glorifying womanhood with knightly reverence and service. There was something Homeric in the plot, if one could forget its age. In Homer's work, a war was waged for a woman, and a woman walked through all the pages, the oxide, the laughter-loving goddesses, and their shining daughters, Helen and Iphigenia, Cressida and Andromache, Nausicaa and Penelope. In a later day, Virgil would show a hero who ran away from a languishing queen. But Homer's warriors fought for women, where Virgil began, I sing of arms and a man, Homer cried, sing, goddess. The Greek tragedies and comedies were about women, the medieval romances concerning them, the plays of Shakespeare, Racine, Moliere, and all the others devoted themselves to the woman problem. Even Dante celebrated an ideal townswoman, and the most poignant scene in his Inferno was the couple tragedy of Paolo and Francesca de Rimini. Sex had always been, as it must always be, the main theme of nine-tenths of fiction. To attempt to fetter its discussion was only to emphasize it by repression and change the symbols without altering the meaning. 
Mem's soul was young. It still inhabited the golden age of epopee. Simple, direct anxiety of sex for sex was new and wonderful to her. She was astounded at the courage of Tom Holby. It wrung her heart to see him plowing across white Saharas of snow, to see him challenge the barroom bully and beat him down and stand, torn, bleeding, and panting over him. It melted her soul to see his tenderness with the girl, the waif of fortune, whose indomitable purity had withstood years of life in a gambling hell. Being a woman, she was not quite convinced of Robina's super saintly innocences, but she had no doubt of Tom Holby as Galahad. And when he begged the soiled dove of the Klondike to honor him with marriage, Mem wondered if such a parfait gentil knight might not be waiting somewhere to rescue her from ignominy to bliss. When the picture was irised out upon Tom clenching Robina to his big chest, and the lights went up in the theater revealing an Arizona audience instead of an Alaskan solitude, she sighed and rose to face her lonely boarding house. End of chapter 14 Recording by Deanna Beauvais Chapter 15 of Souls for Sale This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Souls for Sale by Rupert Hughes Chapter 15 As Mem went slowly out with the straggling crowd, she was overwhelmed with a loneliness for life, for love, for someone to fight for her and uphold her in the deep waters, and then for a taste of the spiced wines of romance. She cried aloud in the silence of her room for Elwood Farnaby to come back and help her, to come back and claim his right to the splendor of existence. Grief sprang at her like a puma leaping down from a tree and tore her with claws of anguish, set fangs into her heart and shook it. In her room, as she took off her clothes with listless hands, she remembered her parents. She had not written to them for two days, and she had not carried Mr. Woodville forward. She sat down and began a letter. Everything she could think of to write involved some difficulty. She described her arrival at Tucson, her surprise at being met by Mr. and Mrs. Galbraith. She squandered reckless praise of her father for his ever-watchful protection and the comfort of feeling that he and his prayers were always on guard. She praised the Galbraiths for their thoughtful attention. Then she flung the pen down in disgust at the hypocrisy of her words and in revolt at the deep damnation of her whole plan. But rebel as she would, she must go on. She could not turn back now. One thing was certain. She must free herself from the Galbraiths. She must get out of Tucson. She must become Mrs. Woodville at once. Life would not wait for her. She was like a serial writer at whose shoulder a nagging editor stands insisting. She was like Dostoevsky, sick and confused, but unable to escape the necessity for filling the pages as fast as the ink could run, unable to recall any written page since it was printed almost before the next was written. And the title of her serial was also Crime and Punishment. Her crime was not ruthless murder, but reckless creation. She had not driven an old woman out of the world. She was reluctantly dragging a child into it, Yet society was as eager to find her out and disgrace her as the slayer. For a night and a day she paced the jail of her room and beat her brains against the iron bars of her problem. She could not break through. She could not worm her way through. She had no imagination, no inventiveness. She was just an ordinary girl who wanted to keep from hurting anybody and was finding it mighty difficult. She was tempted to send Dr. Bretherick a confession of failure and ask him to revise his continuity, but she was afraid to face the telegraph office with such a message and afraid to have it received at home. She dared not wait a week for a letter to come and go, and besides, her author was at such a distance that he could not understand the emergency. It is well for authors to keep in close touch with their plays and pictures in the making. She would probably have given up trying if a bit of luck had not befallen her. It was her habit of mind to credit it to a relenting providence. When things went wrong, 
she blamed herself when they took a turn for the better she blessed heaven she saw divine purpose in the very bungling of circumstance that kept her frantic with uncertainties on the fourth morning of her suspense mrs galbraith rode over in haste and distress to explain that her husband and she had to leave tucson for a few days to attend his father's funeral she promised to hasten back and beg mem steddon's forgiveness for deserting her mem was not quite sure that heaven had slain the elder mr galbraith just on purpose to help her out of her difficulty but she had a hard time to keep mrs galbraith from realizing how glad she was to be rid of her and her husband and as soon as mrs galbraith had gone she assailed her problem with a new ardor it was plainly a time for quick and decisive action she threw caution aside and forbore to regard the perils of inconsistency she wrote her father and mother a hasty letter to which the lilt of hope unconsciously contributed an atmosphere of bridal bliss my darling mamma and papa well you have lost your daughter not by fell disease but by fell in love you may say it is good riddance of bad rubbish but it hurt me to lose the noble name of steddon even for the beautiful title of woodville for that's what i've been and gone and done yes i'm married now i meant to break it to you gentler but it popped out so i'll leave it you see mr woodville john was so attentive and kind and considerate and respectful almost reverent you might say and he's so big and handsome and fine and noble and i was so small and lonely and so far away for so long that oh i just couldn't resist he stayed in tucson by the way it's pronounced tucson not tuxen for several days longer than he planned because he said he couldn't tear himself away from me but finally he had to leave for yuma and he said he couldn't live without poor little me i felt i couldn't live without him and why should i deny myself a protector and the highest glory of womanhood so he begged me to marry him and go to yuma i had about decided that tucson was not the right place for me anyway my cough is much better but not enough better to quit suit so i consented to marry john dr galbraith was awfully nice to me but he was called away by the unfortunate death of his father so he couldn't marry us so we were married by reverend mr smidgens here she wrote a name illegibly i haven't time to write you more for john is waiting and our train want i'll write a longer letter when i have the leisure i do hope you will be happy as i am about it you haven't lost a daughter but gained a son we leave at once for yuma so address all your letters to me as mrs john woodville general delivery yuma doesn't it sound grand though i don't know how long we shall be there as john is looking over some properties and doesn't know just where to settle yet i wish i could write you that he is terribly rich but while he hopes to be some day he is very poor just now but he is such a noble man and noble hearts are better than coronets as the poet saith and i shall try to be a help to him and some day we will pay back the money i have taken away from you poor darlings well i must close for the present don't stop loving me just because i have a husband but send us your blessings your loving loving daughter mem she was exhausted by the soul strain and she had to rest mind and body before she could undertake the task of writing the galbraiths a similar letter with the necessary changes it was only herself that she had to conquer since she did not have to look the recipients in the eye there was a kind of mischievous hilarity in the tone of her letter to the two kind clergyman and his over solicitous wife dear dr and mrs galbraith what you will think of me i can well imagine ingratitude is the least thing you will think of but i don't mean to be ungrateful you see it is this way on the train as i wrote mamma and papa i met an old friend he was terribly nice to me and i can understand why but he fell in love with me i can tell why i should fall in love with him though anyway we did so we expected to get married some day i wanted you to meet him but he was awfully busy and then you had to leave and then john had to go away and he said he couldn't live without me and i didn't want him 
to die so as he had to leave at once and he asked me to marry him right away i did so and now i am mrs john woodville if you please john has some properties to look over so we don't know just yet just where we will settle down so you will have to address me at general delivery yuma mrs john woodville i can never never thank you enough john says to thank you for him and hoping to see you soon again yours most gratefully remember steddon woodville mem laughed as she wrote and sealed this letter and was most grateful to the galbraiths for their absence but her landlady had to be dealt with face to face or she could not get her trunk away the landlady had expected to keep her guest for a long while and as usual worked both ends of the game when she had rented the room to mem she had explained that her prices were high because of the heavy demand when mem wanted to unrent the room the landlady complained that she would lose the use of it as the demand had died Mam had to pay for the balance of the month, and this took important dollars from her scant funds, but it gave her the strength to be curt when the landlady gasped at her instructions that any letters coming to Miss Remember Steddon should be readdressed to Mrs. John Woodville, General Delivery, Yuma, Arizona. The landlady's natural cackling over the unearthing of a romance was rigidly suppressed by Mem with as much calm as if she had been getting married every few days she was not so stolid when she set out upon her next errand she had to buy her wardrobe for the third act her widow's weeds she was going to save a lot of money by purchasing no bridal gear at all no veil no orange blossoms no trousseau for her honeymoon was to be as imaginary as her wedding but her mourning must be visible as she moved slowly down the tucson street to a dry goods store to buy a crepe dress and hat and veil she was dogged by a feeling of dreadful foreboding to pretend to get married was a pleasant little comedy but to put on false mourning was to carry the lie into the realm of grisly crime a superstitious dread assailed her that if she put on the inky suit of woe she would soon have a real reason for it some one dear to her would die and she would somehow be to blame for it she glanced over her shoulder timorously and felt a something at heel she felt as one might who lost in the wilderness and struggling with weakening steps to reach safety sees a famished wolf following at a little distance sees overhead an impatient buzzard making slow circles across his path but she must go on and cheat the wolf and the buzzard if she could she had such distaste for the business that she was not quite ready for the natural questions of the saleswoman who met her demand for a morning costume was it first or second morning half morning did she wish very deep morning and what size was it for herself or a relative for herself oh that was too bad and was it a father she had lost not a husband oh how sad was it very sudden an accident or an illness mem had not yet decided which it was to be and her guilty confusion might well have been taken for a confession of murder that was what she felt it must be the saleswoman's curiosity was quickened to torment by the evasiveness of mem's mumbled answers and when mem declined to have the things sent to her address and asked to have them put in a box for her to carry the saleswoman could not conceal her agitation mem caught her glance as she looked for a wedding ring on mem's bare hand this frightened mem and increased her despair of success but she had to hold herself in control long enough to march out as a dazed relict of blighted hope it was hard to manage this and carry a large bundle too but she reached the sidewalk somehow the saleswoman's suspicion had given her a hint she stopped at a jewelry store and bought herself a plain gold band she wore it out of the store explaining that she had lost her first ring when she returned to her boarding-house the landlady whose inquisitiveness was still simmering to a boil let her in as mem locked glances with her defiantly she saw the landlady's eyes go to her hand and widen with recognition of the wedding ring mem let the box of mourning fall to the floor if it had broken open the landlady gasped you ain't married already yes lord o mercy that's the quickest work i ever did see where's your husband minding his business his own business she regretted the unwarranted insolence instantly but 
it served to put the landlady on the defensive and taught men the value of bluff and the military rule when your position is weak leave it and attack the landlady fried in her own fat trying to figure out what sort of creature mem was but the next morning she was gone a few days later a letter came for miss steddon before readdressing it the landlady could not resist steaming it open it proved to be a message of love from the girl's father among many expressions of uneasiness for the poor child was a pleasant word for mr woodville also a pious hope that the splendid gentleman would be a real protection and comfort to the little wanderer thus one dupe dupes another and the fooled father fooled the landlady by confirming the lie mem had told her with all doubts as to the girl's honesty allayed the mistress of the boarding-house crossed out miss steddon wrote mrs john woodville general delivery yuma and glued the flap down again end of chapter fifteen recording by deanna beauvais chapter sixteen of souls for sale this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Souls for Sale by Rupert Hughes Chapter 16 The early morning train from Tucson would deposit Mem at Yuma in the mid-afternoon. The railroad was never far from the Mexican border, and the desert was stinging hot. Yet Mem suffered an inner chill, and her flesh crept clamily at what she had to do, for on that journey she was to get rid of her husband, he had been vague before but as she made ready to slaughter him he became fearsomely real she went through the experience of a bravo who had lightly accepted a commission to assassinate a stranger but on meeting him and coming to know him found him likable lovable and his destruction abominable the scenes the train swept her through were as damned as her deed a famine land of stunted growth or none john woodville sat beside her in the train he vanished as soon as she turned to look his way but when she gazed with unfocused lenses through the window at the blurred sand and sage his presence was almost palpable when she closed her scorched eyes she could almost feel him leaning against her shoulder his breath stirring the little curls at the nape of her neck he took in warm strong fingers her cold hand lying idle at her side in the dark of her shut eyes he put his arm about her shoulder and drew her to him and kissed her cheek whispering my wife he turned her head and pressed on her pale mouth so masterful a kiss that her lips reddened and quivered she tried to summon her dead lover to the defense of his rights in her possession but elwood was more unreal now more remote than the mirage of this conqueror she tried to fling him off by opening her eyes and re-establishing the other passengers in the crowded car but the somnolence of the burning morning dragged her back to the weird world of sleep as her eyes closed she caught sight of a cowboy racing the train on a plunging bronco and when she fell asleep she fell into the saddle of a pinto alongside john woodville's mustang and she rode with him across the sage-spotted sands toward the brown mountains and found there a cabin in a dark grove and it was their new home she was the mistress of it but he was the master of her a ruthless laughing husband who would not be denied but mocked her fears and made her his wife broke her to his will as he broke the wildly resisting bronco she ran pursued but overtaken and woke with a start spent and panting and stared at the drowsy passengers she was astounded and a little disappointed to find herself still on the same car his hot cheek against hers was only the sun-baked window-pane tinkling with the rain of the blown sand she fought off the swooning drowsiness that dragged her back to a siesta of fancy and devoted herself to the stern task of arranging a plausible death for her short-lived bridegroom fear of discovery was as acute in mem's heart as if she were planning genuine homicide some authors have wept over the slaughter of their creatures some have rejoiced in their murder as a fine art but mem was a beginner a bungler she was bound to make a bad job of it and she could not trust her imagination after an hour or two of deep study that only increased her sense of hopeless floundering she went to her luncheon in the dining car it was hard to play executioner on an empty stomach 
on her way back to her place she saw on an empty seat a newspaper the owner had plainly finished with it and tossed it aside he was not visible and she resolved that theft was a proper prelude to a greater atrocity so she snatched up the paper and carried it back to her place it was the los angeles times an enormous budget filled with the proud expression of the fastest growing city in the world a city tumultuous with prosperity at a time when nearly every other city and town was cowering under the aftermath of the world war mem found as is to be expected in any newspapers but those curious documents built to suit the ostriches who believe in concealing reference to crime and other departures from monotony many accounts of murders robberies accidents and other manifestations of human fallibility magnificent burglaries were properly chronicled nearly every day somebody seemed to loot a mail train or a bank messenger of the ransom of a dozen dukes highway robbery was bringing back the glorious days of dick turpin jonathan wilde and claude duval those who stood quietly behind their counters had drama brought to them on the tip of a pistol those who motored along quiet roads or city streets were hailed from other cars by fleeting highwaymen or highway women or they discovered with their searchlights somber gentlemen or ladies whose watchword was becoming a national greeting put them up it seemed as if one half the world had its hands in the air while the other half went through its pockets cash drawers suitcases or mail pouches los angeles as one of the busiest cities going naturally had its share of this industry furthermore its thronged streets were superior to every other city's in the number of people killed and maimed by the floods of automobiles mem thought of los angeles as the missionary thinks of benin somaliland milan or shanghai or some other center of crime though none of the foreign murder mills has ever approached the american grist in the times she discovered a number of suggestive deaths here was the story of a man who slipped into the swollen colorado river which was running one of its annual amocks here were a hundred people in colorado state swept out of their homes and drowned by a torrent here was a rich man whose neck was broken in an overturned car here were a score effaced in a collision between an autobus and an electric train here was a new yorker shot dead in his pajamas as he sat with a lapful of morning letters here was a man found buried in his own cellar here was a midwestern gentleman for whose murder his wife and his stepdaughter were being tried the allegation being that they had filled him with arsenic taken from flypaper here was a man who hired a hobo to play a practical joke on his wife and pretend to hold them up in their doorway then the amazing dramatist shot the hobo dead shot his wife dead and announced that he had taken part in a pistol duel with a highwayman the cynical police found a few flaws in his glib story and wrung a confession from him he was a very religious young man too and superior to all small vices and the jury at his first trial disagreed as to his guilt since he repudiated his confession a second jury found him guilty but he pleaded insanity and deferred the penalty altogether an original genius in crime mem envied him his ingenuity there were instances enough and too many of death's activities in the newspaper here was an aviator doing a moving picture stunt whose ship caught fire and brought him down burned to a crisp here was a man killed in his automobile by a big tree falling over him there was such an embarrassment of riches that mem could not select a single method of doing away with mr woodville she forgot him utterly for a while in a page devoted to the gossip of moving picture studios she saw that robina teal and tom holby had come back to hollywood from a dash to new york for local color and would soon be going out again on location wherever that was she saw that viva de artois and her husband had reopened their beautiful bungalow in edendale she saw that miriam yore had arrived and taken a palatial house for her stay maurice maeterlinck had come out on a special train many english men and women of fame were on their way and herds of authors who being american were unimportant domestic goods are always shoddy and imported elegant mem reverted to her plot she had her mourning all ready to put on 
but here was a new complication if she arrived in yuma as a widow she must don her mourning in the train she would have to retire to the narrow cell of the women's room and make the change there that was inconvenient but not impossible it was the only thing to do yet if she went in a maid and out a widow people might notice the change and wonder for she had been well observed by the other passengers a few of them had remarked that it was hot or asked her if it were not hot pretty hot what one woman had said mem had thought peevishly what a funny thing it was the way folks used pretty pretty hot meant hideous hot she knew that women were like cameras for snapshotting other women's clothes at a glance and remembering them like a photograph men didn't notice such things much yet men had noticed her two men particularly one of them a flashy impudent creature with hard exploring eyes that fairly nosed her like a pig's snout the other a lonely deer-eyed thing pleading for pity with a woman-hungry stare mem had a flash of unusual cynicism toward the moralities why is it that we feel so sorry for the loneliness of the timid man and so disgusted with the loneliness of the bold man the loneliness must hurt both of them about the same but she did not dwell on the thought humanity is never going to give the sympathy to the hyena that it wastes on the more destructive rabbit what settled mem's debate was the realization that if she donned her crape on the train it would cause a stir among the people in whose flying parlor she had sat for seven hours or so and some of them would doubtless be getting off at yuma she wondered if somebody would come up to her at the station as at tucson and announce himself as the deputy of her father she hoped not he could hardly have divined that she was bound for yuma yet she could not feel sure for all she knew the first person she met might be somebody from calverly another point decided her if she wrote to her father that she had left tucson as a wife and reached yuma as a widow it would be necessary to push her husband off the train or wreck the train or something and that would be hard to verify there were other reasons for giving herself a little longer experience of wedded bliss this marriage was for a purpose she grew frantic with indecision the train seemed to be exerting itself to fling her into yuma before she could make up her mind nothing was easier than to tell a lie but great heavens how difficult it was to foresee all the things that would happen to it as it went along accumulating complications like other works of art a lie must be all things to all men or be strong enough to endure their idiosyncrasies and their attacks dr bretherick had told her to hold her head up and run yet not to run he had thereupon shipped her west to a land of strangers yet she could neither break away from the ties at home nor break through the nets ahead of her she was running as fast as she could but she had leg irons on she had not left pursuit behind and the path ahead was all brambles and pitfalls the train went whooping into a low loosely built town as she oscillated from one plan to another a hoarse voice bawled you my you my end of chapter sixteen recording by diana beauvais chapter seventeen of souls for sale this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. souls for sale by rupert hughes chapter seventeen nobody stepped forward to call mem by name but she almost wished that somebody had for she was in a foreign world indeed the town had nothing of tucson's quality it was still a frontier post in the eternal battle with the savage desert nearly a century and a half ago spanish missionaries and soldiers had been massacred here by the yuma indians indians were all about the station now and they frightened the girl who knew of them only as demons of cruelty the heat was savage too there is a saying that only a sheet of paper stands between yuma and hell mem could have believed it as her thin soles winced at the oven lid platform and the sun bored through her hat and her sweaty hair into her very brain she was solicited to go to the hotel but she could hardly afford such splendor she inquired about a boarding-house the baggageman recommended one 
and she rode thither fearing to trust herself to wander about the sun-smitten streets they were torrid those streets but fascinating since everything was foreign to her experience the shabbiest adobe hut was picturesque to her because cooked mud was new to her the stick-in-the-mud houses made of the plastered willow poles were artistic somehow date palms and mesquite trees and fuzzy cottonwoods pepper trees and domesticated cacti made her cry out with delight but the indians were the main charm they gave the dusty dreary town a festival look they reminded mem of the days when circuses had come to calverly she had never been permitted to go to them and it had hurt her father's confidence in her when she showed a desire to see the free parades but now she was inside the circus part of the troupe she expected to see an old stagecoach swing into the street pursued by shooting apaches yuma was filled with indians an indian school was there and a reservation the indians had their own shops and farms they were tamed now and no longer matched torture and treachery with the soldiers and the pioneers they were subdued to agriculture and petty commerce their barbaric souls found expression only in raw flamboyant colors the squaws went down the street in cheap fabrics high in the neck and low in the hem they were mainly blue and white mother hubbards aided and abetted by capes of colors that massacred one another and tortured the beholder the hot wind flapped their clothes about them with a ruthless draughtsmanship that emphasized what it concealed there was no question as to the conformation of these squat stodgy figures the red fillets about their brows would have been more effective if the faces beneath had been more attractive or the lawless hair better kempt even the young squaws had little to commend them to admiration and the contrast between their gold-crowned teeth and their shoeless feet was not to their advantage the men were better looking and better carried they were mainly tall and lithe and haughty they had also a passion for color for bandanas and loud shirts they wore their hair longer than the squaws wore theirs tribal custom forbade them to braid it and it fell in long strands sometimes to their waists with no confinement except perhaps a piece of colored string mem could hardly believe her eyes when a long lean buck flew past on a bicycle his hair streaming out like a young girl's she passed one boarding house in whose front yard was a signboard boasting the stormlessness of the region free board and lodging every day in the year that the sun don't shine in such a persecuting heat as this mem thought the legend on the sign more of a threat than a promise when she reached the boarding house selected for her she rejoiced at the sight of shade but here lurked another landlady to be lied to mrs drissett greeted mem hospitably and asked what name please mem managed to check the name steddon coming up her throat and changed it hastily to mrs woodville your husband ain't with you er no he's coming along later and now her heart sank how could she kill off mr woodville here when he had not yet arrived how was she to arrive him you'll want a double room then said mrs drissett yes of course er yes and now she had to pay extra money for a ghost as she moved up to her allotted room the sad-eyed man she had noted on the train came up and asked for accommodations it was well that mem had not put on her mourning she would have been caught indeed she rested in her darkened room to escape the afternoon blaze but when she came down to supper she was placed next to a woman who frightened her worse than a tarantula by the petrifying remark small world ain't it miss woodville my husband's folks on his mother's side was woodville's what part of the country does your husband's family hail from mem choked sincerely on a bread crumb but prolonged the spasm while she tried to plot an answer to this perilous question she had never expected to be cross-examined on her husband's family or habitat and had never equipped him with either so she excused herself and left the table strangled in throat and mind she could not endure the jail of her room and stole out for a walk the desert twilight was turning the tin roof of the sky into a heavenly ceiling where invisible spirits were wielding brushes of divine splendor the town's one ambitious building the courthouse broke the horizon with a cupola that was a palette of reflected pigments she wandered down along the swollen colorado a stream of blood in the sunset 
an old stern-wheeled steamer fought its way up from the california gulf noisily and ominously like some primeval water beast returning to its lair in the grand canyon the mountains in the distance were piled up in mournful dunes against a sea of gleaming light but she was afraid of the indians slipping noiselessly about on innocent errands she could not believe that they were not planning a massacre this was the old apache country yet the indians and the mexicans whose children played about as naked as the other pigs were not dangerous to her they made little trouble over an unauthorized child or two she hurried back to the main street where the indians were mere loafers and small-town sports smoking cigarettes and ogling the giggling girls in the evening mood of other small towns she was faint with hunger and entered a drug store for refreshment she bought herself a nut sundae as at calverley on either side of her was an indian brave treating an indian girl to the same pale face medicine the braves wore headdresses of gaudy color almost as gaudy as the shirts on the young white bow who were taking their sweethearts to the movies mem followed the crowd and paid two bits to sit with the aristocrats while the greasers the hopis and navajos went in at the other door for ten cents the indians had learned to spoon in the dim light and they laughed at the low comedy and sighed at the low pathos they could read the first universal language and romance was warming their dreary lives mem smiled to think of her father's wrath at the movies as the weapons of satan for she could not but realize how much safer from temptation these spectators were here watching the unfolding of almost any imaginable fictions than they would be wandering in stealthy couples along the gloomy river banks or left to the mercy of their own devices in the dark of their wretched homes she blushed suddenly with the thought that if she and elwood had spent that sunday evening in a moving picture house instead of mooning on the home porch she might have escaped this shameful exile she went back to her boarding-house relieved a little from the monomania of her own problems by watching the weaving and unweaving of pictured problems when she reached her new home she found the yard full of beds and most of the beds occupied by a sprawling populace with hardly so much as a sheet to mask its nightwear she stole through the camp to her own room and found it bedless she stood at her door bewildered the woman who had frightened her away from her dinner by her genealogical interest in the woodville tribe appeared ghostlike in nightgown and a togged sheet and seeing her perplexity explained the custom of the country you'll suffocate if you try to sleep in your own room honey get into your nightgown and bring your bedclothes down with you like i'm doin your bed is in the yard next to mine you'll sleep good and feel right refreshed in the mornin there was nothing for mem to do but follow suit to one who had never seen a bathing beach or gone in bathing undress among a crowd the ordeal was terrifying she dreaded it as an early christian martyr might have recoiled when the romans tore off her clothes and thrust her into the arena as those three quaker women must have shuddered when the good puritans of boston stripped them to the waist tied them to the tail of a cart and lashed their bare backs through the snowy streets of eleven towns for their soul sakes just as the good puritans of nineteen twenty lashed the bare reputations of the moving picture producers for the good of the community fortunately for mem's tranquillity her woodvillian relative by marriage was already asleep and a snore when she slipped wraith-like out into the yard and after a pause at the brink ran to her bed and crawled under a tent of mosquito netting and nothing else she lay staring up at familiar stars in a most unfamiliar world and shame and loneliness smothered her as she smothered her sobs in her pillow lest she wake the neighbors the hot breath from her own lungs was cooler than the night breeze and the bed beneath her was so warm that modesty battled almost vainly with nature to keep as much as a sheet over her she wondered why she had come to this gehenna where she did not purge herself of sin but committed more and more sin she wondered why anybody was here at all having learned to distrust her own wild capabilities for passionate impulse she wondered how long she would endure the penance here she lay tossing like a frying fish in a skillet trying to atone for a moment's rapture with a lifetime of woe while other women had glorious times and fame and luxury and did what they pleased 
and were fawned upon by the whole world. That Miriam Yore, she got ten thousand a week in spite of the fact that people said she had had two children outside the law. Was she popular in spite of that fact or because of it? In such insane brooding, Mem fell asleep at length. She fell asleep so late that she slept on far past the daybreak, and when the sun's rays finally flailed her eyelids open, she sat up with a start, thinking that someone had moved the house out from under and over her. Her darting eyes met the bleary gaze of the sad-eyed man lolling a few beds away. He smiled and drolled. Good morning. This was really quite too incredible. She did not answer him, but hid under the sheet until she was sure that he had scrambled out and, wrapping the drapery of his couch about him, had marched into the house. Then she gathered up her bedclothes and ran. She bathed, standing up by a washbowl on a washstand, and the cold water was already so warm, her flesh already so tingling with the early heat, that she dreaded to get into clothes. And, of course, she was suffering nausea every morning. Her body was as sick of the complexities of life as her mind. The relentless machineries within herself seemed as bent upon her punishment as the relentless machineries of human society without. Her soul stood aghast between the persecutions of the devil inside her and the deep sea of the people outside. She grew so distraught with trying to justify the peculiar ways of God to man, and especially to woman, that she felt afraid of her own rebellious soul. She feared her room and herself and ran down to breakfast. She was glad to see that the old woman who asked about the wood bills was not in her place, but she came in later, and with the kindliest spirit took up the question again. I was asking you about the wood bills when you had a choking fit last evening, and you didn't get to tell me about your husband. I'm a rodman myself, or was till I married Mr. Sloat. But his mother was a Woodville, like I told you, and finer folks never was. It would be funny if you and me was related, kind of, that way, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? Mem echoed, and like Echo, contributed nothing helpful to the conversation. Just where did your husband come from? I don't know. You don't know? No. But he must have come from somewhere. No, he didn't. That is, he was an orphan. But even orphans have folks. What part of the country was he born in? He doesn't remember. Land alive, child. Are you trying to have fun with me? You're not ashamed of the Woodvilles, are you? Naturally, anyone would have said no, oh no. So Mem, being in an unnatural frenzy, answered, Yes. This stumped Mrs. Sloat completely. It was her turn to choke. When she regained the vocal use of her windpipe, she began again, half to herself. So, you're ashamed of the Woodvilles, eh? Well, well. Who'd have thought it? Still, of course, there's a black sheep in all families. Where do you say your husband? Oh, he was an orphan, wasn't he? I'd like to talk to him when he gets here. You're expecting him, I believe you said. Did I? Well, didn't you? Maybe I'm liable to say anything when it's so hot. Say, you'd better go lay down. You're talking awful funny. Go out and sit on the corner of the porch. There's usually a breeze there if there's any anywheres. Thanks, I will. Mem had a keen desire to go to her room and laugh uproariously. She had found a madwoman's glee in bewildering old Mrs. Sloat with her evasive answers but in her room her insane self would be waiting to nag her with more baffling questions than Mrs. Sloat's. So she went to the porch and sat in the rocker at the corner and found a little nepenthe in watching the tremulous beauty of a pepper tree, all soft foliage and shadow. It seemed to be draped in old shawls with embroideries of deep red. By and by the sad-eyed man came clumping along the porch and took a chair. He was evidently pining for someone to talk to, but he nearly lost his audience on the first question. "'Excuse me, ma'am, but landlady says your name is Woodville, that right?' Mem nodded, and her heart began to beat her side so hard that she wondered if she could not see it leap under her light waist. She made ready to escape again, but he allayed her panic. "'Reason I asked was, I knowed a man of that name. No, daggone it, his name was Woodward.' That's right, his name was Woodward, or no, it was, 
Well, anyways, it probably wasn't his real name at that. I called him Woody, or Woodhead. He sat chuckling to himself over his reminiscences. Woody was a nice enough feller. Not much sense, but meant all right, I reckon. Many's the mountain him and I prospected. The chocolates, superstitions, all of em round these parts. See that big peak up there all by itself like Egyptian obelisk? That's old Pikachu. Used to be so rich in gold that a miner who didn't wash three hundred dollars of gold a day was fired for a no count. Now it's all abandoned. Towns and camps. There's gold there yet, but it's sure hell to find. Well, this Woodville, or whatever it was, seems like him and I went over every inch of this country with a pick and a spyglass. We liked to die a dozen times. Water give out. Once we got to a water hole so deep down our rope wouldn't just quite reach it, and we couldn't climb down. There was a big rattlesnake there at that. We was both black in the mouth. One of our burrows had fell off a ledge and died, and the other and shook off his pack and bolted, and we was too weak to chase him. Then Woody went plumb crazy. He throwed away his blanket and his clothes and took off his boots and flung em down the water hole at the snake and would have jumped after him only i held on to him i was some feeble myself but i got him roped and tied then he certainly gave me and god about the best cussin out either of us ever got and we both been swore at considerable well my brain begun to dry up and go crazy too I was starting to throw away my things when a prospector found us. He had water and a string of burrows, and he brought us in. After that, I told Woody I was going to keep away from the desert. He laughed himself sick and says he, Bodlin, my name's Bodlin. Bodlin, I'll bet you fifty dollars you come back before the year's out. I took him up, and I lost and won. Woody went in again and stayed. He stayed, Mem mumbled. You mean he's still there? He sure is, Miss Woodville. When we say a feller stayed in the desert, we mean he ain't never coming back at all. There was a piece in the Tucson paper about Woody, poor old skate. He went back once too often. Did he die of thirst? Not him. Not this time. That old desert has more ways than one of eating you up. It was Woody's luck, after dying of thirst a hundred times, to get drowned. Yes, um, the desert is fuller of jokes than anybody you know. Take them Rajas, for instance. When you'd give your soul for a spoonful of wet scum, you see a lake and a river and a waterfall playing away just ahead of you. It ain't there, and you know it. And yet you know it is, and you just can't help pushing on to see if it ain't there this time. But Woody... He made his camp in a dry arroyo bed, and during the night they was a cloudburst, and he must have been hit by a regular river before he knowed what struck him. They found him in a pile of brush the river had gathered up. When they found him, it was as dry as ever, and his canteen was empty. And now I'm forty dollars ahead, for I can't pay him his bet. I was bragging about how smart I was to get out and stay out, but here I am going in again as soon as I can get a couple of burrows and a few things. Once the desert gets you, it's got you. It's like some of these women you hate and can't get rid of. They don't love you, and they rob you and torture you, and you know they'll kill you some day, but you just can't quit them for keeps. Mem thought a long time before she spoke. Then she said, Do women ever go into the desert, Mr. Bodlin? sometimes not often sometimes a wild look came into her eyes and she nodded unwittingly the vassal of the desert said was you thinking of going in she smiled curiously and even he who knew so little of women read a yes in her smile with your husband he mumbled she smiled again he's a mighty lucky man a mighty lucky man the desert is a tough place on a pretty little lady It'll lose you that white skin and them soft hands, but it would be a grand thing for a man to have a woman to talk to and to take care of, to share a canteen with, and to find gold for. Or, if you didn't find gold, you'd have her, under the stars and in the cool of some of them caves, and these canyons up there where you find palm trees growing, like you was back in the Garden of Eden. 
he was fairly writhing with his vision of such a pilgrimage he sighed like a furnace your husband's sure one lucky man tell you what miss woodville if you ever get tired of him just lee me know and i'll push him off a cliff for you or punch a hole in his canteen anyways i'll be on the watch for you i can't give you no address we don't get mail very regular on the desert but everybody knows bodlin gosh all hemlock but your husband's sure one lucky man he got up and walked away as if to escape the temptation to covet his neighbor's wife the girl was so beautiful in his eyes that he would have been ready to commit murder to get her if that would fetch her his visions of her companionship were too fiercely vivid to be born in her demure presence but it was mem who was going to do the murdering she had found the way to be rid of her husband for the satisfaction of her people now if she could only find a way to be rid of herself and that way came to her before the long day had burned itself away she had hidden from the sun in her room the drawn curtains kept out the light and the sun-steeped wind but the still air inside the room seemed to have thorns it stung her flesh with nettles where she lay supine on her bed in as little garb as her schooled modesty would permit she heard two waitresses talking in the dining-room below as they set the tables for supper who was that letter you got from some feller nah it was from a lady up to palm springs asking me was i coming back up there this season are you nah too quiet for me you may ain't no merry-go-round but palm springs my god it's just a little spot of shatter in the desert nice and cool in the season but what does cool get you if you're cut off from all the world would you believe it there ain't even a moving picture there when i want to hide from the world i'll crawl into palm springs but not before this lady offer you a job yes she's on her knees to me mrs randall's her name is husband's got a ranch nice little hotel there too with jobs going beggin but not for me thank you i'm through with them retreats i'm trying to work my way to a real city give me folks and plenty of em how'd you like to go there and take my job at randall's the other voice moaned me not much i run away from home to get love and excitement and look where i landed my god but i wished i was back in wichita the voices died in a clatter of plates and knives and forks there was melancholy and thwarted ambition everywhere evidently mem had never heard of palm springs but she was looking for just such a place and a ranch she had always wanted to see a ranch the heat here was like a madness upon her but most of all she abhorred this eternal facing of questions mrs sloat was a nuisance a menace writing letters home and getting letters from home had become an intolerable burden on her soul she wanted to get away from everybody that had ever known her she wanted to find some deep dark cave she was the prey already of the instinct that dr bretherick had spoken of the instinct to crawl away and hide during the long ugly phase ahead of her and the fearful climax at the end of it there was a blaze of mutiny in her heart against the whole business of her life she understood why bodlin's overloaded overdriven burrow had kicked off its pack and bolted this pack of lies that she was carrying and adding to it every step was bound to crush her sooner or later why be a burrow for other people's burdens it would profit her none what reward could she hope for heat and fatigue whipped her into hysteria her soul vomited up all the precepts it had been fed upon she found energy enough for one last desperate letter home then she would declare her soul bankrupt and face the world free of responsibilities to the past darling mamma and papa by now you have probably ceased to be surprised at anything i do you'll think i've gone clean crazy and i guess i have but as long as i'm getting better and happier every day you won't mind i've been too busy to write you all about john as i promised he is out here scouting for a famous mine and is going prospecting for it right away it is a famous lost mine that got abandoned on account of some old litigation and was nearly forgotten so he's on the hunt for it and we're going out to hunt for it together it means losing ourselves in the desert and the mountains for a long while there's no telling how long but it will be terribly romantic and fine for my health 
and when next you hear from me i may be so rich i'll send you a solid gold sewing machine mamma and papa a solid gold pulpit there's no mail delivery where we're going and no way of reaching us but don't worry if anything happens i'll let you know if you don't hear from me for a long while you'll know everything's all right you can send your letters to me here and i'll find them when i get back don't send me any more money so good-bye and blessings on your darling heads john sends his love your loving 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 mem as she finished the letter she thought grimly of what mr bodlin had said she was not quite sure just what was going to happen to mr woodville in her morbid humor and her resentment at her own allotted torture she had a leaning toward the most gruesome fates for her husband a death from thirst or a rattlesnake's fangs or a fall down a precipice one thing was sure john woodville was going into the desert to stay she envied him the calm certainty of his fate the main solace to her pride in her self-obliteration was the thought that she was going to cease to be a drain on the flat purse of her poor father he and her mother had gone through life like two sad desert burrows carrying burdens they should no longer carry hers villager though she was and used to housework she had been brought up in a certain pride to be a chambermaid or a waitress was a dismal come-down but she must accept it what right had she to pride she would go to palm springs and toil humbly as long as she could and save her wages and pretend to be a widow she would go there in mourning and bury her heart in sackcloth and ashes and perhaps in that thief's crucifixion to which she was carrying her own increasingly heavy cross she would die unknown and be lost to the too many miseries of this world and so she fared into the desert to stay she went there to find obscurity and concealment to embrace poverty and humility but everything went by contraries and from that oasis she was to be caught up into a fiery chariot for all the world to behold as it rolled her round and round the globe on an amazing destiny everything that had tortured her and was yet to torture her was a schooling end of chapter 17 recording by diana beauvais chapter 18 of souls for sale this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org souls for sale by rupert hughes chapter 18 that a lie never prospers is a lie that always prospers it is discouraging for lovers of the truth to review the innumerable and eternal untruths that are told for the truth's sake mem broke away from yuma with an unusual economy of falsehood her trunk was the only difficulty it had followed her from tucson to her boarding-house in yuma but she could not check it further without giving her destination after a vast amount of thought mem decided to ask her landlady to hold her trunk for her until she returned for it she put into it everything that she could spare she was going to travel light and forage on the country there was an old shed in the back yard and the dry air would serve as a perfect preservative for her belongings in case she ever came back for them she told the landlady the same story she embodied in her farewell letter home and asked her to hold any mail that might come then she slipped away while mrs slope was not looking she went to the station with her old suitcase and took the train into the imperial valley to her it was as pathless and mapless and as filled with strange beasts as to the first prospectors only she was not looking for gold or adventure she was looking for peace and like the usual pioneer she was sure to find almost everything but what she hunted in her ignorance mem bought her ticket to palm springs station instead of to whitewater where an auto bus would have met her she was a little more accustomed now to the desert but she took no interest in the miracles that had tamed the wastes of sand and the salton sea and put the idle sterile welter to work upon a vast garden had built enormous dams to impound the stray water and endless channels to carry it where it was needed when it was needed 
Mem was deposited at the lonely station, and fear smothered her as she watched the train vanish into the glare. But a rancher, almost as shy as she, offered her the hospitality of his wagon. He was rough, unshaven, and unkempt, the very picture of a stage robber. Still, she preferred him to the solitude, and he turned out to be almost as silent. He was too timid to ask her questions, and she was grateful to him for that. He said that he was going past the Randalls ranch anyhow, and would leave her there, and he said nothing more. When the ranchman had helped her into his wagon, he unhitched the horses and made a dash for the seat. The horses began the journey with a take-off from the ground that hinted at a voyage through the air rather than along the road. Then they settled down to their ordinary gait. Mem would have called it a runaway, but the driver did not even haul in on the lines. After a time, Mem saw ahead of her a shimmering lake and trees and a waterfall. That's Palm Springs, I suppose, she said. No, ma'am, that's a mirage. Imaginary mirage. There's nothing there at all. No, ma'am. And now Mem had learned that her own eyes could lie to her with convincing vividness. She wondered if they deceived her when they showed her sagebrush and crippled trees bent in rheumatic agonies. She thought she saw Lilliputian alligators scuttering here and there. They were Chuck Wallas, but she did not dare ask about them. Suddenly, as the road led them within eyeshot of two vast hills of sand unspotted with vegetation, she saw what she was sure was pure mirage, a scene that must have come from her memory of a picture in an old volume of Bible stories. She would almost have sworn that she looked into the desert of Araby, for she seemed to see a train of camels in trappings and perched upon their billowy humps men in the garb of bedouins she rubbed her eyes and scolded them but they persisted in their story having been so perfectly deceived by the equally visible lake and cascade that were not she did not mention the camels to her host who gave no sign of wonder then the horses seemed to suffer from the same delusion for they grew panicky and began to buck and back and leave the road the driver yelled at them and tried to force them ahead but as they drew near the camels they went into hysterics they refused to obey yells or reins or the whiplash or even each other's impulses but at length their insanities coincided they slewed in the same direction carried the wagon into the side ditch and overturned it mem found herself gently spilled in the soft sand so little injured that her only thought was for pulling down her skirts she lay still reclining not in pain but in wonderment as the wagon slid on its side the driver stumbling along and still clinging to the lines as if he tried to hold giant falcons in leash the caravan grew restive too and mem was consumed with perplexity as she saw one of the animals forced to its knees not far from her the sheikh or whatever he was, tumbled from the saddle and ran to her. A brown face looked out from the hood, and from the scarlet lips surrounded by a short beard came a voice startlingly un-Arabic. Miss Steddon! Miss Remember Steddon! She was so dazed that she could only stare into the mysterious face doubly dark against the blinding sun. The Arab smiled and laughed. You don't know me? don't you recall mr woodville this frightened her and confused her unbearably who are you she gasped as a matter of fact i'm only mr holby tom holby a common movie actor out on location but the last time you saw me you called me mr woodville oh did i i was thinking of my husband your husband you were miss steddon a week or two ago yes but oh i see you have taken the fatal step since then is that mr woodville playing tag with those dancing demons out there oh no he's dead dead already and you only married a few days why what on earth she dropped her head she could not face the rush of sympathetic horror in those famous eyes she could not think in the flailing sunbeams pounding her aching head holby read this as grief and sighed you don't want to talk about it of course forgive me but you can't stay here 
End of chapter 18. Recording by Deanna Beauvais. Chapter 19 of Souls for Sale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Souls for Sale by Rupert Hughes. Chapter 19. They say that the Magdalene was not really a Magdalene, that tradition has forgotten the text and mixed her with a woman of Bethany just as Potiphar's wife is carelessly branded with the deeds of another woman. But Mem, as she cowered on the sand, felt as humble as the Magdalene in the pictures, though the man who looked down upon her so tenderly had never posed as a Galilean, even in the miracle play they give every summer in the canyon at Hollywood. Tom Holby's profession was the opposite of a preacher's. He tried to show how people actually did behave, not how they ought to. His authors would not let him be very real, but always forced a moral, and that is the true immorality of the moving pictures. Not that they present wickedness so that innocent people may imitate it, but that they present life as if it punished wickedness and rewarded virtue, which is a pretty lie, but a lie none the less. While Holby had an instant suspicion that Mem was not telling him the truth, he felt no call to rebuke her or to wring it from her. He thought, she's pretty, she's in trouble. My business is to be as nice to her as I can. He lifted her from the sand, brushed her off, and went for her suitcase, which had been dumped into the stunted stubs of a choya cactus, that vegetable porcupine whose frosty barbs were fiendishly ingenious in creeping into his skin. Holby brought away a few spines that would cause him long agony until, with a knife and pliers, he should gouge them out. The darts of Cupid might have been plucked from the same bush, and Holby found the thoughts of this shy girl like cactus spines embedded in his thoughts tormentingly. As he lugged the suitcase back to the road, he tripped on the long skirts of his Arabian burnous. He had practiced walking in it when he was before the camera, but he was thinking of Mem now. He was thinking, She was not married when I met her on the train. A week later she's a widow. She has gone through two earthquakes in quick succession, a honeymoon and a funeral. I have found that whenever a calamity occurs to anybody, lack of money adds to the horror of it. His instinct was not to save her soul, but to make her body comfortable. And so, when he set the suitcase down by Mem, he asked her to rest upon it and stood between her and the sun while he spoke very earnestly. Tell me, to mind my own business, if I'm impertinent, but may I ask you one question? Did your husband leave you any money? Mem was so startled that she mumbled, A little. Not much? Not much. Enough? For a while. Have you come here to be with your parents or friends or relatives? No, I'm looking for a position as a chambermaid. <laughs> My God, you? Her eyes were amazed at his horror. He cried again. You with your beauty? Oh, no. She had been brought up on a motto. Praise to the face is open disgrace. She snubbed him with a fierce toss of the head. He laughed aloud. He had been a small-town youth and had known that motto, but he had been so long among women who were of a quite opposite mind that he was amused by the quaint backwoods ideal of regarding charm as a thing unmentionable in polite society. While he was trying to keep his face straight, as he apologized, a sharp voice broke in upon them. A man in a pith helmet, dark goggles, and a riding suit had steered a restive horse close to them and was complaining. Say, Holby, do you realize you're keeping the whole company waiting in this ghastly heat? I beg your pardon, Mr. Folger. Just a moment, old man. Let me present you to Miss... Mrs. Woodville. The director touched his helmet and nodded curtly. As he whirled his horse to ride back to his caravan, Holby ran and, seizing his bridle, led the horse aside and talked to Folger earnestly. Look here, old man. That girl is a friend of mine and beautiful as a peach. She's got the skin and the eyes that photograph to beat the band. She's just lost her husband and come out to this hellhole to be a chambermaid. It's too outrageous to think of. Give her a chance, won't you? 
The director twisted in his saddle and stared at Mem with expert eyes, then laughed at Holby. Is she a sweetie of yours? None of that now. She's as nice as they make em, but I can't stand the thought of working on a ranch, making beds and wrestling slop jars. Give her a test and put her in the mob scene or something, and don't tell Robina I told you to, in heaven's name. Folger was puzzled. Robina Teal was a troublemaker in the company, but she made profitable trouble in the hearts of the public. Just now she was smitten with Tom Holby, and she had dealt fiercely with one or two minor actresses he had been polite to. But it was bad studio politics to encourage these tyrannies. Stars had to be disciplined with care, like racehorses, yet curbed somehow. If Holby could be freed from Teal's domination, even by the sharp knife of jealousy, it might be a good thing for the next picture. Folger cast another look at Mem. There was a fresh meekness about her, an aura of gracious appeal. It would do no harm to try her out. If she were a failure, no one would know it. If she were a discovery, he would get the credit. It would not hurt him to do Holby a favor, for the director's own contract was under question of renewal, and a good word from Holby would not come amiss. All right, he said. I'll take a chance. Two of the extra women keeled over this morning from the heat. I'll have my assistant take her to the wardrobe woman and get her fitted out and made up. She can appear in the famine scene, and I'll bring her forward for a close-up. If she looks good in the rushes, we'll keep her on. And now, for heaven's sake, get back on your camel, for the cameramen are just about ready to drop. He set spurs to his horse and rode across the field, with his megaphone to his lips as he bellowed his orders. The caravan resumed its plodding advance, and Holby turned back to say to remember, I've taken a great liberty. I can't bear the thought of your working as a servant when there may be a big career before you in the pictures. The director saw you, and he wants you to, to help him out. There's a shortage in the company for the big scene, and you'd be a godsend. Try it, and see if you like it. If you don't, there's no harm done, and you'll be paid well for your trouble. If you do like it, why, but to please me, I mean the director, do this, won't you? He knew people well enough to glean from the first glance into her eyes that Mem was appalled at the prospect of playing in the movies, and that his one hope was to put his gift in the form of a petition. Before she could quite realize what she was doing, Mem had said, Well, of course, if it would be doing you a favor, an immense favor. I don't know anything, you know. That's all the better. You have nothing to unlearn. Here's Mr. Ellis, the assistant director. He'll take care of you. I've got to go. He introduced a young man who rode up and dismounted with all the meekness of the meekest office on earth, that of assistant director. In a tone of more than vice-presidential humility, Ellis explained to Mem what she was to do. She was aghast at this sudden plunge into the deep waters of an unknown sea. She turned to tell Tom Holby that she really could not accept, but he was in no position to hear her. He was in every position. As his camel rose to its knees, Holby was flopped about in the air with a violence that threatened to throw his head afar like a stone in a sling. When the camel had established itself on its four sofa-cushioned feet, it moved off with an undulating motion as sickening as an English Channel's steamer's. Mem turned to appeal to the man who had promised to drive her to the Randalls ranch, but he was standing far out in a sea of sage and cactus, dolefully regarding his wagon, which lay on its back with three and a half wheels spinning in the air and the other half of one scattered about the desert. While Mem floundered in the sands of her own uncertainties, many camels went by and horses in gorgeous trappings. Then followed a string of light automobiles loaded with machinery that she did not understand, with lighting equipment, with airplane propellers to kick up a sandstorm, and with paraphernalia of every sort. After these walked and rode a great crowd of men and women in Arabian costumes, their faces and hands painted in raw colors. Ellis checked one of the cars in which sat a woman, Mrs. Kittery, to whom he introduced Mrs. Woodville, explaining what was to be done with her. "'Get in here, my dear,' said Mrs. Kittery. And before Mem could protest, Mr. Ellis had flung her suitcase in, helped her to a seat, 
slammed the tin door on her, swung into his saddle, and away. The car kept to what road there was, and Mrs. Kittery soon learned how abysmal Mem's innocence was. But she was used to the ignorance of extra women, and she was glad that Mem was not a Chinese, a Turk, or an Indian. She could at least understand English. After a long and furiously jolty passage over the sand, the caravan of motors and the mob of suffering extras came to a halt on the shady side of a cluster of Arabian tents. Mrs. Kittery asked one of the extra women to make up Mrs. Woodville while she found a costume in the hamper. This amiable person was still unknown to fame as Leva Lemaire, really Mrs. David Wilkinson, whose husband had been killed in the war, leaving her with three children whom she supported by this form of toil. She preferred it to her previous experiences as a schoolteacher and a trained nurse. She made from forty to fifty dollars a week, and sometimes more, and she led a life of picturesque travel from nationality to nationality, a Mexican one week, a Hindu another, a farm wife again, a squaw, or a harem odalisk. Mem felt that the extra woman's life had its fascinations. The art was the business, to Mrs. Wilkinson, and she called it that. She was generous with grease paint and information, and she had a village mind that translated to Mem's village mind these foreign customs in a language she could understand. Only such a steady-souled person could have kept Mem from bolting in panic before the ordeal of having her face calcimined and tinted, her eyelids painted, the lashes leaded, her eyebrows penciled, her lips incarnadined, and red dots put here and there to give depth. To her, the decoration of the face, with any color from outside, had been hitherto an advertisement of eager vice. And now she was a painted woman, too. Mrs. Wilkinson's own face was decorated like an Indian warrior's, including certain blotches of carmine, which she explained, My nose is too broad and flat, so I paint the sides of it red, and that photographs like a shadow. And I have a double chin, which disappears in the picture, thanks to the red, and I narrow my fat cheeks the same way. But you don't need any of that modeling. You're perfect. Mem was dazed by this constant reference to her beauty. At home it had been a guiding principle that praising children made them conceited. These first compliments came like slaps in the face. But she was beginning to find them stimulating. By the time Mem was varnished, Mrs. Kittery had arrived with gaudy costumes, earrings, necklaces, and bracelets, Mem was soon so disguised that when Leva Lemaire offered her a pink in the mirrored top of her makeup box, she could not recognize herself at all. She looked like a cheap chromo of somebody else. There's two things you'll learn about the business, if you stay in it, said Leva. You've got to get up at an ungodly hour and break your neck making ready on time, and then you've got to sit around for hours and hours with nothing to do. Half the time they don't reach you all day. And most of the scenes you're taken in are cut out of the final picture. Otherwise, it's a nice life. And now that her pores were stuffed with paint, which it was disastrous to mop with a handkerchief, Mem had the task of waiting while the hot wind brought the great drops of sweat to her skin and the blown sand kept up an incessant scratching. In the distance, in the relentless flagellation of the sun, the principals of the company enacted before a group of cameras a drama that Mem could not understand. The camels defiled slowly, then galloped back, and defiled slowly again and again. There were long arguments. The director and his assistant dashed back and forth, trumpeting through their megaphones. The camels alone revealed artistic temperament. They began to fight one another. A group of two dragged their terrified passengers hither and yon and knocked over a camera. One of them fled, and dumping his belfryman, got clean away. He was not found until the next day, and then in Palm Canyon, where he reveled in a perfect duplicate of a homeland oasis. Leva explained to Mem what all the pother was about. You see, they take everything first at a distance. Long shots, they call them. They have three cameras here, but something always goes wrong or looks as if it could be improved, so they make a lot of takes. Then they come closer and take medium shots to cut into the long shots. Then they take close-ups of the most dramatic moments. All these have to match, though they usually don't. 
so that they can be assembled in the studio for the finished picture. The camels go by one way to show they're passing a certain spot. Then they go by the same spot in the opposite direction to show the return. But in the finished picture, that won't take place till a week later. But they take the things that happen on the same spot at the same time, no matter where they occur in the picture. It keeps the actors awfully mussed up in their minds. They don't know whether they're playing today, last month, or two years from now. That's Robina Teal in that biggest camel. She's earning her money today by the sweat of her whole system. She's sweet on Tom Holby and as jealous of him as a fiend. She's an awful cat, but he's a mighty nice boy, not spoiled a bit by being advertised as the most beautiful thing in the world. I was in a scene with him once. He was just as considerate as if I had been Norma Talbage or Pauline Frederick. While the extras waited and simmered their luncheon was served. The property crew went about among them, dealing out pasteboard boxes containing sandwiches wrapped in oiled papers, a bit of fried chicken, hard-boiled eggs, a piece of cake, and a Californian fruit, a peach, a pear, grapes, figs, a banana, or an orange. There was a cauldron of coffee for those that wanted it hot, iced tea, and bottles of pop. Mem had never been on a better-fed picnic. The women and men squatted on the ground and ate swapping fruit and repartee some of the jokes sent blushes flying beneath the layers of paint on mem's skin there was a vast amount of caustic fun made of the principals the director and the management but mem tried to remind herself that the sewing circles at home were just as busy tearing down the reputations of the neighbors only with a holier than thou contempt entirely lacking here there was a gypsy spirit in this company that mem had never met the gaiety was irresistible, and she managed to control her horror when she found that she was almost the only woman who refused a cigarette. Even Mrs. Wilkinson dug up a package from her desert robes. The principals had their refreshments taken to them, and snatched it between scenes. Robina did not eat at all. She lived in an eternal Lent, since she had to fight a sneaking tendency to plumpness. She suffered anguishes of fasting and privation like a religious zealot, but from the opposite reason. The zealots crucified the flesh because it was the devil's lure. She, in order to give it allurement and keep time's claws off her as long as possible. So now, in a heat that drove the desert Indians into the shade and idleness, these dainty actresses and actors invited sunstroke and labored with muscles and emotions at full blast in order to make pictures and minimize the appalling overhead expense of every wasted hour. After a time, the extras were called forth from the comparative shelter of the tents to the scene of action. It was like being tossed from the red-hot stove lid into the very fire. To Mem, it was all incredible phantasmagory. She could not believe that this was she who stumbled across the sand twitching her skirts out of the talons of the cactuses, carefully dabbing the sweat from her face with a handkerchief, already colored like a painter's brush rag, and jangling as she walked with barbaric jewelry. The mob went forward slowly, and she recognized Tom Holby on a camel. She hoped that he would not recognize her, but he studied all the faces, and being used to disguises, made her out and hailed her with the password. How you standing it? She called up to him. All right, thank you. There was vast interest in her from now on. The leading man had singled out an extra woman for special attention, and the gossip went round with a rush as of wings. Mem did not know that she was already a public property. She would have fled as from a plague if she had known. Later, she would come to realize that these people loved to believe the worst, forgive it, and absolve it with the forbearance met hardly anywhere else except in heaven. The director massed the extras together and addressed them from his horse. Ladies and gentlemen, you are supposed to be an Arabian tribe driven from your homes by the cruel enemy. You are wandering across the desert without food or water, dying of hunger and thirst. Later in the afternoon, if we can reach it, you will be overtaken by a sandstorm, and many of you will perish miserably. It's hard work, I know, but if you will go to it, we'll be out of this hell hole tomorrow, and there will be more comfortable work in the cool night shots. So make it snappy, folks, and do what you were told on cue, with all the pep you can put into it. I thank you. 
the company was then divided into groups with business assigned to each long shots were taken again and again small groups were posed with as much care as if the sun were benign instead of diabolic close-ups of individuals were taken the most striking types being selected and coached to express crisis of feeling you go mad and babble old man will you tear at your throat and let your tongue hang out you miss will you fall back in your mother's arms you be mother will you miss and catch her you are to die you know just roll your eyes back and sigh and seek into a heap and you mother wring your hands and beat your breast and wail you understand oriental stuff eh and i'd like somebody just to look up to heaven and pray for mercy somebody with big eyes let me see no you're i'm saving you for the you the young lady over there will you step out please come on come on i won't bite unless i'm kept waiting it's warm you know folks come out please oh it's mrs woodbridge isn't it i met you this morning here's your chance do this for me like a good girl and give yourself to it look up to heaven if the sun brings tears to your eyes all right but let them come from your soul dear if you can you see you have seen your people dying like flies about you from famine and hardship you look up and say oh god you don't mean for us to die in this useless torture do you dear god take my life and let these others live won't you dear god something like that you know don't look up yet you'll blind yourself wait till i get the camera set here boys make a very close close-up of this mem stood throbbing from head to foot with embarrassment and with a strange inrush of alien moods the fierce eyes of the director burning through his dark glasses the curious instigation in his voice the plea to do well for him quickened her magically the cameramen set up their tripods before her the lenses like threatening muzzles aimed point blank then they bent and squinted through their finders and brought tapes up and held them so close that their hot hands touched her when they measured her exact distance then adjusted the focuses one of them lifted the fold of her hood a little aside from her brow the director stared at her keenly then put out his hand and asked for a powder puff he dusted her face gently to dull the glistening surface they treated her as if she were an automaton and she became one a mere channel for an emotion to gush through folger took her by the arm and murmured just once now dear before we make the take remember what i told you let your heart break give us all you've got look round first and see your dying people that's your father over there just gasping his life out your mother lies dead back there you've covered her poor little body with sand to keep the jackals from it your own heart is broken in a thousand pieces can you do it will you that's right look round now and let yourself go she felt herself bewitched benumbed yet mystically alive to a thousand tragedies her eyes rolled around the staring throng some of them were helping her by looking their agony others were out of the mood adjusting their robes freshening their makeup or whispering and smiling but the gift of belief the genius of substitution fell upon her like a flame and nothing mattered they had brought music out into this inferno a wheezy organ a cello and a violin that cried like the linnet that had lost her way and sang on a blackened bough in hell her heavy eyes made out tom holby gazing down at her from his camel and pouring sympathy from his own soul into hers then she flung her head from side to side in a torment of woe cast her head back and heaved her big eyes up into the cruel brazier of the skies seemed to see god peering down upon the little multitude and moved her lips in supplication she felt the words and the anguish wringing her throat and the tears came trooping from her eyes ran shining into her mouth and she swallowed them and found them bitter sweet with an exultation of agony she did not know that the director had whispered camera and was watching her like a tiger striving to drive his own energy into her she did not hear the cameramen turning their cranks there was such weird reality in her grief that the director's glasses were blurred with his own tears the cameramen were gulping hard she did happen to note as her upward stare encountered tom holby's eyes on high that tears were dripping from his lashes and that his mouth was quivering 
the sight of his tears sent through her a strange pang of triumphant sympathy and she broke down sobbing would have fallen to the sand if leva lemaire had not caught her and drawn her into her arms kissing her and whispering wonderful wonderful she felt a hand on her arm and was drawn from leva's arms into a man's her shoulders were squeezed hard by big hands and she heard a voice that identified her captor as the director he was saying god bless you that was the real stuff we won't make you do it over we had two cameras on you you're all right you're a good girl the real thing then she began to laugh and choke and became an utter fool this was her first experience of the passion of mimicry she was as shamed as glorified as drained yet as exultant as if a god had seized her and embraced her fiercely for a moment then left her aching an ember in the ashes the director was already calling the mob to the next task she could not help glancing toward tom holby his camel was moving off with the crowd but he was turning back to gaze at her he was nodding his head in approval and he raised his hand in a salute of profound respect end of chapter nineteen recording by deanna beauvais chapter twenty of souls for sale this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Souls for Sale by Rupert Hughes. Chapter 20. That afternoon, the sandstorm was to be pulled off. Dynamos mounted on trucks carrying airplane propellers were gathered toward the two great dunes piled to the northeast of Palm Springs, hiding who knows what under the sands heaped by winds that have roared down the san gorgonio pass for eons toward the greater of them a mass whose color had now the chatoyant luster of an opal five hundred feet high a hillock whereon no more vegetation grows than on an opal and whereon the light plays milkily through all the gamut of tinges the caravan moved the desert was to represent sahara in the picture and these actors and actresses were to convince the throngs that they were really a tribe of misery on whom fate heaped a cyclone of sand to crown their martyrdoms of hunger thirst and weariness as the straggling hirelings of art trudged across the shifty floor of sand panting between the heat that beat down from the sky and shot up from the glassy meadow the air stood still and they cooked as in a firebox their feet fried and their hearts staggered the suffocation sent a few of the crusaders to the ground gasping like fish in a creel these were gathered up and carried half dead to the shade where a physician restored them they were humiliated and grieved at the treachery of their own faculties the others hardly so much marched as tumbled forward mem was aided somehow by the ardor of her little success she felt that if she could only keep to the fore she might be offered another draught of the new wine of art by and by she overtook tom holby who checked his camel to have a word with her i'd ask you to take my place up here but i'm afraid you'd be as seasick as i was the first time i rode one of these wallowers but hang on to that strap and it will help you a little mem seized a pendant strap and was hailed along she did not know and tom holby did not care how much this interested the neglected multitude after a time as they slackened their pace to mount the dune in whose soft surface her feet sank above the ankles mem noted that the smothering hush of the air was quickened with little agues of wind gimlets of sand rose and twisted ran and fell a fiendish malice seemed to inspire them and they were vicious as devils at play then the sky ahead was blotted from sight by a vast yellow blanket it came forward as if giants were carrying it to spread over the terrified pilgrims ahead of it darted and swirled spinning dervishes of sand the blanket as it approached became a wall hurrying a vast dam driven by mountain floods in the rear the crest of it was a spume of sand the menace of it was as of a day of judgment the actors had never seen anything of its sort but they could guess what the camels knew that it was of dreadful omen a few years before a herd of cattle rolling up from yuma had been caught in such a sandstorm and when it passed they were all dead and buried 
the camels began to betray the terror that the people surmised they grew frantic with panic but knew that flight was vain they were at the mercy of whatever god it is that beasts adore tom holby's mount without waiting for command dropped to its belly and stretched out its neck and closed its eyes against the peril but the cameramen set their tripods and began to turn their cranks they had the instinct of the trade and were hopeful that if they themselves did not live their pictures might tom holby dropped from his post and gathered mem into the shelter of the camel's bulk she did not know or care that his arm was about her as they stood peering across the parapet of the camel's back at the onset of the advancing niagara other women crowded to the same camel the rest of the crowd flung themselves down and dug their arms to the elbows in the sand lest they be swept away a courier gale leaped upon them in a yelling charge with whips of fire that flung the tripods over and the cameramen with them but still they persisted and shielding their lenses with their own bodies turned them this way and that grinding the cranks and picking up what groups they saw about them the torrid blast dashed the sand in shovelfuls upon the groveling crowd the great robes fluttered flapped belied and ripping loose went whooping the gliding precipice of sand arrived and hid the sun in a gruesome saffron fog and then precipice was avalanche with abrupt chill a brown cold mountain fell on them stopped the breath and played shrapnel on the skin in a maelstrom of dagger points that stabbed from every side tom holby wrapped his burnous about mem as they cowered in the lee of his camel the sand broke over their bulwark as breakers leap across a rock they were drowned in waves that did not recede the sand found them inside their robes it filled their nostrils their mouths when they gulped for breath the breakers of sand swept round upon them broke back over them and with a grinding uproar that threatened to split the ears they packed with sand tom holby kept struggling to fling off the hillock that formed about them kept lifting mem's head above the mound that grew sagebrushes ripped from their places shot by tearing the skin they touched roots of old mesquite went over like clubs prickly pears and masses of cactus hurtled past in the torrent suddenly the sand tide was gone but a sea of rain followed it cruelly cold and ruthless it turned the mounds into gobs of wet sand slimy and odious what had been a world of drought and frenzy became a lake in a squall what garments the wind had not wrenched free grew sloppy and icy and loathsomely sticky for half an hour the deluge harried the dismal caravan then in an instant the rain was over the hurricane of sand pursued by flood passed on up the valley to rend the orange groves and tear the fishing boats from their moorings the sun resumed his own tyranny and lashed the thrice wretched army back to its camp but the cameramen retrieved their instruments from the rubber covers they had wrapped about them with a mothering devotion and the director checked the retreat and formed it in groups for record the airplane propellers that had come forth to imitate the frenzy of the storm had yielded to it and were torn from their axles lost here and there beneath the new surface of the blinking opal end of chapter 20 recording by diana bove chapter 21 of souls for sale this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org souls for sale by rupert hughes chapter 21 the footsore and saddle sore moving picture people fell back upon palm springs like a defeated army the village a cool shadow on a bleak waste had known nothing of the storm except as a distant spectacle the skirts of the gale had set the palm leaves to rattling together as in ancient staff play and the limber towers of the tallest trees swayed and shuddered but not one of them had fallen nor been struck headless by lightning the village was alone the winter visitors had gone inside that is to say had departed to the cool seashore at san diego and los angeles and the community had drawn itself together for its long summer nap there was room for the moving picture people and leva lemaire invited mem to share her room in one of the hotel bungalows 
the sun sank early behind the vast barricade of the san jacinto chain rising sheer from the sand and piling height upon height to the crest ten thousand feet in air the mountains were blessed now with a mist of light that the aerial prisms gave the effect of down the brutality of the sky became grace the stark nakedness of the place was here covered with a flesh of earth with grass and flowers and with the large flowers we call trees mem had known the oleander as a tubbed captive at home here it was a giant spreading arms in a benediction of fragrant shade and dangling bouquets that brushed her hair and caught her hat palm trees of vast bull hung out umbrellas of somber green wan cottonwoods held up pallid limbs drooping with fuzz pepper trees let their tresses droop the ancient and honorable black fig trees of the famous san gabriel lineage date palms roses flowers and shrubs massed and running wild about the rambling gardens seemed miraculous to mem who had almost forgotten in the dreary hell of the desert that green things had ever been invented and who found herself walking deeper and deeper into a revel of tropical luxury there were indians here too the little company of quahilas one old buck with hair as black as tar drip and as long as his hat brim was broad stood gravely watering hollyhocks with a garden hose a clump of broad squaws worked at basket weaving darting through the streets young indian girls with bobbed hair flopping and gingham skirts flying bestrode the wild horses of this village white people rode too cowmen from the ranches beyond and children one half-naked little girl bounced along the lane on a monstrous horse so flat of back that she might as well have been riding a galloping plateau yet she was chasing home a troop of horses as big as her own i was never on a horse mem sighed you'd better learn to ride said leva lemaire it comes in mighty handy in this business but i'm not going into the business mem protested hardly able to push one foot ahead of the other i've had enough for the rest of my life that's what my poor husband used to say every time he recovered from a spree and he never took another drop till he got the first chance but mem knew better she was too tired to eat she wanted to lie down and never get up leva guided her to the bungalow and left her just to be cool just to be still were paradise now after a time a porter brought her her suitcase leva had managed to find it but mem was too weary to change her clothes she dropped into a chair by a window and watched a tiny boy drive home a few cattle watched the last red plumage fade on the breast of the mountains watched the first star suddenly shimmer as if a jewel had been tossed from somewhere on the sky other stars twinkled into being here there there like the first big drops of rain and soon the whole sky was spattered with them the moon that had lurked in the blistered air all day unseen turned up her lamp and carried it somewhere into the sea beyond the shore of the horizon carried the sky with it star by star the moon went reluctantly but the milky way seemed to gleam with added radiance when she was gone the lights in the homes made stars on earth and gave companionship to the dreamy night at length leva came along the path a shadow detaching itself from other shadow she was full of high spirits there had been great hilarity in the dining room of the desert inn she was still restless and she urged mem to come with her and bathe in the hot springs of the indian reservation mem was enough restored by now to feel the distress of the sand that filled her hair and her clothes the project had a tang of wild adventure and she went along taking clean clothes over her arm they walked through the double night of the foliage shrouded streets the palms muttering over them and blocking their way on the irregular paths at the reservation an old indian admitted them with an utter indifference to their thrill of terror inside the cabin lighted only by candles they undressed and stretched themselves in the warm water thickened with sand it crept about them with an uncanny tingling where the stream bubbled from the depths it was a weird a spooky bath but it sent them forth clothed in skins reborn when they drifted past the hotel they heard song enriching the night a man's voice carried the burden of the tune sonorously and a woman's voice oversoared it like a hovering nightingale's or so mem thought until leva whispered 
That's Robina Teal singing. Pretty voice, hasn't she? Beautiful, said Mem, but begrudged the praise with a jealousy that surprised her. The man is Tom Holby, I think, said Leva. Awfully nice fellow. Seems to have taken a great shine to you. Nonsense, said Mem, oddly quickened by the thought and a little alarmed by her own delight. Well, we might as well move along, Leva grumbled. We're only extras, and we don't belong with the big folks. Humbled and outcast, but without resentment, Mem followed through the heavy gloom, suddenly smothered with loneliness and uselessness, yet panting for something to do, something brilliant and tremendously emotional, like the moment of desperate passion she had enacted in the desert. She wondered what the photograph would look like, wondered if she would ever see it, if anyone else would ever see it, or if it would be cut out as Leva had suggested. A terrible thing to feel fiercely and be cut out, snuffed like a candle flame that yearns and leaps and is forever as if it had never been. When she reached the cottage, she was very weary again, but she could not sleep, and Leva wanted to read. There were two beds in the room, and Leva sat propped up by a little bedlight that painted her in bright vignette against the dark. After a long stupor, Mem abruptly wanted to know something. Are the moving picture people very wicked? She heard herself asking. Leva stared into the dark where Mem lay, and she laughed. Very. Mem sighed. She was sorry to hear it. In fact, Leva went on, I don't know a single moving picture person who is above reproach. She finished the page and turned it before she went on. But then, neither do I know a single person in any other walk of life who is above reproach. Everybody I ever heard of is full of sin. The Bible says that we all fell with Adam and Eve. So I suppose it's only natural that movie people should be as faulty as everybody else is. But I can't see that they're any wickeder than anybody else. Really? Mem cried, hoisting herself to an elbow. Really? Most movie people are stodgy and untemperamental and nice, everydayish, folksy souls. They work hard when they can and save their money and raise families and have children and spats and diseases and petty vices like everybody else. A few wild ones make a splurge and get in the papers. But if you read the papers, you see all the professions and trades represented in the scandals. The other day the front page told about a preacher who ran away with a girl in the choir and left a wife and several children behind him. But nobody spoke about the danger of letting girls sing in choirs. Yet choirs are dangerous. Heaven knows. She could not see how Mem trembled at this random arrow that struck home. Mem was sorry she spoke and asked no more questions. But Leva needed no further prompting. I've tried a lot of trades. Stenographer nurse, canvassing for magazine subscriptions, clerking in a store, and just plain home life, and there was mischief everywhere. Don't believe all this talk you hear, honey, or put it in its proper proportion. There were no movies twenty-five years ago, but Satan is a million years old, and he hasn't taken a day or a night off yet. I used to know a piece about Satan, find some mischief still for idle hands to do, but he has enough left over for busy hands, too. Are you thinking of staying in the movies? No. Afraid of them? No. You've got a good start. You've made a hit with a star and a director the first day. Lord, I've been at it two years and still dubbing along. Better keep at it. No, thank you. Don't thank me, said Leva. I'm nobody. I couldn't be of any help except to find you a good boarding house and an agent. But if you ever come up to Los Angeles, I'll give you the address tomorrow. Don't let me forget. I won't. Leva returned to her book, the turning of every page slashing Mem's mood like a knife. She was thinking that she was not good enough even for the movies. Her sin had led her to the edge of this paradise, and then drawn her back by the hair, she was doomed to spend a certain time in increasing heaviness, and then to die, or to go about thenceforth, with a nameless child at her breast, or trudging at her side, holding onto her hand, and anchoring her to obscurity. 
End of chapter 21. Recording by Deanna Beauvais. Chapter 22 of Souls for Sale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Souls for Sale by Rupert Hughes. Chapter 22. Wakened by the sound of rushing waters, she ran barefoot to the window. There was no sign of rain in that hard marbled sky. The mountains looked as if rain had never dampened them. She could not think just what their color reminded her of for a time. Then she recalled the burnt sugared almonds heaped in the window of Calverley's one candy store. How she had loved them! But this scorched, mottled brown mountain range had no sweetness, only inconceivable bulk. Still the water gurgled. She saw that the yard about the bungalow, soft and dusty last night, was now a shallow lake with waters dancing everywhere. She thrust her head out of the window and drew it in again, for a Jap was shutting the water gates of an overflowing trough extending as far as she could see. It was an irrigation ditch. He was flooding the ground before the sun could turn the water into burning lenses. She was to learn that the desert irrigated yields more richly than rich soil untended, just as common human soil responds with miracles to lavish floods of encouragement. A boy from the main building of the hotel came skipping across the lawn to waken Leva, who must be up betimes. Mem would not yield to her appeals that she should come along and resume the movie picture work. She would taste no more of the forbidden cup. She put aside especially the temptation to be near Tom Holby and to taste the wine of his approval and his thoughtfulness. Temptation, like love, follows who flees. Mem went back to bed, but, goaded by discontent, rose, bathed, and dressed, and went to the hotel for breakfast, determined that she would inquire at once the way to the Randalls Ranch, and take up her humble future before her funds were further diminished. The dining room was deserted, save for one man, and that was Tom Holby. "'Hello!' he cried. "'Come sit with me. You're not working? Neither am I. I'm a gentleman till this afternoon.' They're taking shots that I'm not in, so I slept late. Our poor star, Robina, is out in the gas stove, turning herself into a fricassee, while I loll at ease. She is being kidnapped today by a roving band of bad Arabs. I was just starting to rescue her yesterday, disguised as a sheikh or something, when I fell in with the famine mob. I rescued her last week up on the lot in Los Angeles. Mem looked so bewildered that he explained, You see... We built a whole Arabian street on the lot, and I broke in and broke out and broke up all the furniture, tearing Robina from the villains. Then we came down here to take the scenes of her capture. You'll get used to this upside-down business when you've been in the movies a while longer. I've been in them as long as I'm going to be. Oh, no, you haven't, Holby laughed. I wouldn't blame you for quitting if every day were like yesterday, but you got the worst of it at the first. I've never known a day like yesterday, but you'll not be likely to have another in a thousand years. I loved it. Then why are you quitting? She could not tell him the truth, and no lie occurred to her, so she simply drew a veil across her eyes and left him to his own surmises. It was not his nature to persist when a woman rebuffed him, even though that was a rare experience with him. He waved the mystery as her own affair and spoke up cheerily. Order a good breakfast and come with me to the Palm Canyon. They say it's glorious. It will buck you up and save me from the horrors of solitude. He took an unfair advantage of her by appealing to her charity again. It was the best way to tyrannize over her. She consented for lack of ability to imagine a polite excuse and finished her breakfast while he went in search of a car. He came back with a rusty fliver, which he drove himself. There were seven miles of road winding in all directions, especially up and down. She praised Holby for the skill with which he kept his hands and feet playing. I had to drive one of these in my last picture, he said. You have to handle nearly everything in the pictures. I've driven a stagecoach, pursued by Indians through canyons, and a coach and four down Fifth Avenue, and a donkey chaise in a London scene and a side-car in an imitation Ireland, a motor-boat, a street-car, 
a caterpillar tractor, an airship, a chariot, and a steam shovel. Talented lad, eh? Look, did you see that? Mem had seen it. A long rope of scarlet silk ran across the road and threaded the sagebrush, as if a red lasso had learned to flee of its own volition. It was a scarlet racer. Lots of snakes along here, but mostly harmless, he said. Robina loves snakes. Do you? Her shivering repugnance answered for her. After a time, they passed a patch of ground a little drearier than the rest of the landscape. It had been cleared once, and a wooden cross erected there. Holby answered her questioning stare. That's probably the grave of some poor fellow who died of thirst. A villager was telling me last night that only last week a man was found dead within a mile of his ranch. He was that near to good water, but he couldn't make the distance. Out of his mind, probably. They said he was almost naked. Men who are dying for water have a queer mania for tearing off their clothes. Mem was startled. She had heard this very fact from the man in Yuma. She had decided to let Mr. Woodville die of thirst. It seemed odiously cruel now to subject even an imaginary man to such a death. This reminded her that she had not yet explained to Mr. Holby the puzzle of her name. He had evidently dismissed it from his mind, for he was running on. I don't suppose the pictures can show anybody dying of thirst now, with a censor in full power. They believe in clothes and lots of them. It looks as if they'd make the moving pictures die of thirst just inside of the promised land. Just as the hard times are coming on, the censors rise up like a sandstorm and blow from all directions. You can hardly find a story that can stand their sandblast. They eat away the plot till it falls with a crash. Just as, see that telephone pole chewed away by the sand that blows all the time against it? Well, that's what the censors are doing to the picture game. If they don't topple the whole thing over, it won't be their fault. But what will they do for salaries then? In some of the states, they cut out all reference to expected children. Would you believe it? They cut out a scene where a working man came home and found his wife making little clothes and rejoiced and was proud. Was ever anybody on earth as indecent and filthy-minded as a prude? All crime and sin are pretty well forbidden also. Hideous, isn't it, that grown people in a grown-up country called the land of the free and the home of the brave should be bullied and handcuffed? till we can't even tell a story? We can't play Shakespeare, of course, or the Bible stories, or any of the big literary works any more. And they do it all in the name of protecting morals. As if girls and boys never went wrong until the movies came along. As if you could stop human beings from being human by closing up the theaters and telling lies to the children. But there's no use whining. We'll have to take our paragoric. The crookeder the politician, the more anxious he is to win over the bigots. If he'll give them the censorship and a few other idiotic tyrannies, they won't interfere with his graft. Soon they arrived at Palm Canyon and ran the car well up into the gorge along a water that descended a winding stair with little cascades and broad pools. In some of them, water snakes could be seen twisting shadowily. But the wonder of the place was the embassy of stately palms that had marched down the ravine to the edge of the desert and greeted the visitor with the majesty of lofty chieftains in great war bonnets of green plumes. Some were tall and slender with headdresses of fronded glory. Others were short and fat and so shaggy of trunk that they resembled the legs of giant cowboys and chaparreos. There was a little cabin halfway up the canyon but it was locked and deserted. On a bulletin board were placards begging for mercy to animal kind and praising nakedness as akin to godliness. He ought to be on a censorship board, said Holby. The hermit who kept this retreat was making good his creed, for when Mem and Holby got out of their car and stared from the edge of the barrier down into a stream, meandering through an Eden of shade, they saw him naked at his bath. Both pretended not to have noticed him and turned away. Before long he came up the steep path in apostolic garb with robe, rope girdle, sandals, and staff. He wore a beard and long chestnut curls, as in the tradition of the Messiah. How easy it is to look like the pictures of Christ, Tom Holby said. It angered him a little to meet a man whose ideals 
and practices were so contrary to his own. The hermit lived on next to nothing, took no part in the activities of mankind, hid himself in obscurity, and led a life of sanctified indolence. He did not mortify his flesh, and he did not follow the medieval theory that baths are diabolic and dirt divine. He was neat, and even his nails were manicured with care. But he made no use of his body for the public good or gaiety. He abstained from beauty and suppressed his emotions. Tom Holby, by the very opposite ambition, treated his flesh as an instrument of many uses. He diverted millions of people, and his prosperity was gauged by the delight he gave in quality and quantity. He was so far from seeking oblivion that his very postures were multiplied and sent about the world. The ambitions of the two men were of mutual criticism and reproach. Yet Holby was polite to the polite hermit who invited the wanderers into his neat little cabin, sold them postal cards with views of the canyon, then with a most unhermit-like skill played them love tunes on an Hawaiian guitar of his own making. He held in his right hand a bar of steel with which he gave his melodies a quaint sliding tone an amorous whimper of a squirrel-like pathos. From this cozy retreat, Holby led Mem down to the center of the palm haunt. He was thinking aloud. Funny business, being a professional good man. That sort of fellow hates the world, and is afraid of it, and retires to the desert to save his soul. Always seemed to me there was something lacking in that idea of being good. Save your own soul, and let the world go to the devil. It means nothing to the hermit, whether there is war or peace, famine or prosperity. He doesn't help any lonely people to smile. He doesn't feed anybody or give any money to anybody. He doesn't build any railroads or cathedrals or theaters, paint any pictures or write any songs or vote or make shoes or anything. He doesn't commit any sins, maybe, any of the crowd's sins, but he doesn't commit any good deeds either. Still... If a man is so excited about his soul, it's better if he will go away by himself and save it than to spend his life trying to save everybody else's soul by censorships and foolish laws about tobacco and Sunday and art and everything. In the depth of the canyon, the palms were densely congregated, their branches interlaced into a roof of murmurous green. Mem was in a mood of beyond the world. She felt bewitched as she walked over the dried fans of fallen leaves and listened to the birds that made a lyric caravansary of this haven. It was a realm of Arabian magic with no hint of the American magic that our familiar eyes ignore. Mem dropped wearily down upon a stone by the brook in a thatched tent of palms. Tom Holby, though there was a place at a distance, sat down at her side. This threw her heart into a flutter. His own heart was evidently on the scurry, too, and there was a fierce debate within him whether he should speak or not. Finally, he said, You've got me at a terrible disadvantage here. I'm all alone with you and helpless. It wouldn't do me any good to scream, and I'm so weak that you could overpower me with a look. She could not make him out at all. He had to explain, baldly. You know, when a woman lures a man out to a solitude like this? Lures? Well, use any word you like. Just say, goes with a man. Anyway, she sets the poor fellow to guessing mighty hard. I wouldn't annoy you for worlds. I've got a queer hankering to be of some service to you, but I can't place you anywhere. She did not know his language. Can't place you at all. You have a sweet, innocent, beautiful face, and your eyes are as gentle as a dove's. But that has been the case with some of the daintiest little desperados that ever tore up society. The first time I met you, you told me your name was Remember Steddon. You called me Mr. Woodville when we said goodbye in Tucson. A week or two, and we meet again, and you are Mrs. Woodville, and your husband is dead, and you're going to be a chambermaid on a ranch. It's all possible, but it isn't a bit convincing, and you've got me puzzled. If you've committed a crime and are hiding out, you'd better get into a bigger crowd because you're as conspicuous out here as old Jacinto Peak. If you've committed a crime, I'm sure you had a good reason to, and I'm no informer, 
but i wish you would tell me whether you are the cleverest adventuress i ever met or just a poor scared little lonely lost child her confusion was that of a child he could see no trace of insincerity in her panic and there was a wedding ring on her finger but this did not impress him much he had seen too many married actresses take off their rings to play maidens and too many unmarried actresses put them on to play wives he had seen wonderful sincerity in impersonation robina could make him weep almost at will in her scenes of hapless innocence he broke out impatiently when mem did not speak tell me honestly one thing is there a mr woodville were you ever really married to anybody she turned frightened eyes upon him and spoke with a parrying evasion why why should you doubt it he stared at her sharply then his eyes softened and he mumbled you poor little thing what on earth are you up to what are you running away from why should you come to this place out of season under a false name with a wedding ring you bought yourself she carried her other hand to conceal the ring as if it were a shameful baby the instinctive gesture convinced holby that he had guessed well now she fell into an ague of terror she looked this way and that as if for a door of escape but she knew that on all sides of her was a wilderness of mountains and desert she was horribly afraid of holby he had the domineering demanding manner of a police officer but instead of denouncing her or arresting her he suddenly took her two trembling hands in one of his and with the other pressed her to him and held her tight she struggled fiercely yet with the feeling of a lamb in a shepherd's clasp she knew that he was no enemy yet she could not accept him as her friend on so short an acquaintance friendships were not made at such speed in calverley so she fought until he released her then she rose and staggered along a crackling path scattering little lizards that seemed rather to pretend than to feel fear she began to weep ran blindly into one of the palms and fell but into holby's arms again tell me the truth he pleaded let me be your friend i want to help you if it would help you most to let you alone i'll do that if it would help you to be held tight and hugged hard and kissed and loved i'll do that and mighty gladly but in heaven's name don't stand there and have chills and fever and not speak she felt a mad yearning to tell him the truth she felt that he would be very merciful and wise and everything wonderful she felt that he would not be shocked those actors and actresses could not be shocked by anything probably and yet a kind of snobbishness even in humiliation locked her jaws on her secret she was a clergyman's daughter after all and it would be an appalling come down from all her teaching to make a movie actor her confidant and accept his advice and help and heavens she was already accepting his caresses mem was a princess of the parsonage and she was suddenly recalled to her pride of estate please she said quite haughtily oh please tom holby writhed when his generous motives were flung back into his face he was filled with rage and yet he pitied her more than ever he pitied her as the vagabond pities the hidebound puritan who sets him in the pillory he longed for such freedom and equality as he enjoyed in his wrangles with robina teal who swore at him and struck at him with a manly vigor he controlled himself and groaned an ironic forgive me when she ingeniously answered i do he almost suffocated with tormented wrath and sardonic amusement he dumbfounded her by speaking in the jargon of his craft they say that when griffith wanted to get the final grimace of agony in lillian gish's face in the scene where her illegitimate baby dies in way down east you know they photographed her face while he held her feet and tickled them i don't know how true the story is but i feel just that way do i look it he was so interested in expression that he actually thrust his face close to hers for her verdict on his mien she had still another baffler for him who's griffith this heathenish ignorance of the first god of the american cinema took his breath like a blow on the solar plexus and he could only whisper huskily let's go back 
End of chapter 22. Recording by Deanna Beauvais. Chapter 23 of Souls for Sale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Souls for Sale by Rupert Hughes. Chapter 23. When the moving picture caravan left Palm Springs, Mem lost the courage that had led her to refuse to go with it. Tom Holby rather coldly advised her to take up the moving pictures as a career. The director praised her and promised not to forget her. Leva Lemaire begged her to come to Los Angeles, where it would be cool and profitable, and warned her not to risk her life in the desert. Also, she collected from Mem the day's wages of seven dollars and a half for her work as an extra woman. This thrilled the girl with her astonishing earning powers. At that rate, she could earn as much in a week as her father earned in a month, even she. But Mem would as soon have followed a pack of gypsies or a circus troupe out of Calverly. It was only when the movie people were gone that she realized how much they had filled the scene, how empty and little the stage was, now that the picture crowd abandoned it. She found a place as maid in the home of a storekeeper at such wages as he could afford. She began the sordid routine of her tasks, but, contrasting them with the glamour of playing tragic roles, she felt herself entombed. Then the summer heat began, and grew so fierce that her employer's wife and children went inside to the seashore. This left her in a position of embarrassment and terror. She was an embarrassment and terror to her employer, too, for she had a beauty that she unwittingly flung over him like a net. Her beauty stung him in his thoughts. It filled his honest soul with poisonous desire. He tried to summon courage to send her away, but the sorrow in her eyes made it impossible to dismiss her. Finally, being as wise as he was good, he determined to flee from the temptation to tempt and took shelter with his wife. Mem had not watched him well enough to note her influence upon him. She went about in a daze, with heavier and heavier heart and tread. She spent much thought upon the letter home that she had not yet written, that she must write if ever she were to go home again. The whole purpose of this long, long journey into loneliness was to be able to write that letter, and it had not yet gone. Every time she made the beginning, her hands flinched from the lying pen, but when her employer left the village for a few days with his family at the coast, one night in a frantic fit of histrionic enthusiasm, she dashed off her fable, sealed it in an envelope, and dropped it after dark in the mailbox. Darling Mama and Papa, how can I write the terrible news? I can hardly bear to think of it, let alone write about it. But my darling husband passed away in the desert. I cannot write you the particulars now, for I am too agitated and grief-stricken, and I do not want to harrow you with details. I know your poor hearts will ache for me, but I beg you not to feel it too deeply, because I am trying to be brave, and I remember what you taught me, that the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Poor John did not find the lost mine he was looking for, and he did not find the water-hole he expected, for... After I had waited for him a long time in our camp by a little spring, another prospector brought me word that he had found him and buried him. The poor boy had torn all his clothes off in the thirst madness, and had been dead for three days when found. I cannot write you more now. I am in no need of money, and I will come home when I get a little stronger. The climate is doing my health wonderful good, even if it has broken my heart." But don't you worry, I'll be all right, and I'll send you a long letter as soon as I settle down somewhere. All the love in the world, from your loving Mem. After she had slipped the letter irrevocably into the mailbox, she realized that the postmark of Palm Springs would be stamped on the envelope. Her place of concealment would be disclosed. Still, it would not matter. She was a widow now in the minds of her people and she could go back to them and face the future in calm. But she would have to go on playing a part all her life, and playing it once more in the monotonous theater of her own home. 
she had a fierce desire for her mother's help in the approaching ordeal but how could she endure it to begin lying again in her dear old father's trusting face her soul wanted to run and climb leaden as her feet were she was a bit flighty in her head at times nowadays a longing for cool waters and icy waves assailed her the los angeles paper which came to the house every day spoke of santa monica as the place where the mountains meet the sea that phrase had an hallucinative influence she imagined the vast herd of mountains crowding down to meet the radiant breakers that the pacific flung upon their shining horns as they bent to dip their muzzles into the surf the ocean was so near to palm springs that her employer spoke of having breakfasted once on the beach and reached home long before dinner time and that was by the winding motor roads to the northwest the fantastic notion came to her that she might climb the san jacinto sierra and cross it to the ocean as the eagles did or at least catch a glimpse of blue waves the mountains had a beckoning look always and on this afternoon when a clouded sky gave a little shelter from the sun she set out to follow her vagary as far as her strength would take her she crossed a strip of sand as soft as deep piled velvet and came to a path that slanted up a rounded cliff lifting a granite wall right aloft from the unrippled surface of the desert the exertion of climbing was more than mem had bargained for she was weaker and weightier than she had thought the steeps that looked so inviting from a distance were ragged and forbidding the burnt almond mountains were hot and sharp-edged gridirons to her feet when she was high enough to look down on the leafy thatch of the little village she grew dizzy and afraid the loneliness up there was grisly something said go back she fought the everlasting tendency to retreat from everything she undertook but gave up and decided to return and now as she stared at the swift descent before her she grew more afraid of climbing down than of climbing up she hesitated then mounted a few steps with pain and struggle she had not the strength to go on nor the courage to go back the sun came blazing forth and seemed to spill upon her a yellow hot mass of metal that slashed her about the head and rolled over her shoulders in blistering ingots the fiends of height swirled round her she tried to call for help but whence a stone rolled under her foot and shook her from her balance she wavered clutched at nothing whirled struck bounded from the hard rock fell and fell and then a smashing blow blackness silence end of chapter 23 Recording by Deanna Beauvais. Chapter 24 of Souls for Sale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Souls for Sale by Rupert Hughes. Chapter 24 a young indian girl chasing her stray pony about the sand had noted the figure climbing the side of the cliff and had studied it wondering at its erratic behavior she had seen mem stumble then fall had heard the thump of the body on the cushioning sand had run to the nearest house and told what she had seen a man there came out and followed the indian girl when she pointed to the height where mem had stood when she slipped he said that's all of sixty feet she's dead for sure but she was not though she was lifeless enough when they reached her and more than one bone was broken a woman had tried to kill herself a few weeks before by jumping from a far higher cliff and landing on sand as soft had wakened to her keen disappointment in this world instead of the other with a few more bruises and anguishes than before the indian girl dispelled the natural suspicion that mem had attempted suicide her first outcry when she was brought back to consciousness was a shriek of terror that resumed her thoughts where they had left off she was recognized and taken home the village doctor was fetched and he did all that his skill could do to hasten the repairs that nature began upon at once though mem had never dared to visit the doctor he knew of her and knew of her as a widow the wedding ring on her finger forestalled even a thought of the truth when she was strong enough to be talked to he prepared her for bad news 
Am I to be crippled for life? she cried. No, he sighed. You will bear no marks of your accident. But you will not... But your other hopes and expectations will not be realized. She was dazed, and he was timid, and he had some difficulty in making her understand his bad news that she would not be a mother. She bore this blow with a fortitude that surprised him. Before she was able to be up and about, the family came back and ministered to her with a kindness that punished her. One morning she was terrified to receive a letter from home. It was addressed to Mrs. John Woodville, and it was written by her mother with a long postscript from her father. Her mother's letter was a labored effort to pour out sympathy for her daughter in the loss of a husband who, she knew, had never lived and could not die. Her expressions of horror at his demise were written for the sake of her husband, but she was never meant for a dramatic author, and Mem could feel the artificiality of her language. But her father was completely deceived and mourned sincerely. His postscript was all pity and loving sorrow. He told of his prayers for her strength to bear her cross and pleaded with her to be brave. He said that he had prayed for her in church, and the congregation sent her loving messages. Mem could see him on his knees imploring heaven, pacing his room with the tread she had heard so much in her childhood, and stretching his clasped hands across the pulpit Bible as he solicited mercy of heaven. Remorse came upon her again with the suffocating fury of the sandstorm, she felt that she could never face her father or her village again. Now that her accident had annulled her excuse for being here, her conscience forbade her to go home again. Now she felt an exile indeed, and an unutterable loneliness, without her lover, her child, her own people, or even the familiar scenes that might have given her inarticulate consolation. The old trees about the old house would have waved their arms above her and murmured mysterious broodings over the mystery of despair. The very trees here were foreigners. On an impulse, she wrote a long letter to her mother, enclosed it in an unsealed envelope, and enclosed that in a sealed envelope addressed to Dr. Brethrick. After the letter was mailed, she wished she had never sent it. It could only carry dismay into her lonely mother's soul but it was as impossible to recall as a scream shot into the air. She imagined all consequences but the one that came about. The last of her money went to pay the doctor's bill, and she was a sick pauper. She resumed her menial work gradually, as her strength returned, but her distaste for it grew to loathing. The Reddicks, her employers, were kind to her, but they were master and mistress, and their own lives were hard. She was weak and woebegone at the very bottom of the cliff of life. She had never climbed very far, but she had fallen far enough to give both soul and body an almost fatal shock. She was ashamed of her past, and her future was as dismal as the desert, and as full of cactus. She was a drudge in a poor family, in a scorched settlement abandoned by all that could get away. The only inferiors she could see were a young widow named Dak and her five-year-old boy Terry. Mrs. Dack took in washing. During the winter, she was overworked. During the summer, she was undernourished. She did the heaviest laundry for the Reddicks, and when she called for it, she usually brought her boy along for lack of someone to leave him with. The child had the infantile genius for improving the world by imagination, and made a brilliant adventure of the errand. He owned a rickety express wagon left behind by some visitor child, and it gave Terry all the uplift of a fiery chariot. His mother would set the bundle of wash in the wagonette, and immediately it became a magnificent truck, an automobile, or an airship, and the boy a team of horses, a motor, or a winged aviator, as his whim pleased. His mother caught a little cheer from Terry's inexhaustible rapture, and Mem, seeing them move along the road to their shack, felt such pity for them that she gained a little dignity from the emotion, since pity is a downward-looking mood. Her sympathy was quickened, perhaps by the frustration of her own motherhood. Nature had begun to prepare her spirit as well as her flesh for maternal offices, and somewhere in oblivion was a half-completed little child doomed to perish before it was born. That tiny orphan wailed in the porches of Mem's heart, complaining that its destiny, begun in romantic shame, was ended in unromantic catastrophe. 
famished of love mem fed upon the widow's boy it hurt mem to see how sorry a future terry dack could expect the children of the indians were less unlucky because like the children of negroes they entered a world that made them no promises but every american white child has a chance at wealth and the presidency of the united states as his inalienable birthright yet terry dack began with no inheritance but handicaps he would have no opportunity in palm springs for anything but the humblest future he would grow up to a few scraps of public school education his father was already dead and his mother only half alive she had been a pretty thing once and she loved to tell mem of her life on a ranch near whitewater as a little girl she had owned her own horse and ridden it as a young sage hen she had been the belle of ranch picnics and parties she had married a glorious young cattleman whose father went broke because his herd of cattle was smothered in a sandstorm the son had soon after been torn to pieces by the teeth of a vicious horse he had tried to break to the saddle then all the joy and velocity had gone out of mrs dack's life and she had become the bent slave of a washboard her arms forever elbow deep in suds the boy terry was of the ariel breed his fancy girdled the earth in forty minutes the world was a stage to him an old boot as effective as cinderella's glass slipper the clothesline was a private telephone wire he mimicked birds and animals and often covered his mother with terror and amused chagrin by imitating her clients with uncanny skill he had an eye for mannerisms of walk or posture his vision owned a photographic detail his ear a phonographic skill for record and repetition ignorant and young as he was he could merely sketch the emphatic features of the people he cartooned but in the outline there was always a likeness that made his mother or mem cry out the name of the subject at once terry would usually preface his performance with a looky mamma this is the way old mrs reddick walks this is the way you do mamma this is what the old indian squaw does when she weaves baskets with her hands and uses her feet to work the rope that scares the birds from the fig trees this is the way mamma you wash clothes and wring em and hang em up to dry sometimes his mimicry was terrifying he would repeat things he had overheard in the street from careless men he would imitate some deviltry he had learned from an indian or mexican or american boy or girl or from the little devil that curls and fattens in every child's own heart as the worm in the apple his mother and mem would look at each other in the dismay that comes to grown-ups when they see the ignorance of babyhood vanishing like down from a peach they were afraid of what life in their wicked little world would do to their little idol terry would weep with vexation at an inattentive audience or at his inability to express what bubbled inside his little kettle of a chest he would weep when angered but at no other time pain grief disappointment terror loneliness would bring no tears no sobs once the child caught cold in all that heat and mem sat by his bedside through several smothering nights while the back-broken mother slept mem all alone in her vigil found that imagination was good company she constructed little plays she pretended that terry was her own baby and like him she enriched a sordid existence with the rich tapestries of pretense she had been forced to be a play actress for so long that the ordeal had become a pleasant habit a necessity she exercised her acquired skills in making up little dramas to while away the tedium of the long nights and to keep the wakeful child's mind from his cough among all the rich nights of human experience from the perfect night that socrates praised the more than royally luxurious nights of dreamless sleep to the glittering revelries of the trimalchian banquet no nights are more precious than those somber hours a mother spends at the bedside of a sick child it was during this long heartache that mem received the second letter that found her in palm springs this was from leva lemaire saying that she had just seen in an old paper a paragraph describing mrs woodville's fall from the mountain and her miraculous escape from death leva expressed the utmost sympathy and prayed that her beauty had not been marred she added but if it has you can still find something to do in the movies i've given up trying to be an actress and taken a position in the laboratory projection room 
correcting the films. It's cool and dark and interesting, and far better than that miserable oven. I think I can get you a place if you'll come up. Los Angeles is the only town in the world that's alive these days, and there's no excuse for a woman of your education and charm wasting her sweetness on the desert air. Do come. I've sent my three children out to their uncle's ranch. You could live here with me and my friends. The thought of working in the dark and the cool was a hint of paradise to Mem, but she would not leave Terry Dack while he was ill. Early one evening she went to the drug store to fill a prescription and found a stranger there sprawled across a showcase talking. His voice startled her, though it was so slow and lazy that the druggist found it almost a soporific. I've been out on the old Pikachu Mountain prospectin. I went over at once with an old partner o' mine, name of, well, I always called him Woodhead. He went batty on me, count of a water hole not having no water into it. Mem stood for a moment, petrified, all but her heart, which was scurrying like an alarm bell in a steeple. This was the man Bodlin she had talked to in Yuma. She had told him that her husband was alive and that she was going into the desert with him. He would recognize her the moment he saw her. He would ask about the husband he had so frankly envied. All her duplicity would be revealed. She would probably be stoned out of the village. End of chapter 24 Recording by Deanna Beauvais Chapter 25 of Souls for Sale this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Souls for Sale by Rupert Hughes. Chapter 25 Her chief dismay was her inability to get rid of the lie she had begun. She found it always ahead of her and about her with new demands, always behind her with new reminders. She stole out of the drug store with the prescription unfilled and, hastening down the street, asked a young Indian girl who came along to finish her errand for her. She waited in the shelter of a fat palm tree, ready to take flight if the Yuma man should come out and follow her. But he was evidently still telling the weary druggist his unsolicited experiences, for, after a time, the Indian girl returned, bringing the medicine, and explaining that her delay was due to the much palaver of a man who would not stop talking. On the way back to the Dak cottage, Mem thought fast. She had hidden herself in a tiny hamlet, the nearest thing to solitude. She had hidden herself in vain. The only other hope was to seek concealment in a crowd, as Tom Holby had suggested. And now coercion was added to the allurements of Los Angeles. She told Mrs. Dack and Mrs. Reddick that she had received a call to go to Los Angeles at once. Mrs. Reddick protested and pleaded with all the hospitality that is bestowed on a good servant, where servants of any sort are hard to get and keep. Mrs. Dack could only regret her departure, and her meek desolation of mien almost overcame Mem's resolution. The boy Terry was out of danger, but his arms around Mem's neck were withies she could hardly break. The soft hands, the dewy cheeks, the lonely eyes of the child were fetters cruelly tyrannous. The next morning Mem lugged her old suitcase to the starting point of the auto stage. It carried her and a few other passengers across a badlands, pallid as a convict's cheek and with the same unshaven look. At Whitewater she caught a train that sped her gradually into the vales of plenty, through leagues of citrus groves in flower and in fruit at once. Seeing orange blossoms abloom in leagues, she blushed to think that she had never worn them. She marveled at the alleys of green polka-dotted with golden oranges, with lemons and grapefruit hanging like gifts in tinseled Christmas trees. Long reaches of walnut groves went by in wheel spokes. The walnuts made the neatest and shapeliest of orchards. There were olives, almonds, roses blowing in red miles along the country roads. She was coming up into Eden. And eventually she reached the new Babel, which her father had denounced as the last capital of paganism. No city could be so wicked as her father and she had thought Los Angeles and be anything else. And Los Angeles was everything else. 
scanty as her resources were mem had to pay a taxicab to take her to leave his home it was the first taxicab she had ever ridden in and she was hysterical with fear as it shot and spun through streets so thick with traffic and so wild that this city's record of accidents had achieved supremacy in the world the driver mauled his gear so recklessly that the cap was incessantly snarling and spitting a very beast of prey yet mem was almost more afraid of the taxi meter as she watched it adding dimes to her fare at a spendthrift rate she was likely to be destroyed by bankruptcy if not by collision the street slid through a long long tunnel and then swooped up and away to sunset boulevard she loved the name then gradually into a domain of tiny houses with large gardens each of a luxuriance that struck mem as almost fantastic all of these people must be grand viziers the way they surrounded themselves with tropical splendors the spanish names of many of the streets made literature to her eye and she was dazed by the number of them she thought that los angeles must have extended its limits almost to san francisco san franciscans often made the same accusation suddenly the car swerved to the right and scooted up a little avenue of low houses not white only but pink or mauve or yellow with roofs of varicolored tile and awnings of gaudy stripe in a city so widespread and made up of so many small houses so far apart that when the man was at his work and the wife in the kitchen or shopping there was nobody visible she had the impression of los angeles that arthur summers roche expressed a million white houses and not a soul going in or coming out of one of them the cab jolted to a stop before a tiny palace of four or five rooms mem got down paid the pirate her ransom and toted her suitcase up to the quaint little door this was leva's home she had a palm tree a pepper tree a few truculent cactuses grass and a fountain along the walk stood a row of palms their trunks studded or lapped in many facets where leaf stalks had been cut off a gorgeous vine of bougainvillea was flung up over the cornice with the effect of a vast carnival shawl leva was not at home a servant who opened the door said that she would not get back from the studio before six or half past mem asked permission to wait knowing nowhere else to turn she studied the bright rooms as if they were chambers in fairyland she could hardly comprehend the patio and the walls of concrete she did not realize that she could almost have poked her thumb through them the garden built into the house the frail and many tinted furniture the photographs of famous paintings that she had never heard of the whole spirit of the place was foreign to mem it looked genie built the servant was glad to relieve her loneliness with chatter. She explained that Miss Lemaire lived there with three other ladies, all of them in the movies, and none of them getting their pictures took. They lived here with no more thought of chaperonage than a crowd of bachelors. Mem's greatest shock was the abrupt arrival in a world where the enjoyment of life was made its chief business. She had been brought up to believe in duty first, in self-denial, abstention, modesty, demurity simplicity meekness prayer remorse here people worship the sun flowers dancing speed hilarity laughter and love they worked hard but at the manufacture of pretty things of stories pictures paintings music to her there was an inconceivable recklessness of consequence they thought no more of respectable appearance than south sea islanders yet they seemed to be as happy as they tried to be they had their disappointments jealousies scandals gossips griefs and shames but so had the gray village people she had left these utopians had no winter in their climate or in their souls only a little rainy season a bit of chill when leva and her friends came in at dinner time they came like young businessmen home from offices tired of shop yet full of its talk eager for amusement knowing no law except their own self-respect for health or reputation or efficiency the first one in set a victrola to playing a jazz tune before she noticed mem the second one in joined the first in a dance they quarreled over a new step with laughing violence mem was aghast at their contempt for conventions they despised the puritans who abhorred them 
they snapped their fingers at appearances and regarded caution not as an evidence of decency but as a proof of hypocrisy they had in their time known all of mem's compunctions but had abandoned them one by one as a soldier throws off all baggage that hampers the freedom and range of his march as a swimmer in strong currents casts away everything that weighs including clothes she would learn that many of those who loved to break the rules of outward propriety were solid as white marble in their standards she had already learned at home that many of the most spotless exteriors are only whited sepulchres she would conform herself with trepidation at first and with much backsliding into respectability as she understood it but she would soon embrace the new paganism with desperation and finally with gaiety adapting herself like a beachcomber to the customs of a tribe of self-supporting women who compromised themselves so freely that the critic gave them up as hopeless one does not fret much over the unconventionalities of gypsies at first she supposed that all los angeles was hollywood but she would learn that to a large portion of the city's population the word hollywood was a synonym for riotous outlawry a plague spot a kind of spendthrift slums and in hollywood itself she would find a large old-fashioned village element dazed by its gypsies furthermore the city which her father had damned with such wholesale horror was nine-tenths composed of midwesterners like himself people who had brought their churches and churchliness with them there were hundreds of thousands of iowans missourians kansans there and they held picnics constantly enormous reunions which differed from the camp meetings and barbecues of the midwest only in the fact that the groves were not of maple and oak and hickory but of eucalyptus and palm and pepper whether mem had come to her ruination or her redemption she had come to a new world before she learned how freely with what masculine franchise these women conducted their lives before she could recoil from such perilous associations she was entrapped in their cordiality their vivacity their lavish kindness leva the third one home welcomed mem as if she were a returned prodigal sister instead of a passing acquaintance met in the desert she would listen to nothing but the unpacking of the suitcase and the acceptance of a little bed covered with a gaudy navajo blanket there were flowers at mem's plate in a lavish heap and a big basket of fruit was set in her room californians are prompt and frequent with gifts of flowers the other women came in variously one walked one drove her own car up into a garage just a little bigger than the car one was set down by a big studio touring car that delivered its passengers of nights and gathered them up again of mornings for los angeles is a city of maleficent distances every place is a sabbath day's journey from every place else and there is no sabbath at least no legal sabbath yet the people seem to be extraordinarily good and kindly they seem to get the sun into their lives their hearts felt as big and golden and juicy as their own oranges even the lemons had a sweeter acridity than at home at home california fruit had been a byword for bigness high color and insipidity of taste something a little better than dead sea fruit the smaller plainer native apples pears and peaches had possessed a better flavor but california fruit had reached calverly after a long dark journey and it was eaten in a foreign air out here however where the oranges could be lifted warm from the tree the figs sliced fresh for breakfast the peaches stripped of their downy silk while their wine was new there was no lapse from the joyous promise of their advertisement if the sunlight was of a gold refined and somehow enriched the shadow was also of a deeper cool just inside its edge the sun was walled out the first builders had not known this they had set above their houses the roofs of wintry climates and one might still see in older los angeles obsolete homes whose slanting shingles were excellently arranged to let the snow slide off since there was no snow to slide they served as furnaces for the hot sun next came the low roof with the wide flat eaves casting a heavy shade about the windows but this made the houses chilly and the new school brought the tiles just to the brim of the walls and these walls were not often glaring white as before but brown dove gray salmon shrimp olive 
where the shadows lay along the lawns or the walks they were of unusual design not dapplings of rounded leaves as in the midwest but the long scissored slashes of palm fronds the thready reeds of papyrus the pepper's delicate flounces even in this eden however there was distress anxiety the hard times that were freezing the outer world were threatening the raging prosperity of los angeles studios were closing overnight supposed millionaires were departing abruptly in search of funds to meet their payrolls stars who had been collecting ten thousand dollars a week or less were left stranded in the midst of unfinished pictures and unfinished mortgages and jewelry bills the lesser fry were being cast ashore in heaps like minnows after a tidal wave's recession the girls at leva's were wondering how long their jobs would last a mere cut in salary would be a welcome mercy a respite from a death sentence this was devastating news to mem for she had landed on this tropical isle in the expectation of at least a breadfruit tree her blanched face told her story to leva who held out more hope than she inly entertained never say die mrs woodville she said there's always a chance the companies are turning off their oldest most experienced people in droves but every now and then they take in a newcomer i'll speak to the laboratory chief anyway your board and lodging won't cost you anything as long as we've got either here eh girls the girls agreed their adventurous spirit included a reckless hospitality and they put off care till tomorrow in the hope that it would never come after the dinner the victrola was set whirring again and mem was invited to forget her troubles in a fox trot she gasped at this she had never learned even a lamb trot her father's church did not permit dancing and while it overlooked the sin in certain of its parishioners there would have been scandal indeed if the parson's daughter had ever lifted her foot in aught save solemnity but mem was not allowed to explain she was dragged from her chair and forced to copy the steps set before her it would have been impossibly priggish and insulting for her to plead religious scruples and she put her best foot foremost the dance mood was innate and she had a natural grace of rhythm that had languished unheeded the steps were simple and their combination at the whim of the dancer who led mem was soon whirling about the room with more or less awkwardness which only made for laughter and with a swimming intoxication that left her panting and dizzy but strangely foolishly happy she had learned a new alphabet of expression she misspelled the words and jumbled the syntax but she was getting along somehow on a new planet when three or four men drove up in a car and invaded the house with invitations to a dance at the hollywood hotel mem declined of course her refusal was ignored as of no importance it's thursday night said leva and it's our religious duty to show up at the hollywood everybody's there you might meet somebody who'd give you a job mem begged to be excused she could not dance and she was very tired that's when you're at your best cried leva who was an entirely other woman from the shrouded arabian that mem had met at palm springs while mem protested leva motioned one of the men a young actor to make her dance in spite of her struggles she was snatched from her chair into the arms of this fawn whose manly beauty was his stock in trade it was the first time any man except her father and her brothers had embraced mem since elwood farnaby had thrilled her with his love she did not count the brief duel with tom holby in palm canyon since he had made no effort to overwhelm her resistance but this laughing satyr mr creighton held her tight and compelled her to dance giddy with the whirl and sullen with the outrage mem's anger blazed into open disgust creighton said he was horribly sorry and only meant it in fun and by his abject contrition made mem ashamed of herself she did not know what to do or say this was her first experience of the confusion that comes from being too respectable on a holiday to escape from the scene of her killjoy boorishness as it looked to her now she went out into the moonlit patio the moon seemed to make life simpler it has a way of blotting the material details with dumb shadow and spreading a love light over dreamy surfaces from a house somewhere near and drowned in foliage came a music of guitar and ukulele and young voices an automobile went by trailing laughter in a glittering scarf over her head a palm tree waved an aromatic fan as over a daughter of pharaoh along the northern sky the mountains were aligned 
built of some soft tinted cloudiness as if they were a wall decreed between this xanadu of all delights and the harsh respectable realms of the east a barrier between the woeful lands of shagbark and mock orange and this garden of almond trees and roses in a radiance so amorous that it seemed almost to coo mem felt that the great needs of her soul were love tenderness rapture this yearning was divine in this light in the bright lexicon of the moon there was no such word as don't everything wooed everything in mem's downcast eyes her bosom was silvered with the glamour and gathered into the same thought that mused upon wall and flower and tree upon the deeps of the sky and upon the nearest vine leaf a quake with the ecstasy of being alive at night the air was imbued with a luscious fragrance that delighted her nostrils and drew her eyes to an orange tree almost a perfect globe in symmetry and curiously forming a little universe whose support was lost in the gloom beneath in the round night of its own sky hung moons exhaling perfume and temptation like another eve she yielded to the cosmic urge and put her hand forth to the tree of knowledge plucked the fruit that was not hers and made it hers she did not peel the cloth of gold and divide the pulp but as she has seen these californians do buried her teeth in the ready flesh tore out a hole and drained the syrup she was too well schooled in biblical lore not to think of eve there was however no adam for her to involve in her fall so she took the whole fruit for herself but then instead of feeling shame as the scales fell from her eyes shame itself fell from her and she laughed eve had become lilith for the moment she felt in her heart that there was something wrong here in this new life but then there had been so much wrong in the life she had led before this was a city of peril but she had not escaped peril at home she breathed deep of the new freedom she cast off her past resolved to bend her head and her back no longer under remorse but to stand erect to run and dance and to be beautiful and rich and famous like eve she felt that the first necessity of her new era was clothes if she had had any she would have called a taxicab and dashed away to the hollywood hotel she felt that she could dance with anybody or with nobody she could be salome and dance herself into half a kingdom dance everybody's head off including her own but it has been so arranged that whenever a woman is set on fire with a high resolution to do some glorious thing an elbow demon always brings her back to the dust by whispering you have nothing fit to wear otherwise the conquest of the world would not have been left to blundering hesitant males mem went into the house the moon was all very well for beautiful moods but it was impracticable it did not provide the wardrobe for the deeds it inspired she went into the house like a prisoner granted a little exercise in a walled yard then driven back to her cell she was awake in her perplexities when leva and her friends came home the young men raided the ice-box then went their way leva was so drowsy that she could hardly get her hair down but she sat on the edge of mem's bed and discussed the future leva advised new duds by all means and offered to have them charged to her own account until mem could find a job and begin to pay it was harrowing to mem to think that she must take on a burden of large debt before she could hope for small wages but the need was imperative the next morning mem acquired on tick the brief trousseau of a little business bride then she went to the studio with leva and was assigned without delay to the laboratory projection room at twenty-five dollars a week a hundred pretty actresses got no jobs at all for they were seeking glory and wealth the size of the studio astounded mem it was a vast factory this company's assets were thirteen million dollars its last year's gross income eight millions in a score of years a toy unknown before had become the fifth largest industry in the world a mammoth target for every sort of critic and now mem had entered the machine shop if not the art end of chapter twenty five recording by deanna beauvais chapter twenty six of souls for sale this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Souls for Sale by Rupert Hughes. 
Chapter Twenty Six. All day she sat in a dark room and ran a little projecting machine that poured forth moving pictures before her on a little private screen. She must watch out for typographical errors, a two, T-O, for a two, T-O-O, a slip of grammar, a mistake in an actor's or a character's name. Her common school education was good enough for this, though it was by no means so marvelous as Leva had told her employers it was. Later, Mem was permitted to study the films for blemishes, scratches, dust specks, bad printing, bad tinting, bad assembly, bad any one of a score of things. There were five other young women besides Leva engaged at the same task, each with her little projection machine and her little screen and her little picture racing ahead of her past the continual night of the laboratory. At one end of the projection room was a larger screen for the laboratory chief, a learned scientist, and his assistants and occasional directors who came with problems of photography requiring immediate solution. The conversation was in a foreign language to Mem, but the jargon grew gradually familiar and she kept an eager ear alert for information. She decided to master the trade in every detail. It was fascinating at first, a strange and fairy business. Like a chorus of girls at spinning wheels, these maids sat and unrolled from the magic distaff romance unending and of infinite variety. Mem was supposed to keep her mind on her own screen, but it was impossible not to glance at the other pictures. Now there was a glittering flood of waters roaring almost audibly through a canyon, and in them a spun and tormented canoe that finally flung into the waves a fugitive woman and cast her on the rocks. Someone told her that so great an actress as Mary Alden had spent thirty minutes in those icy waters while they photographed the scene. This went by again and again in different takes, by different cameras, as if Miss Alden had been killed and brought to life again repeatedly to respond to encores of death. Over against this tremendous rush of nature, there appeared suddenly a yet more thrilling cataract of human passions, a battle in a Chinese den where frenzied criminals, Chinese and half-castes and policemen, struck and stabbed and shot and broke over one another's heads furniture of exquisite carving or hurtled from ornate balconies and splintered embroidered screens and jeweled idols lon cheney leered and bled and let demoniac thoughts flicker across his mask parallel with this flowed a torrent of luxury a reception in a home of wealth designed by cedric gibbons lover of arches and interlaced perspectives Beautiful women in gleaming dresses danced, or listened to love stories, or let tears drip like diamonds upon their fans of white peacock feathers. A vast mountain range shouldered the clouds aside, and a posse of vigilantes chased a pack of desperados on desperate horses, or desperados chased Tom Mix as a fugitive hero who sent his bronco leaping, sliding, galloping down cliffs and up ravines, a swallow darting away from falcons. In a close-up of huge detail, Will Rogers' whimsical face twisted with cowboy impudence and embarrassment and pathetic wit. In another, the cinematographic features of Helene Chadwick exploited her subtlest moods in a language that could not be misunderstood, or Claude Gillingwater's Jovian brows struggled with big emotions, or Richard Dix's stalwart humor flourished. He was whisked away, and a low comedian took his place with high antics of most ancient glory, the horseplay that the new critics have always denounced, and the classics have always adored, the knockabout assaults on dignity, the physical satires on pomposity, that delighted Scheles no less than Aristophanes, Cervantes, Shakespeare, Goethe, all the big men who were not afraid of fun and understood that there is less wisdom in a strut than in a caper. Then the sensitive beauty of Colleen Moore rolled by tremulous to every least emotion as an aspen leaf. Before all these windows, Mem looked into countless phases of life and emotion and character. It occurred to her that she was getting a divine purview of the world. Life to her looked much what life must look like to God. He must see billions of souls unrolling their continuities before him in all varieties of grimace, frenzy, collapse, appeal for pity or laughter. Humanity must dance before him as before her, until each life was cut off or vanished in its final fade-out. 
she wondered more and more why the moving pictures should have been greeted with hostility and contempt or fear she did not understand that they who teach the world a new language or open a new world or bring golden gifts of any sort to the people are always crucified at first by the pharisees later their converts become pharisees for new messiahs she was ignorant of the primeval eternal habit of the critic mind to lash out at all that is alive and eager why lash the dead they cannot feel the sting of the whip she knew only that the moving pictures were abhorrent to multitudes and it seemed to her pitiful that this should be so all these actors and actresses and photographers were merely trying to illuminate life to pass dull hours away to quicken the spirits of the lonely and the weary the artistic beauties of the pictures made her inarticulately happy she knew nothing of painting or sculpture or architecture she loved sunsets and moon dawns and light on leaves and the textures of fabrics embracing shadows in their folds she loved the war of gloom and glow she found the pictures overwhelmingly beautiful to her eyes kaleidoscopes of leaping masses and lines symphonic tempests of shape and color for a time mem was in a heaven of tumultuous ecstasies but gradually the delight turned to torture the torture of envy she was young and she had been told that she was beautiful she had realized with shame and anger and disgust at first that she seized the eye and charmed it now as in almost every other way she was so revolutionized that what had hitherto seemed to her odious was beginning to seem admirable what had been her evil was her good and her good her evil if god made her pretty it was because he delighted in beauty and wanted it known he did not grow flowers in cellars he was not afraid to squander the sunshine if the art of mimicry was a god-given gift it must be meant for use she had acted once before a camera there in the desert she had felt the possession of an alien agony she had shot tears from her eyelids she had brought tears to the eyes of strangers she had tasted the sweet poison of vicarious suffering it was accounted divine on a cross why diabolic on a screen she was an actress by divine intention she sat in a dark room and watched other people's pictures flow by it seemed wrong wicked cruel yet she was educating herself unconsciously in the complex techniques of acting learning dramatic analysis and synthesis fools who knew nothing about acting spoke of it as if it had no intellectual element they thought that the common enough ability to write impudent scurrilities about the brainlessness of actors was a proof of brains mem came to see how difficult a science how bewildering an art the mimetic career requires she would learn the anguishes of self-control and self-compulsion that must be undergone when the actor's soul squeezes itself into the mold of another character she could already see how many ways there were of thinking holding hands of looking love or hate of kissing crying laughing rising up and sitting down she was mad to act end of chapter 26 recording by diana bovey Chapter Twenty Seven of Souls for Sale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Souls for Sale by Rupert Hughes. Chapter Twenty Seven. Among the processions of types that marched past Mem's eyes as she sat at her magic window in the projection room, among the innumerable American types good and bad rich poor foreign native rural urban the aliens of every clime and age and costume the animals and the birds the plunging horses of the cowboys the lions the wolves the rattlesnakes went many children in rags and tags and velvet gowns she saw booth tarkington's edgar family and the other tiny artists of the colony exquisite lucille rickson the essence of boyhood johnny jones the plump buddy messenger the adorable robert de vilbus she saw at the movie houses the little master of comedy wesley berry with his skin a constellation of freckles and the all-conquering jackie coogan 
On the lot she saw the children, and they were always happy. The mothers were with the little ones. Going to work was going to play. They lived an eternal fairy story. They did not have to wait till bedtime to coax a worn-out fable from a jaded parent. They went through great adventures in magic-built castles. They had an infinite number of new toys and new games, and, greatest bliss of all, they had importance. Mem was told that five-year-old Jackie Coogan had made his mother a present of a big touring car, costing seven thousand dollars that he had a salary of seventeen hundred and fifty dollars a week she thought of little terry dack in his second-hand express wagon helping his mother to pack her bundled wash home to bitter toil he had a dismal life on the desert's edge illumined only by his own unconquerable fancy and his dramatic gifts his was the home life of multitudes of american children he had far more of a mother's love than most of them yet the stage child and the movie child were spoken of with pity mem decided that it was well worth the child's while to accept such pity as a rebate on the fat blessings of such a life she wrote terry's mother urging her to come to los angeles without delay to beg borrow or steal the necessary funds to seize the chance to rescue the divine child from poverty and oblivion and to earn luxury by giving the world the sunshine of his irresistible charm she had not meant to let anyone in palm springs know where she was but she took the risk of embarrassment rather than risk the boy's future her motherhood had transplanted itself to that other child and his welfare was vital to her as a final inducement she promised to introduce terry to the management of her own studio she permitted the impression that she was a rather important person on the staff and the day after she mailed the letter she lost her job the tide of hard times had engulfed the studio where she was engaged all but two or three companies were laid off the laboratory force was reduced to a skeleton she went home one night and did not come back and now the dark room that had come to be a prison cell was as dear a home as the shut cage of a canary that cannot get in again she was homesick for the many windowed gloom for the black wet chambers with the big vats of soup where the endless tapes of minute pictures were developed the lurid red rooms where the printing machines chattered the drying rooms where the vast mill wheels revolved with their cascades of film the gates of the lot were closed against her as the gates of eden against eve there was no pleasure in lying abed of mornings there was no comfort in omitting the stampede to beat the time clock the payday came around no more either she had debts to absolve for clothes no longer fresh she had tomorrow's and next week's hunger to dread the girls at her house were equally idle and their hospitality lost its warmth for lack of fuel they tried to make the best of idleness they wore the records to shreds and danced together all day long to pass the time away young men who had no money to spend on excursions came to the house of evenings and helped to dance away the tedium it became a commonplace for men to jig about in young men's arms she learned to dance she learned to play a little golf a little tennis she even gained a bit of familiarity with the saddle at the home of an actress who owned horses and had built a riding ring on her estate when she was flush and was glad now to have her friends exercise themselves and her stable mem went also on her first beach picnic if she did not learn to swim she learned at least to add the paganism of the ocean to the paganism of the canyons the deserts and the palm-blown plains the pacific coast civilization surpassed all the other coasts in its return to the pre-fig leaf days on the leagues of sand variously named coronado la jolla laguna redondo hermosa santa monica there was as much carefree close-free gaiety as in the marquesan and tahitian realms that frederick o'brien found or made so elysian with his fragrant pen the first day of mem's visit to the shore was terrifying as the automobile in which she rode threaded the long and narrow lane of venice a woman darted across the path dragging a child by the arm mem thought at first that the mother must be fleeing from a fire that has surprised her in her tub and that in her confusion 
she had put on her husband's undershirt and nothing else. But hundreds of others were seen hurrying from that same fire in much the same costume. The girl she was with parked the car in a little blind alley, ending at the walk along the sand. Mem had come at last to where the mountains meet the sea. The blinding blue desert of the Pacific, almost as calm as the sky it met and welded with, the twin blues overwhelmed Mem for a moment with vastitude. Then she caught sight of the margin where the waves broke lazily in long corkscrewing lines of green fringed with white froth. Among the billows and in front of them, swarming human midges leaped, swam, ran, walked, squatted, burrowed, flirted, lunched, nursed babies, slept. The sand was abloom with umbrellas, a monstrous poppy field. Along the endless walk, miles on miles of little shops were aligned, with piers thrusting out into the ocean, bridges that led nowhere, and were loaded down with pleasure shops. Giant wheels, insane railroads that made a sport of seasick terrors, every ingenuity for making happy fools of the mob bent on unbending. As far as the eye could see along the vast scythe blade of shore, thousands seethed, all so lightly garbed that if Mem had met any one of them, in Calverly she would have fainted or fled. She was stunned. But the enormity of the multitude gave the exposure an impersonal aspect. It was like looking into a can of fishing worms, wriggling, unclothed in anything but a light nuptial band of color. As she stood benumbed, Leva nudged her and said, Hurry up, we mustn't miss a minute. Am I expected to go in there like that? Of course. Not me, not today, no thank you. She could not be persuaded. She hardly consented to sit on the sand and wait. While she waited, her eyes were whipped with such sights that she was anesthetized by shock. Fat mothers, fat fathers, scrawny matrons, and skeletonic elders paraded among infants and boys and girls in all stages of growth, and none of them was decently clothed, according to any standard Mem knew. Here and there Apollos and Aphrodites moved in perfection of design and rhythm, their beauty and their grace appallingly revealed. Mem bent her head, averted her eyes, felt sick at the stomach, but the coercion of the throng was more potent than any other influence. She began to think herself a ninny to be the only one out of step with this army. She compelled herself to look without flinching, and she hoped without curiosity. By and by the sanity, the beauty, the higher morality of it, began to convert her from the immemorial folly of making a virtue out of a physical hypocrisy. The world had come a long distance from the period when a law was passed in Virginia in 1824, making it a misdemeanor to take a bath in private, except upon the advice of physicians, which advice was usually against such a dangerous practice. The world had come a long distance from the ideal of wearing one's grave clothes and one's grave expression while still walking about the earth. There were still loud howlers and sincere pleaders against the infamy of letting other people see one's epidermis, against letting mankind know that womankind was biped. But the dear old ladies and gentlemen with their brooms could not sweep back this oceanic tide. Here and there they arrested or mobbed some woman or man who took off an inch or two too much of the mysteriously permitted, ever-varying minimum. But millions bathed in public and sought the fountain of youth, not in dark forests, but on the sun-gilt ground where sea and land debated boundaries. By the time Leva and her company came leaping out to join the revel, Mem was a little better. Seeing her friends, whose good sweet soul she loved, was a fresh shock, but she survived it and envied them their ability to fling off their solemnities with their other garments. Before the afternoon had slipped into twilight, she was able to laugh when she saw them playing ball with sunburnt young men of their acquaintance. When they gathered about her and sat in a crisscross of brown and white legs, she had to reconcile herself to South Sea standards. The sky was too bright to stare at all the time. They ate peanuts and popcorn, 
and introduced her to that wonderful meal composed of a roll split open like a clam and stuffed with cleft sausage dill pickle lettuce and mustard a vined so irresistibly good that it lent a grace to its shameless name hot dog a few days later mem might have been seen in a bathing suit of popular brevity substituting a general coat of tan for the forty blush power she had abandoned she was not sure whether to call herself a lost or a new-found soul but she was sure that she was an utter changeling from the remorseful girl who stole shamefast out of calverly to hide herself from human eyes she was already publishing her bodily graces to the world and she was devoured with ambition to give her soul also entire to the millions she wanted to attitudinize her soul upon a film as public and as huge as the sky and compel mankind to watch it and admire mem in a way was an allegory of all recent womanhood she had dwelt in puritanical respectability as in a kind of mental harem with the ashmock on her demure mind and a shapeless black robe of modesty over her bundlesome clothes her thoughts had been her father's to direct until he should guide them into a husband's fold something had gone wrong her thoughts had contained black sheep that strayed and fell into the dark ravines but now she was out of it all joining the vast hegira of humanity from the dark ages of ritual and ceremonial and uniform into the new era of all things good in their place and concealment of the truth the one irretrievable evil her soul and her body were her own now no they had gone beyond even that her soul and body were the public's beauty was community property she was committed to their fullest development into such joyous acrobatic agility and power that they should give joy and a delightful sorrow to the public for which the grateful public would pay with gratitude and fame and much money end of chapter 27 recording by diana bove chapter 28 of souls for sale this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Souls for Sale by Rupert Hughes. Chapter 28. In swimming, dancing, mountain climbing, horseback climbing, motoring, singing, laughing, days and nights reeled by. But gaiety, as an ether against the pangs of idleness, was a heavy and almost nauseous drug she looked back on her earlier existence at home as a slothful indolence at best a waste of gifts a burying of genius in a napkin and the napkin in the ground where it must rot yet never lift a flower from its corruption to be busy to achieve to build her soul and sell it that was her new passion she gave up all thought of going home to calverly she would never be content with village life again one day she loitered through westlake park and watched the visitors feed the wild fowl that grow tame there the man or child who had bread crumbs for largesse was almost mobbed overhead the chuckling seagulls made a living umbrella careening and dipping to hook the morsels tossed in air from every quarter birds of various pinion gathered swerved darted flung backward on wings that were both brake and motor about the feet others scampered or stalked pecking gobbling on the nearer ripples ducks terns and geese moved like little ferry boats coots scooted and swans black and white thrust up their periscopes from the reedy banks where they moored mem loafed about until she grew too weary to stand her despondent soul drifted as lazily as the swans and felt almost as willing to beg for bread she sat down on a bench on the seventh street side and by and by was hailed by a sturdy midwestern voice well as i live and breathe if it ain't miss steddon why how do you do mrs sturgis it was a mid-aged woman who had been a member of her father's church and had gone west mem had now to say come west because of her husband's lungs mem's first impulse was to welcome anyone from home her second was to fear anyone from home but mrs sturgis was already squeezing her broad person into the remaining space on the bench 
Her life in this Babylon had not changed her small-town soul, body, or prejudices. Mem's wits scurried in vain to bring up protecting lies. Mrs. Sturges was too full of her own opinions and adventures to ask any embarrassing questions beyond a hasty take-off for her own biography. "'And how's your father and your mother and your whole family?' all well i hope and so you're here well 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 as i was saying yesterday everybody on earth gets to los angeles sooner or later it's a nice city too full of good honest plain of course those awful moving picture people have given the town a but there's plenty of real nice folksy folks here and the town growing faster than well as i was telling my husband last week it takes all kinds to make a world and the lord may have had some idea of his own when he made movies of course i enjoy seeing em you just can't help enjoying the terrible but the people that make em well such stories as they do tell about there why that hollywood is just a plague spot on the earth the gentleman we used to rent from we own our own home now or will soon when a few more installments are and the price is here my dear oh dear but he said that friends of his who had rented their homes to movie people why would you believe it some of those cowboys one day on the ranch next day earning a thousand dollars uh and buying jewelry on credit wristwatches with split diamonds for crystals and they rent a nice house and ride a horse in the dining room and shoot the china right off the it's a fact and some the women little pink ninnies that don't know enough to come in when it they get fortunes for just making eyes at the camera and they rent nice respectable homes and hold well orgies is the only word orgies is just what they are it's a sin and a shame and if something isn't done about it why young girls flock there in droves and sell their souls and bodies for it's simply terrible a gentleman who claims to know was telling my husband and he told me that there isn't one decent woman on the screen not one would you believe it every one of them has to pay the price to get there at all he says to my husband that it's the regular thing before a girl is engaged she has to those directors why any pretty girl who is willing to lose her immortal soul can get a chance if she'll only and if she won't why they turn her away i declare it makes my blood run cold just to don't it yours i don't believe it said mem she had heard a vast amount of gossip but she had not heard of anybody paying such an initiation fee she had seen a great deal of joy and some of it reckless but with a childish recklessness she had seen no vice at all mrs sturgis flared up there is nothing one defends more zealously than one's pet horrors don't believe it well that's only because you're so innocent yourself speaks well for your bringing up so strict and all you naturally wouldn't believe folks could be so depraved but if you've heard what i've why it's true as gospel my husband had it from a man who knows whereof he speaks they sell their souls for bread and as the bible says their feet lay hold on well you know any girl that's too honest to pay the price don't get engaged that's all she just don't get engaged of course there may be some decent ones old ladies that play homely parts and but if a young girl wants to succeed in that business she's just got to oh dear that's my car there's not another one for half an they run out to our place only every good-bye i hope to see you again soon wait hey hey and she was gone into the infinite purlieus of los angeles she caught her car and it slid off going banging and bunted a passing automobile out of the way with much crumpling of the fender and the vocabulary of the driver but no fatality which was unusual mem did not regret the abrupt departure of mrs sturgis she was glad of the woman's breathless garrulity it had not only left her with her secrets intact but it had given her a hint mrs sturgis had substituted faith for facts and had spoken with that earnestness which is more convincing than evidence mem accused herself of blindness instead of charging mrs sturgis with scandal she felt that the alleged wickedness had escaped her notice because she was too stupid to recognize it but mrs sturgis's accusations had the same perverse effects as her father's jeremiads his sermon had made her long to see los angeles mrs sturgis 
had suggested an answer to her own riddle. She wanted to act. She was determined to act. She needed money. She must have money. It had never occurred to her that a pretty woman is merchandise. She had given herself away once, and now she found that there was a market ready and waiting, with cash and opportunity as the price. She had wares for this market. She could barter them for fame and future. Since she could, she would. She sat on the bench and noted with a new interest that some of the men who passed her and stared at her had question marks in their eyes. Up to now she had shuddered at the vague posing of this eternal interrogation. She had not taken it as a tribute of praise or as an appeal for mercy, but as a degrading insult. Now she thought of it as a kind of sly appraisal, a system of silent bidding, auctioneering without words, the never-closed stock market of romance and intrigue. These men, who swept their eyes across Mem's face and tacitly murmured, Well, had nothing to offer but a little sin or a little coin. She had no notion of the rates. She wanted none of their caresses or their dark purposes. She wanted the light of glory, opportunity, so much fame for so much shame. She grew grim as she meditated. The price was only a vague phrase, but she was ready to pay it, whatever it was, but to whom? She brooded a long while before she thought of a shop to visit. She smiled sardonically as she remembered the woman's exchange at home where women sold what they made, painted china, hammered brass, knit goods, cakes and candies. Well, she would sell what God had made of her for what man might make of her. At the studio, she had met the casting director one day when the commissary was crowded with stars in their painted faces and gaudy robes and with extra people portraying turks japanese farmers ranchers ballet dancers society women mexicans he had been introduced to her as mr arthur teary when he asked if he might take the vacant seat at the table where she sat with leva and another girl he was an amiable and laughing person with an inoffensive gift of flattery when he learned that all the girls worked in the laboratory projection room, he had exclaimed, Why waste yourselves in that coal cellar? I'll put you all in the next picture. The others had not taken him seriously. Indeed, they had no ambition to be photographed. Mem had often wondered at the numbers of pretty women she knew who had no desire to have their pictures published. It balanced somewhat the horde of unpretty women who had a passion for the camera. After the lunch, she had learned who Mr. Teary was and what the duties were of a casting director. It was he who said this one or that one, here is a part, play it, and the company will give you so much a week. He was the St. Peter of the movie Heaven, empowered to admit or to deny. He was the man for her to seek. He had seemed a decent enough man, and he had looked at men without insolence, but you could never tell. Mrs. Sturgis had it on the best authority that the only way to success in the movies was the easiest way. Mem took a street car home. She was glad to find the house empty. Leva and the others were out on a canyon hike, dressed in high boots and riding breeches, and braving the perils of rattlesnakes, as well as the frightful men, who lurked in the thickets or who sprang out of motors and kidnapped women every now and then. Mem pondered the costume appropriate to her new errand. She was going to lure Lucifer, and she was afraid that he would be too sophisticated for her, but her problem was solved for her by its simplicity. She had only one very pretty gown, so she put that on. She studied herself a long while in the mirror, since her eyes and her smile must be her chief wardrobe, her siren equipment. She practiced such expressions as she supposed to represent invitation. They were silly, and they made her rather ill. The face in her glass was so ashen and so miserable that she borrowed some of Leva's warmest face powder and smeared her mouth crudely with the red lipstick. It was a long journey to the studio, with three transfers of streetcar. She reached the lot late in the afternoon, just before the companies were dismissed and the department forces released. The gatekeepers knew her, smiled at her, and let her in. She went to the casting director's office and found him idly swapping stories with his assistant. He spoke to her courteously, and when she asked if she might see him a moment, he motioned her into his office, gave her a chair, 
closed the door and took his own place behind his desk. The telephone rang. He called into it. Sorry, Miss Waite, that part has been filled. The company couldn't make your salary. I begged you to take the cut, but you wouldn't. Times are hard, and you'd better listen to reason. You'd have had four weeks of good money, and now you'll walk. Take my advice next time, old dear, and don't haggle over salary. All right. Sorry. Goodbye. He turned to Mem and started to speak. The telephone jingled. He had a parley with a director who could not see a certain actor whom Mr. Terry was urging as the ideal for the type. They debated the man as if he had been a racehorse or a trained animal. Terry spoke of him as a gentleman who could wear clothes and look the part. He had been miscast in his last picture. He was willing to take three hundred a week off his salary because his wife was in the hospital and one of his daughters was going away to boarding school. Another telephone call. An agent, evidently, for Terry said, We took a test of Miss Glover. She's terrible. Her mouth is repulsive. Her teeth ought to be straightened. Her eyes are of the blue that photographs like dishwater. We can't use her. Don't tell her that, of course. Tell her we're not certain about the picture. We may not do it for months. Give the poor thing a good story. This was a discouraging background for Mem's siren scenario. But she was determined to carry out her theory. Mr. Terry's eyes looked her way now and then as he listened to what was coming in through the wire. When he looked away, Mem, in all self-loathing, adjusted herself in her big chair to what she imagined was a Cleopatran sinuosity. She thought of her best lines, secretly twitched up her skirts, and thrust her ankles well into view. She turned upon Mr. Terry, her most languishing eyes, and tried to pour enticement into them as into bowls of fire. She pursed her lips and set them full. She widened her breast with deep sighs. Terry seemed to recognize that she was deploying herself. He grew a little uneasy. Before he finished the telephone talk, his assistant came in to say that another of the directors had decided to call a big ballroom scene the next day, and fifty ladies and gentlemen must be secured at once. He wants real swells, too, the assistant said. He says the last bunch of muckers queered the whole picture. Terry groaned and said, Get busy on the other wire. He took up his telephone again, used it as a long antenna, and felt through the city for various extra people. He advised several actors and actresses to lay aside their pride and take the real money rather than starve. His patience, his altruistic enthusiasm for the welfare of these invisible persons, touched Mem with admiration. She could not see where or when this Samaritan could find time or inclination to play the satire. He was a bit fagged when he finished his last charge upon the individuals and the agencies, but he was as polite to Mem as if she had been Robina Teal. What can I do for you? I want a chance to act. What's your line? Anything. Anything is nothing. What experience have you had? Mem had not come here to offer her past, but her future. She was suddenly confronted with the fact that all actors must offer themselves for sale. Not the pretty women only, but the old men, too, and the character women. Actors are much abused for talking of themselves. Few of them do when business is not involved but when it is, they must discuss the goods they are trying to sell. Shoe merchants talk shoes, railroad presidents railroads, politicians politics, clergymen salvation. Each salesman must recommend his own stock and talk it up. So Mem had to grope for experience and dress her window with it, and she had had so little she lied a little, as one does who tries to sell anything. I was with the company that Tom Holby and Robina Teal played in. I took the part of an Arabian woman. Mr. Folger, the director, or praised my work. Well, he knows, said Terry, but he's not with us, you know. Have we your name and address and a photograph outside in our files? No. Well, if you'll give them to Mr. Dobbs, with your height, weight, color of eyes and hair, and experience, we'll let you know when anything occurs. Everything's full just now, and we're doing almost nothing, you know. He was already implying that the interview was ended. She broke out zealously. 
But I've got to have a chance. I'll do anything, she pleaded. He looked sad, but rose and shook his head. I'm sorry, my dear. I can't give you jobs when there aren't any now, can I? I'll introduce you to Mr. Dobbs, and he— He moved toward the door to escape from the cruelty of his office, but a frenzy moved her to seize his arm in a fierce clutch. She tried to play the vampire, as she had seen the part enacted on the screen by various slithy toves. She drew her victim close to her, pressed tight against him, and poured upward into his eyes all the venom of an amorous basilisk. I'll pay the price. I know what it costs to succeed, and I'm willing to pay. I'll do anything you say. Be anything to you. You can't refuse me. She could hardly believe her own ears, hearing her own voice though her pride in the acting she was doing lifted her from the disgust for the role. He looked at her without surprise, without horror, without even amusement, but also without a hint of surrender. His only mood was one of jaded pity. You poor child, who's been filling your head with that stuff? Are you really trying to vamp me? The crass word angered her. I'm trying to force my way to my career, and I don't care what it costs. Terry's sarcastic smile faded. Sit down a minute and listen to me. A little common sense ought to have told you that what you've been told is all rot. But suppose it wasn't. Suppose I were willing to give a job to every pretty girl who came in here and tried to bribe me with love. Do you know how many women I see a day? a hundred and fifty on some days that's nearly a thousand a week i happen to have a wife and a couple of kids and i like em pretty well at that but suppose i were king solomon and brigham young and the sultan of turkey all in one a hundred and fifty a day really you know you flatter me i won't ask you how i could do any office work or how long my health would last but how long do you suppose my job would last if I gave positions in return for favors. And if you won me over, you'd still have to please the director and the managers and the author and the public. How long would our company keep going if we selected our actresses according to their immorality? It's none of my business what your character is, off the lot, except that your character will photograph and a girl can't last long who plays Pollyanna on the screen and polygamy outside. Just suppose I gave you a job for the price you want to pay and collected my commission, and then the director refused to accept you or fired you after the first day's test. What guarantee could I give you that you could hold the job once I recommended you for it? And what would the rest of the women on the lot and off it do if such a business system were installed here? What would the police do to us? There's a lot of bad gals in this business, and there's a lot in every other business and in no business. But put this down in your little book, my dear. There's just one way to succeed on the screen, and that is to deliver the goods to the public. The danger you'll run in this business is after you get your job. The men you'll associate with are mostly mighty nice fellows, magnetic, handsome, good sports, hard workers, otherwise the public wouldn't look at them. Well, you'll be associated with them very closely, and you'll feel like a bad sport, maybe, sometimes, if you try to be too cold and unapproachable when they're in a friendly mood. But that's a danger you'll meet anywhere. Forget this old rot about paying the price. Good Lord, if you could sit here and see the poor little idiots that come in here and try to decoy me, I get it all day long. Your work was pretty poor, my dear. I congratulate you on being such a bad, bad woman. But I'm immune. You'd have failed if you had been the Queen of Sheba. Now go on outside and tell Mr. Dobbs your pedigree, and we'll give you the first chance we get, and no initiation fee or commission will be charged. How's that? A little bit of all right, eh? You're a nice child and pretty, and you'll get along. He lifted her from her chair and put his arm around her as a comrade and slapped her shoulder blades in an accolade of good friendship. She broke under the strain and began to cry. She dropped back into her chair and sobbed. It was good to be punished and rebuked into common decency by the way of common sense. 
Terry watched her and felt his overpumped heart surge with a compelling sympathy. He resolved to move her up to the head of the endless army of pretty girls pleading for opportunity, the breadline of art. When he had let her cry a while, she began to laugh, hysterically at first, then with more wholesome self-derision. Her eyes were so bright and her laughter so glad that they impressed a director who pressed his face against the screen door. Mem had been so deeply absorbed in her plan that she had not observed the other door standing wide open, save for its screen. Terry asked the director in as he opened the inner door for Mem's exit, but the director checked her with a gesture. Terry presented him as Mr. Rooks. He had to ask Mem's name. She gave it, from habit, as Mrs. Woodville. Mr. Rooks said to Terry, I've got to let Perrin go. She's no good at all. No comedy, no charm. She's supposed to play a village cutie, and she plays it like Nazimova's head a gabler. This young lady looks the type. She's very pretty, nice, and clean-looking. Mem was aghast at being so discussed, yet it was thrilling to be considered. She did not even note that the director had neglected to demand virtue as the price. It was almost more embarrassing to have him demand her experience. Her story improved with repetition. Oh, I played a bit for Mr. Folger. He said I was wonderful. Was it comedy? Well, not exactly. It was character. She was trying to talk like a professional. Would you mind giving me a test? She was not quite sure what he meant, but she was there to pay any price. So she said, I'd love to. It's late, said Rooks, but I'm desperate. Come right over to the set before the electricians get away. He hurried her through the screen door, across the grass to one of the vast warehouses, and there, under a bombardment of grisly lights, with a camera aimed at her point-blank, and under the eye of various men in overalls, he asked her to smile, to turn her head slowly from side to side, to wink, to laugh aloud, to flirt with an imaginary man, to indicate jealous vexation at a rival. Rooks was fretful over the snarl this small role was causing in his big picture. The delays and shifts it had compelled had already added several thousand dollars to the expense account. Since the overhead and all totaled nearly three thousand dollars a day, even with the recent cuts in salaries. He assumed that Mem knew the rudiments of her trade and could use the tools of it, which were her muscles. He gave her no help, painted no scene, did nothing to stimulate her imagination. In the desert, among the famine-wrung people in costume, under the fiendish sky, it had been easy to lift her eyes in prayer and to weep. She found out all of a sudden how much harder it is to be natural in one's own clothes than to play a poetic role in costume, how much harder it is to be funny than to be tragic. She could not smile at command. Her lips drew back in a grin of pain. Her wink was leaden. The camera caught what her face expressed, and it expressed what she felt, which was despair. She had her chance, and she was not ready for it. She knew that if she had been droll and mischievous, the director's face would have reflected it as Mr. Folger's eyes had grown wet when she wept in the desert, but Mr. Rooks was merely polite. The cameraman was mirthless. The props and grips stole away. The test was short. Mr. Rooks said, Very nice, ever so much obliged. Mr. Teary will let you know how it comes out. Thank you again. Good night. And now she must find her way out. Terry was just driving away in his car as she sneaked through the gates, feeling that her paradise was gone again. She had so little hope that she did not mention the experience to Leva. She had no ambition to promulgate her failures. It was success that she wanted. For once her gloomy forebodings were justified, and ever after she trusted her gloomy forebodings, often as they fooled her. The next day passed with no summons from the studio, but the mail brought her a letter from Mrs. Dack. It was written in such script as one might expect from a hand that clutched a cake of soap, or a hot boiler handle, or scrubbed clothes against a washboard all day, six days a week. It said, Dear Mrs. Woodville, I was awful glad to get your letter, been meaning to answer it but trying to fix up my affairs so's i and terry could come up to your city yesterday i was to mrs reddick's and she said she had a telegram for you 
but had no address and so could not forward it it said your mother was so were it not having had no answer to her letters she was coming out on the first train and would reach palm springs day after tomorrow hopping to see you soon either there or here mrs p dack p s both i and terry send you lots of love mam was petrified nothing could stop her mother from coming the first blaze of joy at the thought of the reunion was quenched in the flood of impossible situations her presence would create alone with her skyish ambitions her contempt for village standards had been sublime but that was in the absence of the village it made an amazing difference in the look of her new ideals and practices that they must be submitted to a mother's eyes her mother did not know los angeles but then mem did not know her mother daughters have not all been mothers but all mothers have been daughters mem's courage turned craven before the wilderness of her problems unemployment poverty ambition terry dack to launch and her mother to educate end of chapter twenty eight recording by deanna beauvais